Democracy in crisis often thrives in darkness. Democracy Day turns on the light. On September 15th, news organizations across the United States will come together together to sound the alarm about threats facing our democracy and our democratic institutions and empower residents with the information they need to help defend it. Democracy Day is nonpartisan. This isn't about Republicans or Democrats. It's about protecting our democratic values and institutions. These principles are increasingly under attack by misinformation, partisan divides, and direct efforts to undermine our elections. Democracy Day is bringing journalists and newsrooms together for one of the largest collaborative journalism efforts ever undertaken in the United States. Hundreds of radio, TV, print, and digital news outlets will report together on how democracy is backsliding and what's at stake if we don't act. We'll investigate threats, explain how political indifference and hyperpartisanship enable their growth, and highlight communities and organizations that are pursuing real solutions. Democracy Day's true power comes from citizens arming and equipping themselves with facts, information, and raising their voices. That is why Democracy Day matters. It represents what we can achieve when we come together through a shared commitment to truth, justice, and an open democratic system of government. But ultimately, our success depends on you. So visit usdemocracyday.org to read and share the journalism, spread reliable information, and take action. And if you're a newsroom, you can sign up to become a reporting partner. So, will you join us in standing up for democracy on September 15th? We hope so, because we believe that together we can accomplish more than we can alone. spending part of what day is it Wednesday with us time is slippery these days we're so excited to have you here and to share out what we've been cooking up with an initiative that we call democracy day and this is no um you know no coincidence that we're doing it on September 15th 2022 because that is actually the international day of democracy so it's not something we made up it's just something we're using as a good old-fashioned news peg to help newsrooms prepare for the threats to democracy and, and let the public know about them as well so I'm Jennifer Brandel. I'm the co-founder of Harkin and also Democracy SOS and Election SOS. And I'm working along with an amazing consortium of people who are all volunteering to try and put together a call to action for newsrooms, which is to publish something or broadcast something about democracy on September 15th so that your audiences and your communities know about the threats to democracy, who is doing what in terms of trying to help those things, and ultimately to sound the alarm, because if you haven't been paying attention, and I'm sure you have, which is why you're here, um, we're really in a crisis moment. And so today we're really lucky to have with us a couple of folks who are going to share a bit more from their perspective and their vantage points about why this matters, why we are doing this. And then we're gonna share out a whole variety of great examples to get your inspiration juices flowing as you think about how might your newsroom participate in Democracy Day. We also wanna say, we don't think you should just do coverage about the threats to democracy on one day. Many newsrooms, as you've probably seen, have made this into an entire beat. They're hiring reporters on this front. It doesn't just have to be one moment that you're doing this work, but we do wanna have a concerted effort on the 15th of September to really sound the alarm collectively across the country and provide a lot of great coverage for the public to understand what is at stake here. So without Further ado, I want to introduce Michael Bolden, who is the CEO of the American Press Institute, to share his answers to this question, these two questions. Why are we doing this and why does democracy matter? So over to you, Michael. Uh, thanks, Jen, and thanks everybody for joining us today. You know, uh, when my father was alive, he and I didn't talk much about his service in the US Army. Uh, it seems so distant to me, and most of my adult memories are about him living as a retired grandfather and minister, not about something that had happened decades before I was even thought of. 
but dad was buried six years ago with military honors, uh, standing at my daddy's grave and listening to a soldier playing taps. I missed him, but I felt proud of him. And I reflected on what our democracy had meant to this man. Earlier this year, I found a digital copy of his World War II draft card. It confirmed that he had lied about his age to join the service, saying he was two years older than he was. Here was a man who grew up poor under Jim Crow laws, who faced segregation and humiliation dealing with systemic racism every day, yet he felt compelled to join the service to fight for this country's supposed ideals. He lived in the deepest South, Mobile County, Alabama, where whites only signs and racist violence were part of life, yet he believed in democracy. George Washington called the creation of the American government the last great experiment for promoting human happiness by reasonable compact in civil society. It was an experiment my dad took seriously. He read and listened to reports about that experiment being under threat from autocrats around the world. As I grew up, I saw that my father approached the idea of our representative democracy with reverence. He believed about democracy. We don't think there is a need to explain. Yeah. But what we forget is that much of our journalism often doesn't reflect the perspectives and the sensibilities and the realities of many people in our country. There are people in entire communities who have seen what is supposed to be democracy, ignore them, okay. or even actively work against them. They are beyond being critical. Perfect. They are indifferent. They have written off the role of democracy in their lives. They have written off the role of much of the media in their lives. But we can't write them off, and we can't write off our responsibility okay. Okay. to them yeah, and, we might even and to try write, to maintain uh, our great experience. Where at the American Press Institute, we believe that for democracies to thrive, like, we wanna, need accurate news and information you know, not, about it's, their it's communities. Not a the problem is <laughs> with just, our we, society we just want the and the debates on how to solve them. However, we know yeah, American yeah, confidence in elections, over, yeah, institutions, and the media saying, um, continues to weaken over time. Because look at the latest information from Pew or Gallup. This even manifests in a lack of confidence that the American people have in themselves to make decisions that, um, under our representative yeah, system of government. And these will lead us. Uh, so with important elections on the horizon, said, we, here you know, at APS, Because he loves me, Danny.
um, decay presents huge problems for journalists as they try to inform the American public. Democracy used to be a background condition of doing journalism, something that you could assume, something that made journalism possible. Its basic mechanics uh, could be relied upon, but we're now understanding that a lot of our democracy runs on a kind of honor system uh, in which informal codes of conduct and uh, political conventions held a, a lot of power because both parties agreed to them. This is especially true of the way we run elections in the United States. A huge part of running elections is the volunteers uh, and uh, other poll workers who administer the election under a code of nonpartisanship and fairness that doesn't have any legal force and doesn't have people with guns uh, assuring it. It comes out of American citizenship. Uh, and we are now seeing that under conditions of democratic backsliding, all the informal parts of the system are weak points and uh, attack services. And that's part of what we mean by a crisis of democracy is that the informal networks that kept democracy strong are decaying and sentiment is shifting in many ways against democracy. So under these conditions, uh, myself and other observers have been arguing that the American press needs to become more explicitly pro-democracy uh, as opposed to allowing it to sit in the background as a assumption or a uh, condition. And this makes a certain amount of sense, but there's a lot of problems with this claim, which I still think is important, that journalists need to become more pro-democracy. In fact, this meeting that we're at and the uh, Democracy Day 2022 are examples of, um, of being more pro-democracy. But there are a lot of problems with that concept. Um, the first problem that I I've encountered is journalists immediately say to me and others, okay, but what does that mean in practice? Which is a fair question, a really important question, but we don't, we don't necessarily know the answer to that until we get people to start experimenting with being more pro-democracy. But If the cost of experimenting is knowing in advance, what does that look like in practice, then we're never gonna do the experiments. So that's one of the problems. Um, another problem with, with telling journalists they need to become more pro-democracy is you immediately hear in reply, both from journalists and critics, um, that pro-democracy, that sounds like being pro-Biden, which of course is not the role of newsrooms and nobody wants their newsroom to declare itself pro-Biden or pro-Democratic Party. Um, and so that fear of being criticized for being partisan is also one of the things in the way of putting a more pro-democracy philosophy and in journalism into practice. Um, another strange problem with becoming more pro-democracy is there's a tendency in journalism to say democracy is at risk, well, we're going to cover that. And almost every problem in journalism can be responded to that way by just adding some coverage. And so this, is, this has been one of the, re the reflexes of the journalism profession since this backsliding started to happen, which is we're going to cover it as we would cover any other 
story. But the problem is it's not quite like any other story because it threatens the very conditions under which journalism can be transacted. Um, and that's slightly bigger than a big story or a new democracy desk, even though a democracy desk might be a really good, good addition to uh, your newsroom. So um, under those conditions, uh, an answer I have come to um, is that pro-democracy coverage means in part coverage that clearly clearly shows what the stakes are in this battle for American democracy and the elections coming up where we don't know if we're going to be able to have a free and fair election. And news coverage that more clearly and dramatically shows the stakes, what is at stake in this or a new democracy desk, even though a democracy desk might be a really good addition to uh, your newsroom. So um, under those conditions, uh, an answer I have come to um, is that pro-democracy coverage means, in part, coverage that clearly shows what the stakes are in this battle for American democracy and the elections coming up where we don't know if we're gonna be able to have a free and fair election. And news coverage that more clearly and dramatically shows the stakes, what is at stake in this nest of problems that I described and that Michael just described is I think one of the ways out of this um, puzzle of how do you get to more pro-democracy coverage until you start doing it. So make it crystal clear what the stakes are uh, seems to me to be a more muscular and effective way of doing journalism than, um, than what we've had up to now. And I, and I look forward to seeing it develop with some of the newsrooms represented in this group. Over to you. Great, thank you so much, Jay. I really appreciate that. And I think your remarks and the perspective you bring are really clarifying in terms of the stakes that this is not just any other big story. This is a story that threatens the, the very business of journalism itself and the role that it plays in society. So before we jump to examples and uh, next steps about Democracy Day, um, Joe Amditis, who is our amazing uh, tech guru here is going to launch a poll real quick uh, before we move on. So. If you haven't seen, if you're joining by phone, sorry, but this is the poll. We have uh, a few questions here. One, does your newsroom, does your news org currently have a democracy beat or something similar? Do you already have an idea of what kinds of coverage you'll produce for Democracy Day? How well do you feel your community understands the current threats to democracy? And what kind of support would help you participate in democracy better? So please just take a moment and answer these four questions and we will share out the results in just a moment. Okay, someone said poll came up, but then went away. I don't know, Joe, if you're able to relaunch it again or, oh, click the poll button at the bottom of the screen for Greg, it should show up. Yeah, if you still have an issue, the poll is still open. So I see people voting. We'll give it, uh, we'll give it till 1222 max, let's just say like two minutes what people are voting. There's four questions. I meant to put them all in one poll or, or on different polls, but. Uh... Thus is the same life. Yep. <laughs> we'll get a lot of information in a short amount of time. So please take a moment and answer these questions. If you're just joining, we are doing a poll right now. If you click on polls and quizzes at the bottom of your screen, you will launch the poll. It's four questions. Okay, not seeing the poll. Carol, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom um, kind of dashboard here, it should show up next to the chat area, uh, polls and quizzes. Oh, forward on a phone. I'm sorry about that. Uh, if you're on the phone, you might not be able to do it. I'm not sure. But this will just be one more minute of dead air for you on the phone, but we'll share out what we learned. Wow, good fade in and out. <laughs> so we have a 60% participation in the poll. So thanks for everyone who's able to participate. Let's just take a moment and scroll through and see what we found here. So does your news org currently have a democracy beat or something similar? Got 22% said yes, 
11% said, yep, but it's not a permanent thing. 22% uh, said no, but we're working on it. And 44% said no. So next question, do you already have an idea of what kinds of coverage you'll do for Democracy Day? Um, let's say about a little more than half of the people said no, but we have something in mind or not yet, which is good news because we are going to share a bevy of examples shortly for you to uh, think about what you could do for Democracy Day. And it doesn't just have to be one story. You could do a whole huge package on it or do it throughout the whole week. It's really up to you. Question three was how well do you feel your community understands the current threats to democracy? Uh, most said basic understanding or not really. So we are <laughs> we're at a point where news and journalism has a real role to play here. And then you also shared a variety of ways that we could help you participate better in Democracy Day. So this is really helpful. And this will very much um, inform yeah. to you our efforts Question going forward. This is a whole volunteer effort right now. We have not been successful yet in raising money to support it. If we are this year and or next year into 2024, we have lots of incredible and big ideas um, that we uh, would like uh, to be able to do. So just so you know, if you know people who are funding this kind of work, let us know. We would love to make this a much bigger thing, but we are at this point in time doing our, our scrappy version of it and excited to have you all participate. So now I'm going to throw it over to my colleague, Rachel from News Revenue Hub, whose tweet really launched this whole kind of situation of like, we should do a collective call to action. And she's going to talk us through the goals and start to give a few examples. Great. Um, so uh, I am uh, really happy to be here today and to see all of you. Um, so basically, we um, are hoping we have two sort of main goals for this effort. Uh, one is sort of external to the public and one is sort of internal uh, to media. So we really want to inform and empower the public through this information that we can give them. Um, and we also want to come together as an industry um, to expand the reach that we can have um, and the power that we can have together um, and potentially the impact from the reporting as well. So it really has this two-pronged approach that we're not just trying to produce reporting because we want to get better information out there, but we also really want to do this collectively. The collective approach is really important. Um, so we also want to help folks rethink um, what they mean by democracy coverage and the threats to it, um, and what is being done to protect um, democratic institutions, both on local and state um, levels, but also on the national level. Um, and then uh, going into 2022 and 2024, um, it's uh, we're really hoping to um, figure out how to do this this year so we can repeat this project again um, in the next uh, two years. Um, hold on one. Slight technical issue, folks. Hang in there. We no uh, will be right back after these short messages from our sponsors. <laughs> Meanwhile, you can read along for how to participate, which is actually fairly simple. Very simple. Sorry about that. Uh, I am not in a my house today, so um, it is uh, there's some background noise. Um, so it's very very easy to join um, this uh, collaboration. Basically, we are really all we're really asking is for folks to produce at least one story that's related to democracy and publish it or broadcast it on September fifteenth, um, and then um, and also if you have a paywall, we are hoping that you can publish it outside the paywall. Um, more than one story would be great, but one is sort of the minimum. Um, we are also uh, asking you to join on behalf of your newsroom. So we will put the name of your newsroom on um, our uh, Democracy Day page. Um, and then uh, once September 15th comes around, we are just hoping to be able to gather all of the stories that are produced so we can put them in one place um, and have them available um, on the website. Um, so it's a very straightforward um, collaboration, free, easy. Um, we're trying to make the barriers to entry as low as possible. And right now, I'll just add, we have 250 newsrooms signed up so far, and we want to blow that out of the water. So we really want to get as many newsrooms across the country to participate as possible. 
Um, so we have a lot of ideas about what this could look like, and it really depends on what your um, what kind of newsroom you're in and what kind of audience you're producing for. But there's sort of two buckets, which are defensive and proactive, of what is actually happening on the ground in terms of um, actual threats to democracy, um, candidates who are running on, say, a Stop the Steal platform. Um, there are so many, unfortunately, examples um, that um, I'm sure you all are already reporting on that fall into this bucket um, that are really is the heart of why we wanted to do this project. At the same time, we also would love to see coverage of what folks are doing um, to um, protect uh, democratic institutions and candidates who are running on a platform specific to protecting uh, democracy, um, other efforts um, to protect the vote. Um, so we really would love also to see um, where possible um, and where um, resources are available to see things like solutions journalism. We have folks from the solutions journalism network um, who are part of this collaboration who could certainly help with that. Um, and so either one of these buckets or both um, is where we think folks will be able to find um, uh, a well of ideas uh, from. So we came up with uh, quite, a, well, Jen uh, came up with quite a few examples. So I'll go through a few of them and then uh, Jen will finish up with some more of them. Um, so the first is that um, the Post has done some really great coverage looking at what elected officials um, think about the 2020 election. So this is one of the more recent examples, but they also did a poll, for example, of uh, I think every member of Congress after the election to ask them uh, if they believed Joe Biden was the winner, and then they sort of published the results of that. Um, this is specific to um, the primaries and um, across the country and what whether um, election denial was part of their uh, beliefs or part of their platform. So this is a really good example of doing a really high level look um, at uh, election denial and, and how it fits in into um, the current uh, election. Um, there are also lots of study political scientists um, have been hard at work. This is a an example of a paper um, that came out this summer about um, racial and geographic disparities and turnout uh, in elections. Um, so being able to dig into some of these um, academic studies and see what you can pull from there, um, either for your state or city, um, are also there's plenty of um, opportunities there. Um, and academics are always very eager to um, uh, talk uh, to journalists and, and hopefully share um, information. So this is just one example um, to when we're thinking about academic, sort of the academic realm of where you can pull from. Um, Fantastic. And actually, yeah. on that note, um, Jenna says in the chat, speaking of academic studies, she's with the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State, where she teaches journalism, totally. and she's happy to connect uh, to faculty experts and research, uh, research and resources to help you. So please feel free. Thank you so much, Jenna, for letting us know. That's great. Um, I'm going to give a few more examples as well and then throw it to my colleague Jess at Solutions Journalism, but you can also, you know, cover specific threats to voting rights. This is an example um, about, you know, misleading efforts that someone is doing around ending single member districts and what that means for uh, threats to voting rights and disenfranchising voters. Um, other examples, this is something we'd be really excited to see, kind of a proactive, here's what to expect articles ahead of election day. Because a lot of people aren't necessarily seeing the writing on the wall from what happened in 2020 and what will probably naturally play out this year. So preparing your audiences that they should expect to see these sorts of things and whether or not they should believe them or not, report them or not, or what they can do about it. So a few examples, why you should expect to see false claims of voter fraud in the midterm elections. Write about that, let people know it's to be expected given X, Y, and Z. Also, it's normal that front runners shift during the final hours of counting ballots, which is some reason why people naturally distrust the results because they're like, hey, my person was up 
right until you know the 11th hour and then it changed but many states have different ways of adding let's say mail-in votes or um, international votes or, or whatnot to the count right at the end which uh, can help people understand why a race might shift and there's no nothing uh, wrong with that and there's no foul play uh, they should expect to see people believing the big lie and maybe to be lingering at polls to supervise and maybe you can share what you can do about that um, another example here's why and when we call races and you might not know the winner on election day we were very happy to see that in 2020 a lot of newsrooms prepared the public that we might not know the answer immediately to all the races and even the presidential race so that people didn't think there was something bad going on but they explained exactly why you wouldn't see it and that that is okay um, lastly, expect that even if a candidate wins in a landslide, some losers are going to demand a recount and who's going to pay for that recount. So letting them know what the consequences are of people um, having false claims of voter fraud and tampering and what that means for them personally. So these are just a few examples. There's thousands more, but thinking about how you can prepare people for what we are likely to see. Um, Another example, we really appreciate what WITF has been doing in Pennsylvania. They have been very bold and very, um, just very vocal about what they are doing and why. So they are clear in their stories about false claims, our attacks on the truth, on democracy. They are what we would say on the very um, far end of the spectrum of being pro-democracy and unapologetically so. Um, some other examples are partners at Trusting News, which if you don't know Trusting News, they do incredible work helping newsrooms be more transparent and, and basically help the public better understand how journalism is made and how newsrooms make decisions. Because in the absence of information, people will make up a narrative to fill in the blanks as to why you covered this candidate and not another, or why your newsroom decides to do X instead of Y. If you get out in front of that and state for the record, what let's say your mission is for elections coverage or what we're going to do when candidates come to town, who we will not cover, who we will, and you know what our resources are in the newsroom and where we have limitations. These sorts of things can really help you to let your audiences know and your communities know what you're able to do and what you're not able to do and where you're putting your energy. And it becomes an easy way if someone is criticizing you to say, we're on the record, this is what we're able to do. I'm sorry, we can't do everything. Um, we have seen a lot of newsrooms do great work recently in publishing a mission statement about their elections coverage to not just do the same old you know, horse race coverage or treating the election as an event with winners and losers, but to really think about what their goals are in their coverage and how that um, cascades down into decision making. So Trusting News has a ton of amazing examples on their website of mission statements, FAQs, they create really great landing pages around elections coverage, a lot of newsrooms do, that gives folks all the information they need to not only understand what's at stake, who's running, but how the newsroom is covering their work. Because if you don't have those conversations in your newsroom, you're very likely to just go by muscle memory and do the same old thing you've done in previous years, which I think you're all here because you realize that doesn't cut it anymore in this context and changes need to be made. So now I would like to throw it to my colleague Jessel at the Solutions Journalism Network to share more about Solutions Journalism and some examples of stories that could inspire you. Hi, everybody. My name is Jessel Noor. I'm a journalist and the Democracy Initiative Manager at Solutions Journalism Network. Um, at Solutions Journalism, we believe that if journalists just focus on problems, we don't tell the whole story. We also need to focus on how people are responding, whether it's locally, nationally, or elsewhere. Um, our mission is to ensure the public has access to news that helps them envision and build a more equitable and sustainable world and gives them the tools to do so. Solutions Journalism is not good news. It's not hero worship. It's not about individual efforts. Rigor is central. Solutions journal journalism is evidence based. It interrogates efforts to solve problems. I um, you know, as we all know, there are no perfect solutions. Every solution has a limitation. But if it's but if it's, if a response to a social problem is moving the needle, then that's worth examining. Um, if you're looking for inspiration, I will share a link to our story tracker. Um, we have over 13,000 stories in our story tracker produced by 6,000 journalists at 1,700 news organizations. Um, and I'm happy to um, follow up with you as well if you have questions or resources. Um, and I wanted to go through some examples of some good solution stories that hopefully can um, inspire you or your newsroom. Um, WBEZ Chicago did a story um, in you know, the fall of 2020 
um, at a time when it was really hard to go register and vote. And they did a story about how clinics and hospitals are stepping up to help to ensure um, voters had um, an ability to register. Um, by the time uh, that story was printed, had um, gotten assistance um, in registering to vote. Um, these were new voters. Um, we have a, um, a story. Um, uh, and so these are, you know, print, broadcast, radio. We have an article, uh, sorry, a video from a PBS affiliate in New Mexico about a, a mobile voting unit um, that, you know, uh, during the, that before the pandemic helped reach, you know, hard to reach communities to help them register to vote. They averaged about 110 voters a day. Um, so, you know, if you're looking for story ideas um, in your community, if they're fa facing voter registration problems, that's something that you could follow up on and look at. Um, you know, and there's, you know, we've we've seen the record turnout in communities of color and Asian communities in many states. And so, uh, the story from the Texas Tribune um, helped examine how that was happening in Harris County. Um, you know, having access to translators, if, 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 if citizens, you know, can't um, access voting information, it's going to be really, that's going to be a challenge to voting. And so access to translators can make a huge difference. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so here's another story from Scalawag looking at um, how young activists in Mississippi are fighting uh, voter suppression and other obstacles to voting. Um, and you know, an, uh, a program led by young people. They found that over 350,000 eligible voters had not not yet registered. They figured out what, what they wanted to do about it. And um, you know, when the article was published in April, they had um, registered had re-registered over 30,000 voters to date. And they found they continued to engage the electorate by six percent higher every election cycle. Um, and um, yeah, so. You know, there's a lot of solution stories out there, um, and I'll put my email in the in the chat. Um, you can reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to connect you with stories, to give you feedback, help you brainstorm. I'm a resource, and um, you know, please take advantage of that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jessel. Um, I will say too, another way that you can help people participate in democracy is by explaining how people are doing this kind of work of getting people to sign up and how you can be involved, et cetera. So I love that there's um, on the right hand side, you can see this little pull out uh, sidebar of like how they did it, what their focus is, et cetera. So as much as you can translate the stories of people working on behalf of democracy or, or doing these solutions orientations to help others understand how it works, what the mechanics are, how they can be involved, the better. So I'll just share one more um, solutions journalism story uh, just taking great ideas from other places. I love that the Philadelphia citizen has ideas we should steal. That's a whole section. And so it takes inspiration from places and people that are doing something interesting that folks are saying, hey, why don't you do this here where we live? There's a way to do it. So I want to just share a handful more uh, examples for uh, inspiration here. Um, one is around boosting credibility. You can use your Democracy Day uh, reporting to show how the transition of power works and what happens behind the scenes so that people understand uh, what's the norm, what's the culture, what's the law, and what they should expect to see um, after an election is finished. Also, how-to guides are so important. So really user guides for participating in elections. There's a couple of examples here from KCUR, from LAist, from Atlanta Civic Circle, really thinking about if I'm a person and I'm confused about voting, what is all the information I need to make sure I can register, where I go, who's on the ballot, et cetera. So really thinking about how do you make your newsroom a one-stop shop for people who are ready to vote, maybe ready to vote for the first time. We're just thinking about voting the night before and saying, oh crap, how do I do that again? Um, really important to have these user guides if you don't already. And this can be part of your democracy day work as well as building out um, a one-stop shop for voters in your communities. Other things to consider is humanizing stories about new citizens and how they're able to join US democracy. As many of you probably know, there is a big myth going around in terms of how uh, you know, certain people are bringing in folks illegally to vote and who aren't necessarily Americans. Uh, that is false, that is not the case. And you can start to show how people who are new to the country or new citizens are um, basically part of this democracy, what they are offering it, how 
they had to jump through a lot of hoops to be part of it and and what that process is like to help make sure that these uh, particular Americans are not dehumanized and again prone to violence. Um, we know one major thing is that we're all really afraid of at the end of the day is that political violence is one of the quickest ways to lose a democracy because people want law and order right away because they are so scared when political violence erupts. And one of the quickest ways toward political violence is in just dehumanization over time of people, individuals, groups, demographics. And so whatever reporting you can do to make sure you are humanizing, making folks um, relatable and highlighting different members of your community and what they bring to democracy is really important. Um, you can also think about inviting and editorials, if... opinion columns, community sourced pieces of personal stories on democracy. So allow the public to tell you and tell their neighbors why democracy is important to them, what it means to them. So an example from the Door County Pulse, a small newsroom in Wisconsin, uh, someone writing about why democracy matters from their point of view. So it's a way of not just saying, don't believe us, the newsroom, but you know, this is what your neighbors think about it as well. Cal Matters does great guides and a lot of great uh, guest commentary as well. Um, and then explain how to get involved in local politics and elections, if that is something that your newsroom is down to do, not just say, hey, here's how to vote, but here's how to get more involved. So a great example here uh, from the Livingston Daily is if you're skeptical of election integrity, here's how you can get involved. And they do a really great explainer with officials to say, these poll workers are your neighbors. These are people that you know, these are you know folks in your community and here's how you can be involved. Um, the AVL Today did a really great piece I love their emojis, very user-friendly, as to all the different task forces and committees that people can join in their community. So beyond an election, what are other ways people can contribute, can take part in democratic processes and understand how things work? Also in terms of humanizing, uh, we do know that public um, officials and local officials who are working on behalf of conducting elections are our targets right now. And so as much as you can also humanize the folks who are behind the scenes, doing the work of making sure elections are done with integrity, are highlighted, are spotlighted, are celebrated, are get to explain what it's like for them, and you're able to share out uh, more about who's doing this work in your community so it doesn't remain abstracted. And I also just want to give a vote for actually democratizing your own newsroom. <laughs> you know, how do you think about how your newsroom reflects the processes of representing the people that you are covering as well? Newsrooms are not, you know, mandated to have representation in that way, but I think um, we can all agree that most newsrooms don't demographically represent the people that they're trying to serve. And by creating opportunities for engagement and listening and responding to people, you start to get closer to really making content that serves the needs of the individuals and their idiosyncrasies and their specific needs that you might not otherwise if you're just taking ideas from inside the house, so to speak. So the citizen's agenda, which is um, a, a process and a concept that Jay Rosen has been talking about for decades, and we have so much information on that. Uh, we've created actually a guide walking you through step by step of how to do the citizens agenda. Um, my company, Harkin, we provide technology and training for newsrooms who want to do engaged elections approaches. So there's lots of different ways outside of these, you know, approaches that you can be listening to your audience about what coverage they need as they head to the polls in order to make the best decisions they can on behalf of themselves or families and communities. And lastly, I just wanted to say that journalism is good for democracy. Michael mentioned this, Jay mentioned this in their opening remarks. And your audience might not understand exactly the role that journalism plays in democracy. This is um, information from our partners at Trusting News who do a lot of great research on this and who have you know, pulled from other research, but that erosion in local news is tied to a drop in civic engagement. And that reading a newspaper encourages and motivates people to vote and that shrinking news coverage is tied to less competition in political races. So use this as a moment to tell people that your newsroom is actually required for democracy to function or that newsrooms and more news is something that is part of the solution here. So I love this is an example um, from the Coloradoan where uh, their reporters on their bio pages and in some of their newsletters are saying I believe in democracy. Here's what I do. Here's how you can help our newsroom continue to support democracy and what's at stake there. So don't be shy to, to really turn the spotlight on yourself and how your news organization fits because people don't naturally or obviously understand how that works necessarily. So really making that transparent can be extremely useful. So I wanted to um, kick it over to Rachel for a few last slides here. There's some great opportunities here we wanted to share with you and then we will open it up to any questions that folks have. 
Yeah, so um, we um, are aware of at least one grant opportunity specific to democracy related reporting that's happening now through the Fund for Investigative Journalism. Um, so we'll pop the link uh, in the chat there. Um, they are offering up to $10,000 per newsroom and you can apply anytime they're taking rolling applications. Um, so this is a great opportunity if um, you're looking for some added capacity um, to apply um, as soon as you can for that. Um, and if we can move on to the next one. So we've been um, planning this basically since January and pulling things together and we sort of officially launched um, the project at the Collaborative Journalism Summit in May. Um, so we are in the process now of recruiting newsrooms to join. Um, and we already have all of our guidance and outlines for participation ready to go. They are on the website. Um, but we will also be following up uh, with newsrooms um, as we get closer to September about um, what to prepare for and what we'll need. Um, and then, as we mentioned many times, it's on September 15th. It's coming up sooner than you think. Um, and then we are hoping to gather what we learned through this experience so we can repeat it again um, in the next two years. Um, so. Uh, just a little bit about who is involved in sort of the organizer capacity. There's uh, about four of us, um, myself and Jen, in addition to uh, Stephanie Murray, uh, who's the director for the Center for, Co for Cooperative Media, and uh, Bridget Thorson, um, who I think is on vacation today, uh, who's the member collaborations editor at INN. Um, so we, we've just been the ones who've been sort of cooking it up um, in the first half of the year. And we have been very, very happy uh, to bring on an organizing committee um, that we've been meeting with on a regular basis um, from newsrooms around the country and other organizations that have been helping us uh, helped us come up with this menu of options that we have on the website and other um, planning that we've been working on. So this has been a big group effort. Um, we have not been successful in getting funding for this year. So we've all been doing it in our spare time and through this network of wonderful people. Um, so we are very open to obviously funding, but also more uh, members of our organizing committee. I believe we meet again next Monday. Um, and also, obviously, our big, big priority right now is recruiting newsrooms to participate for September 15th. So obviously, if you're on this call and you're interested, we encourage you to sign up. But we also encourage you to spread the word um, and help us recruit other newsrooms. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rachel. Well, we are at the end of the hour here. We got about 10 more minutes and we'd love to hear from you. What questions do you have? Are there other types of stories you want to share out with folks that are here for inspiration? Is there any help we could be for your newsroom to take part in this? I know not all folks who are here on behalf of their newsrooms uh, maybe are confident that their boss will be down for participating in this. So we're here to support you in whatever way uh, we can. So we will open the floor if you have questions. Feel free to just unmute yourself and share. You can also share in the chat and we will stick around to support. Hi, this is Carol King. Um, I actually was very excited and enthusiastic right from the very early stages of this. I jumped in in the beginning and um, and I was, for a while I was emailing uh, with, I think it was Stephanie, but I somehow missed the date for the first organizing meeting. And I'm wondering if there's a link that I can go and listen to a recording of it and be able to catch up and, and get more involved. Thank you so much, Carol, for letting us know. We'll follow up with you uh, via email and see what happened there. Uh, so yep. we are- I'll take gonna, care of that. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for letting us know. And thanks for being an early adopter here and, and a supporter of this work. And as Joe wrote in the chat, everyone here who registered, even if you um, are watching this on the repeat, you will get an email that has uh, the information um, along with this recording and the documentation. Thanks so much. And as um, Joe and Stephanie have shared out in the chat before, and we'll, we'll do it again, is please register. Please uh, sign up as a partner. So if your newsroom is committed to doing this, 
um, that we can we can keep track and we can log and we can share out links to your stories. Our hope is that again, this is building the groundwork for efforts in 2023 and 2024. There's so much work to be done beyond an actual day of democracy, but from learning from one another of what newsrooms are trying, what they're learning, what kinds of coverage is actually helping to move the needle on people being able to be agents of their own future in the democracy. And um, this is just hopefully the beginning of a long-term uh, programmatic effort that we're they're all going to be part of. So please sign up to partner so we can track and uh, make sure we highlight your stories as well. And also, yes, we have um, a list of FAQs on the Democracy Day website. You can also use hashtag Democracy Day on any of the spots that you are uh, visiting, LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera, TikTok, all the kids, wherever they are. Um, excellent. So if I'm not seeing more questions coming in, I will say, invite you all to go about the rest of your Wednesday. And we're so, so Laura? grateful. Oh, Laura, Laura has a, a question. question. Thank you, Joe. Oh, that's actually Jordan using Laura's login, I think. <laughs> Sorry, I can pull in one more question, it, um, it, unless there's someone else. Oh, yeah. Um, jo well, Jordan, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll Sorry, that, that confused me because like, I forgot I was using Laura's login. Um, yeah, so uh, as someone who's trying to work with multiple newsrooms to provide more coverage, I, I see some, some friendly faces in North Carolina here. Um, how well uh, have y'all um, contacted, how well have y'all captured the group of newsrooms that would like to do um, some of this coverage but don't have the capacity to do on their own? That's a great question and actually something we, we've talked about that if we did have funding, what we would do is probably commission um, a variety of reporters to do some reporting that could be used um, in various contexts. So it wouldn't just be specific to one state necessarily, but this could be op-eds, commentaries, um, explainers, et cetera, that could be um, you know, Creative Commons licensed and anyone could use if they don't have the capacity to, to create reporting um, by themselves. And um, yeah, that's great. Stephanie mentioned we also have asked the Associated Press to consider making some of their content available nationwide too. Awesome, thank I, you. I have a question. Um, I'm looking at the uh, Democracy Day website um, and I see the uh, the latest from our reporting partners. Are you interested in, in posting um, partner coverage that happens before September 15th? And if so, uh, how should we submit that for consideration? Great yeah, so question. I Joe, can answer that really briefly. Um, so yes, we absolutely are. We'd be happy to feature them on the website. Um, we have a form that I can share and I'll have it up on the website right now. Uh, right now, I basically have it uh, with like one sample post in there just as we were going over what the workflow would look like, but it'll be an Airtable form. Um, you submit it to us. We'll uh, make sure it's up on the site. We'll notify you when it's up there and we'll share it out as well. I uh, will say one more thing. We also have a listserv, an email listserv for anybody to join. Um, so once you become a partner, once you sign up as a partner to participate, we'll, you'll get an invitation to join that uh, Google group slash email listserv. That's just, we found a really easy way for everybody. Anybody can send an email to a single email address and then the whole group will see it. And then everybody can respond if you're not familiar. So all this will be in the follow-up email as well. I have it already, my bullet points are stacked and ready to go. So uh, look out, look out for that. Jen, can I add one thing? Please do. Um, just listening to the presentation today and thinking through um, what's involved in becoming more pro-democracy, uh, the timing is really great for the, with this request because there's enough time between now and September to come up with your plan of what you're going to do differently in your election coverage in 2022 and looking forward to 2024 and publish that as your contribution. That would be really interesting. I think it would be super effective. And I think it's, we had a broad range of news organizations that are committing to pro, sort of strengthened pro-democracy coverage and they all publish their statements about what they're planning to do at the same time. That's a real wave that I think could influence a lot of people who aren't on this call and maybe didn't even hear about Democracy Day to ask really tough questions about how we're going to do our journalism differently, given the threats to democracy that we see all around the country. And the potential for this to be a 
a kind of breakthrough moment for the press is real. I will share, Jay, that this is exactly what we've been doing as part of our Democracy SOS and Election SOS programming, is asking every newsroom to come up with a mission statement that they feel comfortable sharing out with the public and going on the record of what their goals are and how they're doing things differently and why. So we have so many examples of that, and we'll make sure we yeah. put that up on the Democracy Day website for folks who want us to, who, who just want to get on the record and say, here's what we're not going to do anymore, or here's what we're going to do differently, and, and give people that um, that that benefit of understanding why they might not be getting the coverage that they used to or why their coverage is different and appreciating the the steps newsrooms are taking to protect democracy yeah and it's it's a good deadline because if you have this date when you need to do this it kind of forces action within your own newsroom gives you uh you know a timeline uh and i just i just think there's a lot of potential to it so Well, Carol, I want to circle back to you. Was there another question? Oh, thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I think there's a, a great untapped uh, resource in freelancers um, who are very fired up about this, but may not be connected. And I'm wondering if we have um, you know, anybody in the organizing committee that is working together, you know, to sort of see how we can reach out and find freelancers and bring them together and get them involved, and whether the best connecting point would be solutions journalism for that, the network, or uh, if there are other organizations that might be like cable ready for freelancers to jump in. Wow, Carol, you are reading our minds as to what we had planned. Were this able to be like a bigger funded effort? Because that's something I think we could build toward 2023 and 2024. Um, so thank you. Thank you for bringing that up because there is so much we could do um, with freelancers, with having content that's available, with having workshops about how to create these mission statements, um, with supporting one another with really great examples, um, et cetera. There's a lot that can be done. And I, I think the freelancer point is very, very valuable. So thanks for bringing also, that up. Have you, have you looked at National Endowment for Democracy? Because I was on their web page for a webinar the other day, and they seem to have funding available for different kinds of initiatives. I would definitely check it out. Great. Can you put the name in the chat again? Uh, or sure. NED, okay. National Endowment for Democracy. Okay, I'll, thank you. I'll put it in the chat. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your time. We're right at the top of the hour. We know folks have either lunch to eat or meetings to go to or stretch breaks to be had. So thank you for taking the time to be here. We hope that you participate in this, that you spread it to other newsrooms. If you have colleagues or folks that work in newsrooms, let them know about the opportunity. And we hope to have newsrooms in every state participating and see what we can do this year and build toward 2024. Your love is like an ocean ready to take sail, swept up by a current swallowed by a wave. Take heed, they'll say, no, no, no need to get out. You know, uh, when my father was alive, he and I didn't talk much about his service in the U.S. Army. Uh, it seemed so distant to me, and most of my adult memories are about him living as a retired grandfather and minister, not about something that had happened decades before I was even thought of. But dad was buried six years ago with military honors, uh, standing at my daddy's grave, listening to a soldier playing taps. I missed him, but I felt proud of him. And I reflected on what our democracy had meant to this man. Earlier this year, I found a digital copy of his World War II draft card. It confirmed that he had lied about his age to join the service, saying he was two years older than he was. Here was a man who grew up poor under Jim Crow laws, who faced segregation and humiliation dealing with systemic racism every day, yet he felt compelled to join the service to fight for this country's supposed ideals. He lived in the deepest South, Mobile County, Alabama, where whites only signs and racist violence were part of life, yet he believed in democracy. George Washington called the creation of the American government the last great experiment for promoting human happiness by reasonable compact in civil society. It was an experiment my dad took seriously, 
He read and listened to reports about that experiment being under threat from autocrats around the world. As I grew up, I saw that my father approached the idea of our representative democracy with reverence. He believed in voting. I don't think he ever missed an election, but he also believed in being informed. He knew that the media, we journalists, were an important link with the information he needed to do what he believed was his duty as a citizen. As a child, I often went out to the front yard to get the paper for him, and daddy would settle into his recliner to read the latest news from South Alabama and around the world. He paid attention to each page, often with broadcast news playing on the television across the room. He lived the reality of the imperfection of our country, but he lived in hope that the ultimate outcome of the United States of America was worth the investment of his time and attention, and if need be, his life. In creating the International Day of Democracy in 2007, the United Nations described democracy as a universal value based on the freely expressed will of people to determine their own political, economic, social, and cultural systems and their full participation in all aspects of life. My father believed in that full participation, and he believed in the work that each of you do to help people like him participate in our society. Yes, it is our democracy that gives us all the freedom to do our work. The 1776 Virginia Declaration of Rights stated, the freedom of the press is one of the greatest bulwarks of liberty and can never be restrained but by despotic governments. And we see despots and potential despots at work around the world trying to do that. We see that happening now in Russia where any semblance of a free press has been shut down so that people don't have access to information about what is really happening in Ukraine and in their own country. We see it in the Philippines where Rappler has been ordered to shut down, where the government doesn't want people to be informed to be able to fully participate in their society. We have seen the growth of lies and misinformation to influence people's participation for the benefit of personal political gain here in our own country. The most recent Press Freedom Index from Reporters Without Borders shows that journalism is blocked, impeded, or constrained in almost 75% of the countries it examined. And while press freedom in the US was labeled fairly good, we only ranked 44th with what was cited as a record number of assaults and arrests of members of the media threatening our work. Our work matters because freedom of the press is not guaranteed. Democracy is not guaranteed. It requires our work. It requires our participation and the participation of each of us as residents as well as journalists. Many of us though, we look around and we say, of course we must care about democracy. We don't think there is a need to explain. But what we forget is that much of our journalism often doesn't reflect the perspectives and the sensibilities and the realities of many people in our country. There are people in entire communities who have seen what is supposed to be democracy, ignore them, or even actively work against them. They are beyond being critical. They are indifferent. They have written off the role of democracy in their lives, they have written off the role of much of the media in their lives, but we can't write them off and we can't write off our responsibility to them and to try to maintain our great experiment. At the American Press Institute, we believe that for democracies to thrive, people need accurate news and information about their communities, the problems with our society, and the debates over how to solve them. However, we know American confidence in elections, institutions, and the media continues to weaken over time. Just look at the latest information from Pew or Gallup. This even manifests in a lack of confidence that the American people have in themselves to make decisions under our representative system of government. People need us. With important elections on the horizon, we here at API see an immediate need to help local news organizations forge stronger relationships with their communities through better reporting and deeper listening that will improve coverage for 2022 and beyond. We must shore up trust and engagement among communities everywhere, but especially with communities of color. While substantive change can take a lot of time and energy, we've seen time and again how even small grants of a few thousand dollars can help news organizations get unstuck from a status quo in coverage or business approaches. In recent years, we've begun distributing small grants to gather insights for our mission and to help publishers and media everywhere have a reason and momentum to take steps toward doing journalism differently. We're going to do that for the upcoming elections and to help empower your work. So expect an announcement from us soon about that opportunity. 
uh, it should happen right around the 1st of August. None of us can be satisfied or complacent about sounding the alarm on one day or of equipping the public with the information they need on one day. Think about the freedom you have to do your work. Think about the people who you know actively participate in our democracy, but also think about the disconnected and the disaffected. Think about the hope you bring when you tell people how our systems work or how they don't work and that they can have the power to help all of our lives change. That is the power of our democracy, and that is why Democracy Day uh, is important to us. Thank you for the work you do. Uh, and we here at API are committed to helping you do that better and to serve all of our communities better. Okay, welcome. a topic limit. So it has to be relevant to what is being talked about at that public meeting. Um, when you have three days notice, it's much easier to plan and register that public comment. However, when you don't have that three days notice, it can be much harder and therefore a lot harder to participate in that democratic process. Um, you also have the right to object to decisions um, being made during or any thing being held during what's called executive session. This is a closed meeting where the public is not allowed. It's very important for our local leaders to have this kind of space for them to really hash out details and that sort of thing, but decisions themselves have to be made in a public space. So if you're in a meeting and they're going into executive session or they mention it, you have the right to protest that. Um, you also have the right to document what's happening at that meeting. If you want to do a video recording, audio recording, take notes at a public meeting, nobody can stop you. Um, go ahead, do it, record what's happening, make sure that you have what you need to know and if you want to share it with your neighbors, you can do that too. Um, and lastly, once the meeting is over, everybody's supposed to be able to access all of the minutes of what happened at that meeting. So technically, our local government is supposed to be making a really good record of what's happening during these public meetings. However, because of capacity issues, you know, what's, you know, the biggest focus for that team, these kinds of things often fall by the wayside. And there's a lot of reasons for that. So that's where Documenters is really stepping in to create that more complete public record. Um, so what's really exciting, you can participate in Democracy Day, you can participate in Documenters and become part of this program. And so now I'm gonna start up a conversation with three incredible Documenters who have been with us and taking notes at public meetings for the last more than a month sometimes, and um, ask them some questions about why this is important to them and everything. So I'm gonna turn it over to my wonderful colleagues here who are participating in Documenters, and I'm gonna ask that everybody just uh, start by introducing yourselves, share your name, your pronouns, um, and then also like, you know, how you're in Philly, what's your relation to, to the city, and what do you love about Philly? So we will start over at the end. Thank you for joining Philly Cam and WPPM LP Philadelphia 106.5 FM for our Democracy Day special. Live from the intersection of 7th and Randstead, Philly Cam is here to share some ways that you can participate in the democratic process. You can learn more about Democracy Day at usdemocracyday.org and learn more about people powered media at phillycam.org. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be right back. Sure. Um, I cheated on it with New York for 10 years, but 
think I'm here to stay with a lot of travel. <laughs> All right. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Savon DePaul. I use she, they pronouns. Um, my relationship with Philadelphia is a pretty, uh, pretty positive one. I've been here for, I was born in Chester County, but I've been here for, for some years now. Um, found a lot of ingratiated a lot of with a lot of queer community here um the thing that attracted me to documenters was the idea of kind of being involved with uh, um kind of being involved with kind of local politics and accountability in a different way um very often kind of sometimes been doing like some activism and stuff like that can be can be very like stressing and like very like on and direct uh, when in some ways that's not always needed and sometimes there's a different approach that is needed and um i think one of those is like, sitting in meetings and taking notes and learning about things and in that process i've like learned a lot of minute details about the city and how and how it runs and specifics um for everything from everything from trash to to ta how taxes are done here, property and beyond. So, I don't know, I think it's a it's a great um, it's been a great opportunity to learn. Hello, everyone. My name is Jared Johnson. Uh, I was born in North Philadelphia, raised in Ohio, in a small town, and I came back in 2018. The thing that brought me to documentaries is that I want to make a difference, especially in the city of Philadelphia. I'm also a member of Fifth Square, which is a, a political action, or, action organization. So Will Tung and John Ginning, if you're watching, shout out to you guys. They're like the heads of Fifth Square. So that's what brought me to documentaries. And I also have an associate's degree and a bachelor's degree in college. And I want to make that useful by making career out of working within the city of Philadelphia, whether it's in public office or public transit. I'm a big advocate of public transit at Fifth Square as well, so a big fan of the buses, so I'm like a transit nerd. And I would say my relationship in Philadelphia is ever-changing and impactful. Like I said, I want to make a difference in people's lives. Um, I don't want to be known as, especially an African-American like myself, as one of those statistics that are in jail, always in trouble. I want to make my life a positive one. And I hope that other people of different ethnicities who are watching this that are thinking that there's nothing out there for me. I have no way of, of being 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 successful, yes, you do. You can be successful. And the only thing that's stopping you is yourself. And if you believe in yourself and say to myself, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I know that there's going to be challenges. And believe me, there are going to be challenges along the way. Life is not going to be easy, but if you, if you keep believing in yourself that you can do it and be positive, then you will go a long way. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, all right, so I should share about myself. Obviously, I'm Julie Christie. Maybe that's not obvious. And, you know, my relationship with Philly is I came here as a student and I fell in love with this city seven years ago, almost eight. And it's a place where I immediately wanted to invest myself. You know, I really want to be part of this city. I think Philadelphia is where I learned about community and that was very life changing. And so I, I want to be part of that. And so I'm so excited that the city has allowed me to be part of, you know, this place and show the love that I didn't know that I could for a place for a group of people. Um, and everything. And I think something I love about Philly is it's unapologetic self, you know? It's a place where I learned how to be myself and I just get to walk down the street and know everybody else is also being just themselves. Um, 
and that's just, you know, I've been places that don't have a personality and they're not as fun. They're not as, as much of a good time. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, my connection to Philadelphia and really what it means to me. Uh, so one of my first questions for you all is, you know, just I'm curious about how you did hear about documenters, you know. Um, I know the ways that we shared out what the program was when we launched, but I'm curious what, like, how did you first hear about us? Um, I think for me, I actually heard about it in three different ways. I think the first way was via City Bureau, Okay. I want to say. Um, I was on their mailing list from a different project. Oh. Um, and then I think I heard about it via Fifth Square and a third way I can't remember. So the third time was the charm. <laughs> we'll get ya. <laughs> um, I first heard about documenters through another, for an, a friend and a fellow activist in the city. Um, I'm in part of like a little autonomous collective and we usually do a lot of like mutual aid projects and stuff. And they had actually sent me this. I'm like, hey, you might be interested in this. So I, I'm like, oh, okay, give it a shot. Awesome. The first time I heard about documentaries is, and I might have said this already, but I heard it through Fifth Square because they also have a newsletter that they send out every week about what they're doing in the city, opportunities for growth, job opportunities, events, that sort of thing. So I heard about documentaries through that, and I decided to check it out and see how it is. You know, take notes, be my, give myself a voice. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, and then we can go in kind of the opposite direction uh, this time around. So we'll start with you, Jared. So I'm really curious about, you know, do you have a passion for, like, why do you care about doing something that really pushes for transparency and accountability from our local government? I care about our people. You know, I want my voice to be heard. And that's all I have to say about that. I'm definitely, I'm definitely in that boat, too. Um, I think with, like, it can be pretty easy to, like, look over local stuff, you know. And I think being on, at the ground level, being in there taking notes is, like, a good way to shine some light on what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, I th the thing I think about most is accessibility. Mm. Um, because I always want to make it as easy as possible for people to be involved citizens and... Now that I'm older, I know how much how difficult that can be. The more complicated and busy your life becomes. When I was younger, I was like, everybody should do it. Everybody should be an activist. And now I'm like, I get it. Um, but I was excited to be part of something that made this knowledge more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said at the beginning, kind of fills in the gaps where the city may not have the capacity to actually do that. Yeah. Yeah. And so you started to talk about this, Evie, of an experience where there were public meetings that a neighbor of yours didn't know about. And so I'm really curious, you know, from you others as well, um, like, was there a particular experience or situation that you all have come up against or, like, experienced where you also didn't have access to public information or a public meeting and like what what was that experience what was it like it's okay if you need a moment to think about it um i can share one from myself maybe which is uh so i live out in west philly and we have the best farmer's market in the city i've said it uh in clark park and there was a period of time in Clark Park where there were a bunch of independent vendors who were selling things and it was great it was like it's an amazing craft fair incredible artists and um, sellers and it was like a great integral part of the farmers market which then uh, a public entity stepped in and said you cannot vend here anymore there's rules there's regulations around it and you know I heard about a meeting 
ab about solutions to what can be done. You know, how can we make this accessible to people because the cost for vending is really expensive and cost prohibitive, especially to a lot of people. And um, I found out about that meeting an hour after it started. And I found out about it from somebody who lives in Fishtown. And I was like, how do I, somebody who is in the news, in my neighborhood, not know about this public meeting? I learn about it on Instagram from somebody who lives across the city. And so that was a really frustrating experience for me because I Welcome. felt like I didn't know what the first half of the meeting was about. I didn't know what people were talking about, what solutions had already been surfaced. Um, I didn't know who was in that meeting. I didn't know if I was allowed to speak up because I arrived late. Um, and so, yeah, that was like, it was a really frustrating experience where I was like, I wish that this had been announced better. Um, and, you know, I wish that there was somebody who could have filled me in on what was going on beforehand. And it was just as we were launching, launching documentaries. And I was like, this is... You know, it was very affirming as well as frustrating that, you know, that was something that myself and my neighbors had to deal with and the people who were like selling their incredible art in Clark Park. Because I don't know how many people weren't able to go and like not weren't able to speak up for themselves and really like share what it means to them to be able to be in that space. Um, so that's an experience I had. Has, has anything popped up for you too? I will say there, I mean, a few examples could spring up, but um, one that I thought of that was like, huh, I, get, I never thought of that that way was that um, I was hanging out with a friend and she was telling me about like, telling me about how she like wanted to put, um, she had wanted to like put trees and like plant new things in her garden, but like, and as, as well as like some small trees, but um, there are, there are little like, there are like regulations or rules around planting like trees and stuff in Philadelphia and I'm like that surprised me huh I didn't know that um and at the time I was like I was like maybe I should look into it but I'm like maybe I should have because and then um and kind of going into like documenters where there was I was faced with a situation where I was like in a meeting where like that topic did come up of tree of of trees and planting and stuff like that so like oh that could have been useful what about you, Jared? Do you have an experience where you've, you know, kind of like not had access to a public meeting or public information? I don't have any experience that I was shut out because every time I applied to join something or a meeting or came to a meeting, I was always invited or offered to be invited. Uh, being in documentaries, it got me into detail about what different things are all about. So an example like housing and land use, it gave me a, a good look and detail about what these people are going through with their rent, or what these people are going through, how, how their houses are being kept up, what's going on with their neighbors, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got into it but I can't recall anything that I've been shut out um, gotcha. I mean I've heard of other people that's been shut out or couldn't get access to certain things and I can go on and on but uh, you know we're being time limited today so uh, yeah that's all I have to say like I have personally haven't been affected by it but I know a few others that's been affected by one event that they've been shut out yeah and I think that's really important to talk about too is you know it's like we've talked about you know maybe not great experiences and also there are people out there there are agencies out there that are really accessible too and that's awesome <laughs> um you know it's really exciting when people are able to make it to meetings and share their voices and to hear about it you know like you know agencies or whoever that share you know hey like in a month we're having this meeting. Get it on your calendars. You know, the ones who really put in that work is super exciting to see. Um, so we have a little bit of time left. So I'm really curious to know 
Um, let's see. What are your hopes for what, you know, like, if you could imagine documenters, what we're doing here, taking notes, sharing information, what do you envision? Like, how could that possibly impact our entire city? Um, have you thought about that or imagined, you know, like, what is a future for Philly with, like, a really successful documenters program? I guess for me, by having other people get into it, by having other people be invited, if other people, you know, spread the word around more people around the city. I mean, don't get me wrong, documentaries, I mean, we get, documentaries have been very good in reaching a whole lot of people, but there's still a lot more people that need to be docu uh, that need to be reached out many more people that need to be reached out especially in the city alone cuz this city is like a million people in the city alone not including the travelers <laughs> so there are people that are blinded by what's going on in the news and yet when i turn on the news and i hear these horrible stories about gun violence and 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 domestic violence and and road rage. I say to myself, these people don't get it. Like some of these people may not have watched the news more often or don't care. So, you know, spreading the word around is one example in my mind. Thanks. Um I think my dream is that it becomes ubiquitous to the point where it's almost boring and something we can take for granted like yeah you can it's just there um part of our like civic infrastructure and people can just easily access it um without really thinking about it or even having to think of themselves as an activist mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i definitely agree with what i definitely agree with what jared and what evie are saying um i would definitely add that like one of the i guess a good marker for success and documenters would be like if there is a meeting and there's like a bunch of people and who are leaving public who are making public comment a bunch of people who are in there being like every time you can always expect you can always expect a group of people to be there and to be like be like hmm, i'm gonna make i'm gonna make a comment about this i'm gonna make a comment about this so that like that's uh, i guess that's when you know it's like okay yeah we're now we're like really now we're really really cooking mm -hmm. yeah awesome thanks i think i really share all of those dreams um and something that i'm really excited to see about the program is you know i want to see documenters to be at every meeting i want every person in the city who helps run a public meeting to know that we're going to be there and to actually like be excited that we're going to be there. I think that that is a really, really big dream for me because, you know, I think when we all have information, we can work together more easily. We can um, communicate better and all of that, especially if we're all working from, you know, a shared and unified like source of information. Um, so we are just about wrapping up. So I want to share, you know, what everybody watching can do about documenters. Um, so first, thank you all so much for joining me on a Friday midday kind of morning situation. We're getting lunch after. Um, I want to share with everybody how they, how they can all become documenters and how they can join this program. So uh, anybody can join. We have no requirements or prerequisites to be part of this program. Um, we do want to make a note that while this program, we're not uh, producing content directly in Spanish, we are excited to work with people of various levels of English proficiency. Um, and we are really excited to, you know, share with you that our next training to become a documenter is free to attend. Uh, it's on October 23rd, so in about a month and a half. That's a Monday evening um, from 6 to 8 p.m. If you check out our website at philly-pa.documenters, 
That's D O C U M E N T E R S. Dot org. You'll be able to find that training, and there we'll talk in more detail about your rights at public meetings, how to take notes, and best practices, as well as, you know, just building community together and working together. So thank you all so much for joining, um, and we are so excited for this program. Thank you for joining Philly Cam and WPPM LP Philadelphia 106.5 FM for our Democracy Day special. Live from the intersection of 7th and Randstead, Philly Cam is here to share some ways that you can participate in the democratic process. You can learn more about Democracy Day at usdemocracyday.org and learn more about people-powered media at phillycam.org. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be right back. Next up, we'll have Luisa Suarez interviewed by Lily to discuss Equal Informed Philly. Hey, Jay. Thanks so much. Uh, we're back. I'm here with Luisa Suarez, who runs the Equally Informed Philly text line. Hey, Luisa. How Hi. are you? Hi, Lily. I'm really good. I'm really excited to be here with you and, you know, Philly Cram here on Democracy Day. Okay, so before we hop in, tell me a little bit about yourself, Louisa. So I am the editorial associate on uh, the Equally Informed team, really a part of the Resolve uh, Philly team as a whole. And I actually um, have been working here for a year now, but I was an intern in my undergrad at Temple. Go Owls. I'm here, so yeah. Awesome. So Louisa, what sparked your interest in journalism and why? Honestly, so I have been really involved in journalism since I was in high school. Um, when I was around 10th grade, I joined this local paper called Voices, and that like came in tandem with a local talk show like WEEU, and I would go on there and like talk to residents of the like Berks County community. So I've always been really into journalism from a young age. I was very lucky to have that, but also um, my dad has always just read the news and such, and I was very influenced by that as well. Oh, cool. Um, so, Louisa, what is the Equally Informed Philly text line? So, the EIP text line started in 2020 um, during the pandemic because, you know, there was just a lot of information swirling around. And we have a digital divide here in Philadelphia as well, right? Not everyone has Wi-Fi. Not everyone has access to high-speed Internet. So, we kind of wanted to address that problem by creating the EIP text line. And we would send resources um, to our subscribers every Tuesday and every Thursday. And now, through the years, it's developed to a text line where I send all kinds of resources sources out to the community. So. Awesome. so how do you use that to keep people informed? How do I keep it? Honestly, I think one of the big things is for us to be informed. You know, we have a wonderful community engagement team that works with a lot of our community partners that have um, wonderful resources. So we send out like a bunch of different things. So we'll send out resources from housing, um, jobs, all kinds of sort of even like around the holidays, like for Thanksgiving, like where you can get food. And it's especially really helpful during like emergencies in the city. Mm -hmm. For example, when we had um, the air quality issues, we found where you can get masks or when we had, you know, the possible water contamination, we just sent out the links directly of like, hey, put in your address, see if, you know, there's possible water contamination where you're at. So that's really the ways that we try to keep ourselves informed and therefore help, like, you know, our subscribers stay informed as well. Right. Okay. So speaking of resources, we're here on Democracy Day, a day to call attention to the importance of civic engagement and being civically involved. So what kind of information do you guys send out when election season rolls around each year? So since uh, the fall of around 2020, we have been sending out like a lot of voter guides and ensuring that people know, hey, this is where I go to vote. Hey, am I eligible to vote? Information like that. So we've been sending that out for years now. Um, and, you know, in the spirit of election season, we thought we might do a fun little run through of uh, general election like facts to know. You know, I'll start off with a really big one. Election day is November 7th, so don't forget to register to vote because the deadline is October 23rd. But if you're not a U.S. citizen or a, um, before 30 days of election day, you can't vote. So that's important to know. Right. So as we get closer to election season in November, we're going to be voting for our next mayor in Philadelphia. We're going to be voting for new city council members, judges, and more. 
So as we get closer to Election Day, November 7th, you should stay tuned to local news outlets who work really hard to keep people informed about the positions we're voting for. Um, so outlets like Billy Penn, WHYY, Kensington Voice, they put out really fantastic voter guides. Um, there's also the Committee of 70, where you can go on their website and fill in a sample ballot to see what your specific ballot is going to look like for where you live, the district you're in. Um, so yeah, stay tuned for that. And also, if you subscribe to the Equally Informed Philly text line, we'll text those things right to your phone. We really will, you know. I think one of the most important things we do during election season is get those guides and really pull a lot of the key information a couple weeks before, you know, November 7th, and send that out to everyone. So if you're a subscriber or, you know, want to subscribe, keep keep an eye out for that. Um, another really important fact is the polls open at 7 a.m. and they close at 8 p.m. Now, it's really important to remember if you've had, like, you know, a really long day, but you're able to get in line by 8 p.m., you still have um, the right to vote as long as you aren't in line, right? But let's say, you know, you have work all day or for some reason, you know, you just can't make it to the polls. There is always a uh, mail-in voting. Yep. Yeah, so the deadline to apply for a mail-in ballot is going to be 5 p.m. on Tuesday, October 31st, a.k.a. Halloween. Halloween. So request your mail-in ballot online. You can do that through the state's election website, which is vote.pa.gov. Yes, and if you're interested in being a poll worker, right, you want to make some extra cash, um, you can apply to be a poll worker online or with the Office of the City Commissioners. They're also in need of bilingual uh, interpreters, clerks, and machine inspectors as well. And you could be paid upwards of like 250 for working on Election Day, which I think Not is bad. Cool, you know, a little extra cash. And also you can do it as long as you're 17 and up. So even the youth can get in on, you know, participating on Election Day, which I think is a really cool way to be involved, you know? Yeah. I think we like to say Equally Informed Philly that it's equally as important okay. to be, you know, informed about what's happening in the city during election season, but also after election season. So programs like Philly Documenters, which we talked about earlier today, is a great way to do that. Um, also staying tuned in to what local, local news outlets um, are sharing and supporting their efforts is a great way to keep up with the latest on city government and how people can be involved. So, Louisa, how do people sign up for the Equally Informed Philly text line? Honestly, that's like the question of the hour, right? How do you get involved? How do you subscribe? So all you have to do is text Equal Info to 215-910-7070. Or, you know, honestly, follow us on Instagram and on social media at Equal Info 215. And, you know, you can get plugged into all the resources we share. Not only do we, you know, are we really active on the text line, but we're also really active on Instagram and Twitter. We have flyers um, from our community partners. We'll have updates on our story and on the TL. So if you, you know, want to get in on the social media, that's a way to do it as well. Cool. Louisa, thanks so much for joining me here on Democracy Day and Parking Day with Philly Cam. The Equally Informed Philly text line is such an important resource, and I'm so glad we could talk about that today and share it with the people. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, also, this is like an important chance for people to see, you know, I exist. I'm not a bot when yep. I'm texting you, you know, when you're a interacting with me, asking your questions. I am behind, you know, the computer, you know, interacting with you guys. So here. Real people. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for joining Philly Cam and WPPM LP Philadelphia 106.5 FM for our Democracy Day special. Live from the intersection of 7th and Randstead, Philly Cam is here to share some ways that you can participate in the democratic process. You can learn more about Democracy Day at usdemocracyday.org and learn more about people powered media at phillycam.org. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be right back. Lastly, I will be inter well, interviewing the staff from PA Youth Vote. Welcome, everyone. Okay, can we start by introducing yourselves? So, hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, I'm a summer program coordinator for PA Youth Vote. 
Hi everyone, my name is Cameron Davis and I serve as the lead organizer for PA Youth Vote. Hi, my name is Don Mir and I'm a, the digital media director of PA Youth Vote. Okay, so we just gonna get right into it, okay? All right. All right, so what is PA Youth Vote doing to engage new young voters and what do you see working? Okay, so PA Youth Vote does a lot of work to um, engage new youth, vote, new young um, youth voters and people who can't vote yet. So that we, like right, we try to get them ready um, before they are of voting rate, of voting age, so that they're informed voters. So we go into classrooms. We have a lot of clubs in different schools in Philly and in others in other counties um, throughout PA, um, and that really gets students excited about it because they get to be in, in, informed and engaged about voting and civic engagement by other people that are going to school with them. Um, so that gets a lot of students excited about voting and also gets them understanding about issues um, that they care about and how they can use their votes and how they can go to their elected officials to make change. Nice. That, this sounds really dope. All right. So uh, what has gotten you guys interested in this work? For me, it all started when I was in high school, like Rebecca mentioned. I was 17 years old, it was back in 2018, and my teacher, Mr. Quinn, who is actually one of the co-founders of PA Youth Vote, he was telling me about the importance of my vote and connecting it to like black history and the history of us in voter suppression. And once I learned that, it really made me want to get engaged more. And I started doing voter registration in schools, and then I went to college, started making TikToks about voting, and now I'm 22 years old, and I'm trying to help other young people the same way I was helped when I was 17 years old. So I really think it's empowering to see the full circle, and I believe that PAU Vote does that well, really engaging you when you're young, 17 in the classroom, and then bringing it to now, like even Rebecca, myself, I mean, we're all of college age, and we've been impacted by this work since we were in high school. I could dig it once again. So uh, another question that I have is, what are the issues that you guys are hearing regarding young people being engaged in the voting process? Yeah, so there's a lot of issues that um, students have been talking about. Um, young people in general, um, a lot of them have to do with like gun violence. A lot of them have to do with um, like uh, women's rights, abortion rights, um, uh, especially like in Philadelphia. Even stuff like sanitation has been like a really big issue that students care about. So there's like really anything that you see in our city that you're like, hmm, maybe we should change that. I bet you a student's thinking about it. I bet you a young person's thinking about it because um, they're just thinking about so many different and we are all just thinking about so many different um, ways that we go and we like it's like for example like uh, criminal justice reform there's a lot of young people concerned about that because they're like yo I got my brothers my cousins my sisters incarcerated and there's this it looks like there's no way out we don't even know how to navigate the justice system so things like that a lot of things about education that's what students are concerned about that's what young people are worried about because we don't know we don't have that education and the things that we do know every time we learn about something else it's like dang why is it like that so Damir have you come across any issues when you reached out and talked to some of these young new voters? Yes, absolutely. Like, a lot of the times, like Rebecca was saying, it really evolves around the form of, like, education and stuff like that. And some of them might not know ways that they could use their voice, uh, you know, to really make change. And a lot of the times, we not only can make change through voting, but also through our freedom of expression. Like, as the media director, like, I really want to encourage the kids or whatnot to really use their voice, or uh, combining art, activism, you know, really tell a story because a lot of voices get silenced when it comes to, you know, the political system and stuff like that. So it's just really like th that education factor and then knowing how to go about it has really been like the two main things that I've been hearing in terms of talking to students and stuff. Nice, nice, nice. Would you like anything to add to that? I would like to add to that. I think oftentimes when they hear PA youth vote, a lot of people have this misconception that young people don't care about voting, we don't care about politics, and that's really not the case. Like Rebecca and Damir both mentioned, it's finding a way to connect the issues with the power of their vote. Because these young people come from, we come from like disenfranchised communities, marginalized communities where we don't really talk about this. So when you tell us about the power of our vote and you connect that with the issues 
issues we care about, we're more likely to get out and vote and be civically engaged. Cool. All right. So now my question to you guys, when you guys were in high school, right, would you guess that you'll be doing the outreach that you're doing now for, for voters or this is something that is new to you, but you're excited that you're doing it? Okay, so when I first learned about PA Youth Vote, I had no idea what I was signing up for. And I was like, ooh, you know, this sounds cool. I got nothing to do. When I showed up, I was like, oh, wow. This, I learned so much that first meeting. I was like, wait, you're telling me that my vote does this, this, that, and the other? Like, I was like, and so, like, if, if beforehand, when I had initially joined, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, this will be something nice to do while I'm in high school, whatever. I did not think I'd be sitting here right now being like, yo, you know, vote is really important and we really got to get more education about it. Like when you first join, you may not like, and I know a lot of other people that have the same story that joined PA Youth Vote. Like when you first join, you don't, you may not know what you signed up for because we don't get educated about voting a lot. But by the end, it's like, oh my gosh, we got to get, we got to get more people into this because this is so important and it's infecting our lives. Would you like to add? I would like to add, honestly, I feel like when I first started, like in high school, I was like, I'm going to be a lawyer. That's it. That was, I was tunnel vision. I'm going to be a lawyer. And then I don't know how, I think it was the pandemic and the 2020 election, getting really involved and doing work with PA Youth Vote. I feel like my trajectory changed. Now I'm doing work with nonprofits. Now I find myself doing more teaching and I never thought I would have an element acting like a teacher. I really enjoy this. And I still think I could be a lawyer and find a way to combine this, but I had no idea that PA Youth Vote was gonna take me down this path. That's the awesome part of it, ain't it? <laughs> it really is. How about you, Damir? Yeah, so when I was in high school, honestly, I did not think about voting at all, but I was a very artistic person. I knew that I, freedom of expression was really important to me. Mm -hmm. And um, coming into PA UFO, it showed me how to really navigate and use that in different ways, right? Because when, uh, honestly, I was probably one of those people that didn't believe in the power of voting and didn't really understand it, right? But getting into PA UFO and like understanding how, uh, how every vote really does count, you know? And also like messaging, marketing, things like that, it kind of play a factor into, into this as well. Like how, how much do we know? How much are we getting educated by the media at the same time? You know, all these things uh, are really important and should be taken into account. So um, this or PA UFO has really like gave a new avenue to um, really making a change or making a difference in, in, a, in our community, essentially. Okay, so this is the next question for you guys. Y'all ready for it? Yep. All right, here we go. What incentive does PA youth voters working for this upcoming election? We have a lot of things that we're doing. First and foremost, we always make sure that when we go into schools and we try to get students to do registration teams, that we're paying them for the work that they're doing. All of the students get paid for going out and tabling at local community events, sitting here doing interviews. Everything that we do, we make sure that we put money in their pockets. Another thing that we're doing is on October 4th, we're actually having a voter registration party with Councilmember Kendra Brooks. Uh, we're partnering with the School District of Philadelphia. There'll be some tours that the students get to do in a little fun scavenger hunt, all things to get them registered to vote, but also to have have them see the fun in voting, right? And the last thing that we're doing is on October 26th, which is actually National Vote Early Day. We're having a Vote Early Day March called Give Us a Ballot. It's actually inspired by a speech that Dr. Martin Luther King did called Give Us the Ballot, where he says, give us the ballot and we'll fill our legislative halls with men of goodwill. So we'll be having a Vote Early Day March. There'll be some food. There'll be some fun. DJ Diamond Cuts is coming and she's DJing. Just all fun things to get them to understand that voting does doesn't have to be boring, but really engaging them because voting can be fun. All right, so mention those two dates one more time in a Got little it. brief. So just in case if they didn't get all that good information, <laughs> they could get it one more time. How about that? Sure can. So on October 4th, we will be having an event. We're hosting it in partnership with Councilmember Kendra Brooks called We're Grown Now, New Voters Registration Party. We'll have a scavenger hunt. We're partnering with the School District of Philadelphia. It'll be a whole lot of fun. And then on October 26th, we're having our national vote early day 
Day March called Give Us a Ballot, where students can come, request a mail-in ballot, vote early, enjoy music, performances, food. It'll be a bunch of fun. They get to vote and understand the importance of how their vote connects to some issues that they care about. For all that information, you can follow us at PA Youth Vote on all social media platforms. All right, so this is a question for all of you. After the election, where do you guys see yourself participating in PA Youth for the following election? Because it's not just the presidential, it's also, you know, what's going on statewide, judges, and so forth. So what are you guys individually planning for you guys' future with PA Youth? Okay, so I'm actually in school to be an educator right now. So one of the things that I've like been learning, especially like going just I just started school like last month. And so I learned like a lot that like a lot of people even like now that they're in college don't know about all the elections. They don't know about the power of all the elections and how really, really, really important their local elections are um, and how they probably affect them more than the national elections that they know about. So for me, it's definitely going out and be like, hey, there's a local election. You know who's up? And they're going to be like, no, what's that? And I'm going to be like, yo, you got to find out because you see how that street is has a pothole? That's why you need to go vote. So that's what I'm looking to do. Cool. I'll be working with PA Youth Vote um, full time. So something that I'll be doing is continuing to go back into schools, uh, starting voter registration teams, talking to them, giving presentations, uh, going to other events, trying to find students to give them something to do um, and connect with them that way. Something else that I'll be doing is probably making a lot of TikToks. I love making TikToks. I love it. <laughs> Voting TikToks, history TikToks, you name it. So I'll probably be making a lot of TikToks to also engage the Pennsylvania youth. Nice. I'll probably, uh, more than likely, I'll be really expanding on that media side, like kind of giving uh, kids the opportunity to like use their voice on social media. That can be documentaries. That can be any form of expression that they really want to engage in. So allowing their voice to be heard on all platforms and allowing everybody to have a spot or a seat at the table. All of you guys sound great on your new adventures and I can't wait to see where you grow. All right, so. I would like to thank everyone who participated in our parking day for the democracy day. Um, please tune in, continue to learn, continue to grow, and don't forget to go out and vote. Thank you. Thank you for joining Philly Cam and WPPM LP Philadelphia 106.5 FM for our Democracy Day special. Live from the intersection of 7th and Randstead, Philly Cam is here to share some ways that you can participate in the democratic process. You can learn more about Democracy Day at usdemocracyday.org and learn more about people-powered media at phillycam.org. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be right back. instructors today, uh, our leaders, our panelists will uh, share with you all. So uh, off the top real quick, we are going to be doing a Q&A at the end. So please, please feel free to use the chat religiously throughout to, you know, leave comments, thoughts or whatever, or questions. Uh, once we get to the Q&A part, uh, I'll help Gabe and Simon, who I'll introduce in a second, go through and make sure we got everybody. If you want to ask your question out loud, you can use the raised hand feature and the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom. Uh, if at any point you feel like you are, are about to share information that is sensitive or could put somebody in danger, if, if it, this is public, please let us know and I'll happily pause the recording. Uh, I don't think that'll be necessary for here, but in case, uh, we want to make sure everybody's uh, feeling safe. Uh, so with that, I will introduce and bring up on stage here our two wonderful panel leaders here. Oops, Simon just went away from my screen. There he is. Um, we have Simon Galperin and Gabe Schneider. Gabe is with The Objective and Simon with, is with the Community Information Cooperative. I will let them introduce themselves and kick it off. Gabe, Simon, take it away. Thanks, Joe. 
uh, welcome to all for being here. Thanks for U.S. Democracy Day for hosting us. Uh, my 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 friend and co-conspirator Gabe Schneider uh, will be speaking momentarily. I'm going to kick us off, get us moving on um, the conversation and the um, and the presentation today. The plan is to do a uh, a short introduction. We'll share a little bit about the work we've done together, the Community Info Co-op, and the objective to help the objective establish the democracy beat. Um, and then we will go into question and answers as soon as possible. Spend more time collaborating and uh, conspiring with y'all. Uh, in addition to sharing what we know. Um, so I'm just going to pull up my slides here. Uh, Joe, do you know if I have the ability to share screen? You do. You are a co-host. Fantastic. Cool. Oh. You know, it'd be funny if I didn't know. Yeah, just click present play on in the top right. Present in the top yeah, right. Yeah, like, right like that. Be funny. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Appreciate you. Got right. you. That's funny. Okay, who we are, of course, uh, Gabe Schneider is the co-executive director of the Objective, editorial director at the LA Public Press, a new uh, nonprofit publication in LA that I'd recommend everyone follow. Uh, I'm the executive director at the, at the Community Info Co-op. Uh, we do a number of things. One of the things we do is uh, a, a local news program called the Jersey Bee, which I'm the executive editor of. Uh, we have Info Districts, which is one of our flagship programs. And of course, Just Transition, which is the work we've done with the Objective it's a space where we do collective fundraising, training, and other organizing to help make journalism and media more equitable and just. Um, as I mentioned, uh, real quick, just sort of overview of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, Gabe and I will kind of use this slide to make sure we touch on these topics that y'all were expecting as you attended. Um, and then uh, we have a couple of assets to show you, our timeline, a pitch. Um, and then uh, back into questions and answers, uh, to spend, getting to spend time with y'all, talking to you. Um, so really briefly, I'll start with myself. Um, my name is Simon. Like I mentioned, I'm the executive director at the Community Info Co-op. We're, we're a journalism organization dedicated to making dedicated to making the, the field more democratic. We use policy organizing and practice to do that. We have a policy arm, which is info districts. We have uh, our organizing arm, which is the just transition work. Uh, and then we have our local news innovation arm in the Jersey B. Um, and the approach we take to journalism and democracy is that often we think about journalism as a thing that is um, that supports democracy, but journalists aren't actively thinking about the way they are strengthening democratic institutions to actually do the other part, to make democracy more sustainable, to make it more, uh, more democratic and more equitable, more accessible, to maintain the industry, not just the industry, but the service of journalism, delivering people relevant news and information that helps them access their community, live better lives, improve their well-being, their material conditions, et cetera. So for us, democracy is a critical thing for journalism to function. And in the community info crop, the way we the way we go about that is we have, you know, our local news arm, which does sort of like actively building out a more democratic public participatory news process. Uh, we have info districts, which is this policy position, which is the idea of creating hyperlocal taxing districts to support local news as a public utility. And then of course there's the just transition work, which is is about like taking the thing we have now and making it more useful and making it more democratic. So for us, when we, we sat down last year to think about what, you know, we have a very small budget, how are we going to make that work? How are we going to make that money go far and 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 um, invest in this brighter future, the transition of the journalism and media ecosystem? We have this other work we've done, <clears throat> excuse me, about the Knight Foundation, where we're, we're sort of like investigating and holding them accountable to their DEI and, and fiscal responsibility commitments. Uh, but then on the other hand, we also want to invest in 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 the alternative, um, in addition to sort of investigating the thing that is and reforming it. And there is no better alternative sort of media ecosystem player, um, uh, you know, coverer, reporter, someone who can hold the space accountable more than the objective, a nonprofit um, that was established a few years ago that Gabe will, will speak a little about, about that. Um, to hold journalism accountable, uh, I think, to the, the historical wrongs it's committed uh, and, and maybe set a vision for the future. So it was a great opportunity to take our dollars and think about how we invest them in this organization. So um, 
the role collaboration played in that. So that's this little second point. I'll touch on that and we'll move to Gabe. Uh, the role collaboration played is that in that is that like all things demo, demo, democratic, you kind of have to involve a lot of people. Uh, it has to be a collective process. You want to find consensus and work with others. So we reached out to Gabe. I reached out to Gabe. And I was like, hey, I have this kind of half half baked idea. What if we created a sponsor pool? and seeded that sponsor pool to create a, a democracy be at the objective. Gabe and I went back and forth a couple of times, sort of scoping that out, making sure it works. And then uh, we went to our peers in the space. We went to US Democracy Day um, at based at the Center for Cooperative Media. We went to IndieGraph. We went to Borealis Philanthropy and the Racial Equity and Journalism Fund. We went to our friends at the Democracy Fund and we said, hey, we don't need a lot. We just need a little bit to get all of this money together and put it to good use. Um, covering this space, this critical space, um, in in a way that represents the needs of historically marginalized communities, Black and Brown communities, communities of color, working class communities, immigrant communities, etc. So, so we were excited to be able to bring that coalition together and support the objective. And then the objective, um, I think, amazingly, intuitively, like smartly, uh, turned that into an audience revenue campaign. So in addition to the dollars we were able to raise for them, they were able to make that even more through pretty th pretty th a thoughtful audience growth strategy. So um, I'm going to hand it off over to Gabe, who might also share a little bit about the practical insights to Badger Good Democracy B and like what the democracy and what the objective has learned so far. Um, then we'll show you some assets. We have some starter questions if we want, but we're excited to to get to speak to y'all. Sure. Thank you, Simon, for the introduction. Um, so like Simon said, I am the editorial director at LA Public Press, which is a nonprofit news outlet focused on Los Angeles County. Um, specifically and you know I won't go too long, uh, too long about this but LA County is quite vast um you know there's 10 million people it's the largest county in the country in terms of population and there's not a lot of news coverage I'm sure you've seen the coverage lately of all the layoffs that have been happening around the county news sources so just investing in folks that have already had news coverage but also many folks that haven't there's a lot of unincorporated areas of LA County that just haven't traditionally had news coverage um, for today in particular, I'll be talking about, like Simon said, our work with The Objective, which has been a nonprofit newsroom examining power and inequity in journalism. So that's both how newsrooms treat their employees, right, when it comes to the intersections of their identity, but also how newsrooms have interacted with the communities that they're supposed to cover. So those two, um, two sides of the same coin. So... I think what's been really lovely about this program is we've sort of iterated and, and figured it out as we've gone. Um, one of the key insights for me, as we were sort of trying to hire a democracy correspondent, was really giving them the space to define, you know, we had sort of put out our own definition of what we expected of the democracy correspondent and how we were defining democracy, but giving them the space to articulate to us how they think about democracy and the ways in which um, they wanted to sort of cover the beat. And I think giving them that space really gave us the ability to really understand where they were coming from, how they thought about democracy in terms of race, how they thought about democracy in terms of gender, in terms of power, in terms of um, US infrastructure. So I think, I think that was a really important key thing that we had sort of done intentionally, but it really played out well for us in the candidate pool because we had a lot of extremely talented candidates and it was quite hard to choose. We ended up choosing uh, two democracy correspondents instead of one, because it was so difficult to choose based on the pitches that everyone had made to us. And I think everyone else was also quite qualified. We invited, I believe, um, everyone else to pitch us as well. So I think if we had had more money and more time, I think we would have hired more folks. And I think if we had more capacity, that would have made a lot of sense. Um, so I think one is definitely sort of the hiring process and being intentional about the ways in which you're talking to folks about what you want, but also giving them the space to sort of pitch you on how they think the role should function. I think the other thing for us is that, and Simon had mentioned this, like we had put together democratically a small pool of sponsors. We had sort of made asks, you know, to organizations whose budgets are in the millions or hundreds of millions, you know, could we have $5,000? Could we have $2,000? Um, and all of that together really makes a difference, right? Like you can put together the inklings of a project budget quite practically with that amount of money, but I think the other constraint, um, which you know was shown to us in that we weren't able to hire more than two people, is that it's a small amount of money ultimately, and it's it's a great way to get started. But I think um, you're constrained in year one by that small budget. So I think 
for us, it was being creative about how we can use that money in year one and then think about year two, is this a project we want to grow after experimenting a little bit with it? So those were the two sort of key practical insights that I got. Um, I think for a third quick practical insight, I think what's been extremely helpful, and I, I hope, you know, perhaps you can read some of the democracy correspondence work and perhaps they can talk about this online. But I think for us, it was really important to start them off with uh, resources and really engage with them as to like, what sort of stories we wanted to have, what sort of stories they were thinking about, just so they weren't jumping into things without any context. And the objective is really covering, um, you know, not it's not covering the democracy beat, it's covering how the democracy beat plays out at other newsrooms and, and covering how other newsrooms think about democracy. So it's sort of a meta role uh, and a watchdog role. But I think providing them the context of where we were and then talking to them about where they were and then finding sort of shared resources and talking about um, resources that we've already had really put them, I think, in a great spot to cover some really interesting things. Um, we ended up covering a climate protest in front of the White House Correspondents Association. I think that was a really interesting story that I didn't see a ton of follow up coverage on nationally. Um, I think we're also putting together a number of interesting stories that haven't come out yet. One um, on the ways in which youth media are kind of infantilized and, and talked about and funded in a way that sort of infantilizes the labor that they're doing, despite the work that they're putting in to sort of organize and change the way that young people are covered. Um, another great story on how strike publications have been functioning over the last few months. So looking at uh, digital strike publications, because there's a long history of strike publications where newspaper reporters are on strike and then they open their own sort of separate publication while they're on strike. And you have that happening right now at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. And you also had that happening at Business Insider. And so we're, I think, a day or so away from publishing that story. So I think what we've learned about democracy so far has been that, at least in terms of the meta coverage, there's just not a lot of it. I mean, there are some great media critics that I've obviously followed for a long time. You know, Jay Rosen is, is quite prominent in the space. But um, I think for the most part, you don't see a lot of focus on the meta coverage of democracy coverage and specifically when it comes to the intersections of like race gender class um looking at power I, you just don't see a lot of that and for us it's been really affirming and sort of validating to have the space to be able to talk more about that and invest in that coverage so that's been really exciting for us awesome thank you gabe uh, Joe, stop sharing my screen. At the moment, I was going to click on the next slide, so I'm going to do that again momentarily, so folks can see uh, the other assets we were going to, the other, the few other things we wanted to share with you all. Um, let me just open my page again. Here we go. Um, we did want to let folks know just some uh, background information about this before we get into questions, which is timeline. This happened pretty quickly. I just went into our, our DMs this uh, this morning and put this together. So July 10th, I reached out to Gabe. July 16th, and then by the end, by September 14th, uh, there was already this, this project page. We had raised the initial pool of money, um, and the audience revenue campaign was also already happening, was, was, was launching. Uh, and then the other little assets to show is the pitch. This was literally the one pager we shared around with all of the participants um, who ended up participating, all the funders or, and, and people who supported the project who ended up participating. Um, very brief summary, participating sponsors, total sponsor amount, um, and then the content format. So we did really want to keep it simple because we're raising small amounts of money and we wanted it to move as, as quickly as possible. I will share these slides afterwards so y'all can take a closer look at that. Finally, these are just some questions we could use to lead our conversation today. Um, if y'all have any questions, Gabe and I are, are happy to answer. Uh, I feel like a real jerk for stopping the, that right. That's okay. That's all right. I, it happens. I hate when people uh, are like stuck on a slide. I want to see your, your beautiful face. No, I understand. Like, we do want to see Gabe's beautiful face. I agree. I'm going to copy those those questions. Yes, yeah, so if we could. Um, yeah, actually, I'll go, stop sharing. and I'm going to snag them from the... The only thing I'll add really quickly is that yeah. that was sort of the pool of initial sponsors. So like Simon mentioned, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. once we had sort of put out the call that we were doing this and said, hey, we're looking for some audience funding. Um, we also had a couple other sort of institutional funders step up, specifically Mizzou and then um, Democracy SOS from Harkin 
And I think that was really lovely to see folks say, hey, I know you're already doing this, but we're going to jump in and sort of give you some additional funding to make this work. Um, in addition to audience revenue and folks um, that are objective members and donors that were sort of wanted to contribute. It was really helpful to have that baseline of funding. Them. We do have a question in the chat already from Aurora who wants to add, can you talk about the use of the term sponsor versus funder or another term and how you navigate that? Something I learned as a, in this space growing up is that there's sponsor dollars and then there are grant dollars. So organizations might have money to sponsor a conference or a product or something um, that that might be a little bit more flexible and might be more used more like marketing dollars rather than a grants process that someone needs to get like formal approval for. Okay, awesome. Folks, feel free to, um, you should be able to, I will allow participants to unmute. You should be able to unmute yourself and um, ask any questions that you'd like. You can raise your hand, you can post them in the chat. Uh, Irene uh, wants to know, did the sponsor support come with messaging for those orgs then? Could you ask the question in a different way? Yeah, so um, because it was sponsor money and was coming from their marketing department, <clears throat> did they, were they expecting like a sponsor message to go with it, or was it kind of just for this project? I don't think there were any expectations other than like we're funding the project and like we, you know, we did put their logos on the on the sort of project page. Um, and we did mention them in our language, but I don't think there were any explicit outlined expectations as to like we need to say X and Y and Z thing. Um, a lot of them are sort of committed to the idea generally of like racial equity and, and democracy coverage. And so it was an easy sell for them. Can I ask a quick follow-up? So why did you then choose to go after those marketing dollars instead of the grant dollars? It's exactly what Simon said. It's faster approval. It comes from the comms budget. Um, and it's easier to just do like a lightweight project and iterate rather than like wait months and years for like a board to approve grants. Uh, if no one else has a question, I have one uh, that I'd love to ask. I think I want to I want to take a step back really quick and go back to the sort of the beginning of the project and the impetus for it. Um, I, super basic level, can you just talk about some of the things that you imagined or that you continue to imagine your democracy correspondents doing differently and how they approach this coverage? I think the word democracy is sort of it blended into everything that any individual wants to think it is at this point. So can you walk us through your vision of what pro-democracy or democratic reporting looks like uh, and what your correspondents um, hope to do or have done differently in their approach to that coverage? And then there's a question from Aurora after that. Yeah, I think um, I think there was a great quote from the, the summit that you all just hosted about how pro-democracy coverage does not mean like pro-democrat coverage right it's like pro coverage of both democrats uh, and republicans like covering those folks equally when it comes to how committed are they to democratic values um but to us it also means going outside of the sort of traditional political engagement spectrum and looking at you know how does this impact um or how can we cover the ways in which journalism is intertwined with protest with um with folks that are doing youth organizing with unions i, I think it, it's so much more expansive to us than just sort of institutional coverage or the ways in which like we might talk about like voting and republicans and democrats although that is very important and so as we at least as we think about it now i think that's sort of trickled down into the way that democracy correspondents have started to cover things you know they've covered things related to unions um which i don't think quite often um, gets enough coverage in the in the sort of meta coverage of journalism. There's not a lot of discussion of the ways in which unions are using their power to sort of democratically challenge their workplaces and, and work uh, fight for better conditions. Um, so I think that's that's the way that we conceived of it. And I think it's played out differently based on the Democrat or based on the correspondence that we've hired. I think they've brought their own perspective to it. And I think that's really, really lovely too. Just to underline that, like okay. democracy, democracy is often defined as being like election day and democracy day, US democracy day, the project has sought to sort of break that framework, but increase like amplifying that plus wanting that upvoting that the workplaces can be democratic, you know, consumer relationships with stores can be democratic. 
there are layers to democracy that are specifically sort of not really discussed. And that's really the opportunity of saying you could take a democracy, you could take like a food beat and look at it as a democracy beat. You could take a government beat and you look at a democracy beat. There are a lot of different ways to explore the topic. Okay, Woody Campbell has a question, but I want to get to Aurora's first, uh, since she asked, uh, since the funding came from marketing budgets, do you still have to do final reports or share deliverables about the impact of the work after the project was over? I mean, we have, but I don't think we had to. And I think we will continue to be like, hey, this, thank you for this funding, and this is what it's achieved. But I don't think there was any explicit conversation about like end of year deliverables or anything, at least in the in the terms of specificity that you might get in a grant proposal. Um, for us, those donations came from individual don donors for general general operating support, so it went. Woody, so you are up. Back. Hi there. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for organizing this. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, yeah, just like you know, I'm a democracy reform activist who I think wants to get into blogging about democracy reform and. Um, uh, yeah, and I just like my own kind of bias is that I I, um, uh, I I would like to I guess focus a lot on um, I think some of the biggest impact distortions in our democracy of like gerrymandering the malapportioned Senate um, you know an entrenched conservative majority on the court um, which um, it's interesting like those aren't as newsworthy necessarily in the sense that like. You know they're they're somewhat intractable um, uh, to deal with, but um, I don't know. Just it, it, in terms of like the policy distortion, they seem to have a bigger effect than like voter ID, in my opinion, which I think is bad and racist. But you know, you know, I think the evidence is a bit mixed about the partisan effect. Um, so I guess I'm I'm curious about um, how you all think about. Okay, the magnitude of impact of certain, um, you know, like the magnitude of impact of certain like uh, distortions in our democracy and how that influences kind of like what you choose to cover. I think it's weird to answer this question in that we cover the meta of that coverage. And so while we don't explicitly cover what you're talking about, we did do a Q and A with like Bolts Magazine, for example, who, who is doing, uh, you know, they're doing coverage of the impacts of what you're talking about on the local level and then bringing it to a national audience, which I think is a really interesting model. Um, I mean, I could probably speak to this a little bit from my time as like assistant managing editor at VoteBeat, but um, I think, yeah, it's, it's weird for us in that like we are covering other people covering it, which I which I think you bring up an interesting point, but I, yeah, it's it's not the explicit coverage of that thing as a correspondent. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that 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 makes sense. And so yeah, I do understand uh, why. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't be. I mean, for my own take, I still feel like there can be some value in thinking about that in terms of figuring out like what meta stories are good to cover. And I, I don't know, like one thing I I do kind of think that. Um, it is valuable. Um, what are you gonna say? Well, yeah, I like. I mean, like one thing. You know, I think it's messed up that we don't have like a parliamentary system, like you know, in you know almost any states or localities for the most part. Um, and uh, you know, I and I think it's messed up that you're kind of stuck with whoever the mayor is or governor is, regardless of whether they do a good job or a bad job. And it would be great to have like more of a norm of you know editorial boards like having a standard be that like, well, okay, we will, um, uh, you know, be more likely to endorse a candidate who says I'm willing to step down if like two thirds of the council think I'm doing a bad job or something. So you get like something kind of similar, even if not by rules of like, you know, a vote of no confidence or something. Again, I guess this is a little out of left field and not so much of like what current what's currently like in the news and what's being covered by a democracy reform organizations but i feel like there are there are creative ways for journalists to be radically pro-democracy in response to the biggest distortions in our democracy which one of which also includes just again single member districts winner take all elections plurality elections um which we just kind of take for granted 
So yeah, what yeah, are your, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like what, what thoughts do you guys have just about that? Train you're, of you're, you're landing on, you're landing on, I think one of the key like points of like this broader movement. Um, keeping, I keep shouting out U.S. Democracy Day, and it's really, I'm not a fan of these, these many shout outs, but like the, the broader movement is to say that there are ways to cover this topic that are like existential crisis level coverage. And then I think what the other thing you're pointing to is the fact that a lot of news organizations aren't as committed to the idea of, a, of democracy as they may, as their marketing and PR departments might say, as their mm. executive directors might say. So that's what I think you're running into what you're seeing. And then what I'd say is about naming the big things, like you got to name the big things. We can't name, we can't fix them until we name them, right? It's like, how can we, like, you can't, like, we never have democracy in a capitalist society, right? Like those two things are sort of like mutually exclusive. De Capitalism requires inequality, requires racism, it requires exploitation. So the idea that you will then give people democratic rights to potentially like organize and move themselves out of that class of that class system is a big thing that you have to name to be able to fix in a hundred years, right? Um, mm. So I think that's what I that's what I'd say to your question. Okay, we I just yeah. back up. We had a question from uh, uh, Aurora. It's just I think Sam, you already said you had individual donors. But uh, were there any individual major donors or was it just institutions? What's major mean? Fat stacks, I believe, is the like, technical term. Five, I mean, five K and up, like, but also like having specific one on one personal cultivations to support the work. Um, I, I the the three thousand dollars was seeded from like a personal donation from me as part of um, my commitment to giving back some of the um money I received through the JSK fellowship to other organizers and, and newsrooms that are doing allied work so I was I would say the only individual person involved in that process uh and then Irene makes a great point that this sounds a lot like solutions journalism lens uh when it comes to local democracy and I just want to shout out Jessel Noor who uh the democracy cohort manager at solutions journalism who is one of the driving forces behind the organizing team for this um, for 2023 and got involved, I think, in 2022. Um, it is very much so a solutions uh, lens in a lot of this. And Jay Rosen also has a great uh, a piece that he wrote as adapted from remarks he made at one of the first Democracy Day webinars um, like this last year um, about going even further beyond the democracy desk, uh, although in this case it's democracy beat. But um, uh, yeah, so I highly urge you to check that out. I put the link in the chat there. Um, if there are no questions in the media, I do have, I of course came with a couple of them ready to go, but um, while we're waiting for other questions, can you talk about any of the pushback uh, or, or responses, maybe not pushback, any responses you've gotten? I mean, we all love a good like wild YouTube comment claiming that we're, you know, journalists are all the devil, but um, any, any uh, institutional pushback from legacy organizations you've talked to and tried to sort of bring over to this mindset um, and what that has been like, if at all, if none, I mean, do, you're doing a great job, but if you have received any sort of like approaching this type of coverage tends to, you know, get people's pearls clutched in, in certain circles. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think the fun thing is, is a lot of legacy organizations and their editors don't think anything that happens on Twitter is meaningful, even when the conversation on Twitter is often young people of color trans journalists challenging their authority. So I don't think there's been a lot of response from the sort of upper echelons of power in legacy newsrooms. We did begin our sort of splash page with the sort of, the, the two things that are happening at the Post, right, are at the Washington Post are one, you know, their tagline is famously, democracy dies in darkness. It's a, it's a rebrand that they've been doing. I believe there was a Super Bowl ad. And the other is that they don't, allow their reporters to advocate for their own representation in the Senate, right? DC statehood. And I think that dichotomy is, is really interesting. So we sort of led with that. That's not to say that's something we're gonna only cover, right? That sort of institutional coverage. But I, I do think that in legacy organizations, when you are telling your reporters democracy is important and you don't let them engage in the democratic process, you say, oh, well, maybe you shouldn't vote or, oh, maybe you shouldn't advocate for your ability to have representation at a very basic level 
uh, in the Senate, I, I think that's really ridiculous. So that's that was sort of the, some of the starting point for our conversations about this work. Bernardo Mata um, wants to know, it says, says solutions journalism is how we started on this. How do we bring processes that actually work to public policy, government and elections arena? And I would add as well, what can editors, journalists, reporters at some of these larger news organizations with maybe not as much decision making power, what are some suggestions that you have for them to sort of at least start to chip away at this and, and maybe start to guide or edge things to in one direction towards more democratic and pro democracy coverage? I can answer the second thing, um, which is I think journalists and mid-level editors can use unions and you know public pressure and Twitter open letters, um, you know both things that they've that folks have done recently, um, strike publications to sort of apply pressure to management. You don't need to sort of work your way up to the top in order to make change. You can apply bottom-up democratic pressure to institutions, and they will. Ideally, change or bend to your will, and if not, then you keep fighting. I mean, the New York Times has been incredibly, incredibly rude to, I wouldn't just say rude, I would say dangerous to, um, in their response to folks that have protested and advocated against their coverage of trans folks. And I think it's been unfortunate to see, but I've been heartened by the consistent public letters and consistent response from the team that's been putting out those public letters. So I think that there are a lot of opportunities for folks to challenge, especially collectively challenge their bosses or the, the folks that hired them. And the New York Times was an example of where it was a lot of contributors, right? A lot of people whose income depends on the New York Times. And I honestly would be curious to know if that's impacted their income. I mean, it's a dangerous thing to do, but I think collectively it is a lot safer. I, yeah, I, I, I was in the, at the Cloud of Journalism Summit in 2019 when I was talking to the person who ended up organizing the WHYY union drive. Like, it really is just like, like there are opportunities for folks who are not higher up the rung to make change and hold power accountable democratically. But then I'd also say that, like, there is the participatory, there's like, uh, there's, there's the, there's like, the structure you work within, but then there's like the structure you create around the people around you. And I think it's not, it's certainly challenging when you're like a mid-level manager in a position where you're in between two sort of between, in between the hierarchy. Um, but you can think about the way your reporting is more participatory, your workflows and the way you talk to your team is consensus-based the way you do conflict resolution. There are things you could do like within your own circle of influence to just make this sort of like just the air you breathe slightly more equitable um, in addition to then organizing with your with your peers and counterparts. Um, so there is that actual more practical, like just day to day, you can, you can kind of change up, your, change up your vibe, change up your game to make it more fulfilling for you. But certainly the, the point Gabe made, which is like, it's ultimately it's about organizing and having conversations yeah. about what democracy yeah. means. To that point, uh, I probably should also mention like the the objective started as a collective, right? It's a collective of, and it remains to be in some ways, the leadership team is a collective of people that have jobs elsewhere in media. And we came together because we didn't feel like there was a space to sort of voice these concerns um, and to report on these concerns. And so I think there are a lot of ways to organize and sort of find fulfillment in challenging power structures that are outside of your job as well. Bernardo, do you want to expand on your question or elaborate a little bit? You had a question in the chat about process, bringing those processes. You want to unmute and uh, elaborate a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, as I mentioned in the chat, this was more of a comment on the previous question, but uh, as you answered, you gave me uh, something to think about. It's uh, the way we are doing this, it's a lot more uh, slow news process meaning looking at uh, what people are doing on in the on the ground and talking to them listening to the process there are each town each locality I mean we're in uh, Rhode Island so it's a very small state so we can do that <laughs> uh, but it's looking at what they're doing in the ground and start to find out okay how can we show better ways to do it things that were working or if they're doing really well how can we highlight that to the other localities uh, to start to think, what's the best way to approach this? And not that's going to fit everybody, but uh, how do we transform that in a way that's, uh, I hate to use this word, but consumable, <laughs> uh, that people will not look at it and say, okay, they're just doing all this conversation. Because when we go to the community and we have this conversation, it's great. 
But when we publish something like that, it, people don't even look at it. <laughs> they just they just get through it and say. So it's a lot more like a something that we do face to face in the events and talk to people. We go to the local libraries and talk to the, them. But uh, as publishing, uh, people don't pay that much attention. So how do we transform this type of coverage uh, uh, into something that? Okay, how do we transform that into a larger conversation, even in a small state like Rhode Island, for example, or even in a metro area, for example, Boston or New York, something like that? Say, okay, let's talk about this. I think that's a fascinating question, Simon. You you could speak to this. Better. I mean, so, so uh, it's kind of like uh, going back to your original question: How do we bring these processes actually work to public? Like, how do we bring them into action? organizing it's all organizing which is unfortunately always the answer um can you explain you know, that define that yeah sure sure yeah. sure so um so for example um the the community info co-op started as info districts very brief background info districts we have a vision for um a special service district like your business improvement district maybe similar to your school district, an elected board that funds local news and information projects through a dedicated tax, like a public utility. Um, and in 2020, we launched the Bloomfield Info Project, now called the Jersey B, to take this idea from zero to sort of 100. And when we got started, we got started in one municipality, one city. Um, and by organizing, what we mean is gathering with people, understanding our collective experience, learning about the functions and tools of government and community and how we can leverage our networks to build power together create create narratives together address people's needs together and then we take that and then we that underlies our reporting so all of our listening informs the reporting we're doing so we want to create this generative experience for the people committed who are participating in our community we talk to them we create this content that's useful for them not just like an exemplification of like here we had this conversation it's lovely but here is the thing that you, they can then use to take the next step which is to hold government accountable to hold workplaces accountable to hold other institutions accountable what we realized is that we can't do that in one city um the municipalities are drawn in such a way to discourage organizing, to discourage political movements and unity among Black, Latino, um, you know, working class people and like the other communities that are like also working class communities, but have been traditionally taught that white supremacy is sort of like the go-to thing. So I think that there's like these really big, you know, I would to, to say that there's these really big systemic structural challenges that would prevent, that pr are actively preventing the solutions from taking hold, I guess, is the final thing I'd say about this and why this democracy reporting is so important, because there are trends again there are, that we talk about democratic trends, but there are also anti democratic trends and they are all over. So I think that identifying ways to break down those anti democratic trends to create space for democracy, whether that's through housing, food, uh, journalism, production, media production, etc. Um, is the key, Bernardo. Does that help? I hope that's some in some way useful. Woody, you're up. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I um, I guess um, yeah. I guess with a question that's more relevant to the, the meta coverage. Um, I guess. Uh, yeah, it, it's related to thinking about the impact of, especially even like left leaning democracy coverage because sometimes I don't know my own take is sometimes it seems like it um just gets their readers into a doom spiral of like okay you know everything's going to hell the Supreme Court's doing this that you know that like the, this rule's really unfair and like you know and it just kind of leaves them hopeless there's not as much like um uh there seems to be some norm among even left-leaning journalists of like having action items at the bottom um, of what people can do about X. Um, and um, and then also, I guess, like there's, um, uh, I don't know, I kind of feel like they're not thinking more concretely about, okay, where can I most um, undo a bad policy distortion? So, I mean, I think, for example, right now, because of a party switch, 
Um, I mean, you know, gerrymandering, okay, they got um, Republicans in North Carolina, you know, very close to a, a veto-proof majority, and then one party switched got them to that point. Um, and, you know, I think one thing that would be very pro-democracy in coverage would be, you know, going over the, you know, personal lives and records of all the Republican politicians with a fine tooth comb. And if there happens to be a scandal that forces a resignation and like undoes an unjustly, you know, gerrymandered majority's power, then I consider that to be pro-democracy coverage of sorts. And um, especially if, if, if you're not trying to be so objective, I feel like you should have uh, some of that intent. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about, yeah, wh what you've seen in your coverage about the, idea, the thoughts on having action items and also what you've seen about the thoughts of, of doing this, and also even, even like in polling certain like nonpartisan races where there's, there could be some bad strategic voting going on, but at least like you can give people the power to strategically vote if you like commission that kind of polling to, to, you know, empower people in that way. Um, that's another kind of thought that can, again, undo a distortion and maybe prevent someone that nobody wants, you know, uh, from getting elected. I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head when you're saying, um, if you don't want to be so objective, right? It's, uh, you know, I, I don't think this explicitly answers your question, because I think a lot of newsrooms are still at that point, right? The the majority, I would say, of newsrooms are still saying the the theory to change the theory of change is like we do a story and like we don't have an opinion about that. Like it's it's not for any one side or the other. It's not pro-democracy, it's not anti-democracy. It's we're just gonna do the story and it's gonna result in some positive good. And there's a lack of development in that thinking, right? Which I think I as you know, and you just presented. Um, and so I think the biggest problem is converting those newsrooms to a values-based approach to even get them to your line of thinking, um, to even get them to the place where they say, I value democracy. And so we need to do these things in order to preserve democracy in our community and expand democracy in our community. And that's a really hard sell right now uh, for a lot of people especially at like entrenched legacy papers where money and power are intertwined in DC and New York. One, one thing briefly I'd say is that, you know, journalistic impact is sort of predicated on the, on cycles of destruction. Like you expose wrongdoings and you win an award, you like take down corrupt, corrupt official, like you described, you like, you get some page views, but then ultimately like the actual underlying issue doesn't get fixed and journalism can continue to maintain it's sort of like, hey, we're exposing wrongs, we're exposing wrongdoing without any genuine interest in fixing the core thing because they actually require that core inequality to sustain their current existence, which is predominantly corporate commercial media. Jane has a question, but I just, can you just say that word? Journalism is predicated on cycle. What was that? Because I, I need to click. Journalism that. is predicated on cycles of destruction. I love that. Leave it to Simon to drop bangers like that casually. Um, Jane Elizabeth has a question. Jane, do you want to just ask it or do you want me to read it? Okay. Jane just got into the car, so she. she oh, okay. I, I can read it. So she says several news orgs have launched democracy teams or hired a democracy reporter. Uh, what do you do if you find your audience isn't reading, watching, or listening to this content? I think this sort of ties into the, one of the previous questions as well. Like, what do we do if it, if if we're doing our usual output and it's just not hitting? What are some ways that you can uh, you know find innovative ways to deliver this information outside of your traditional publication style? I mean, the, the structure of traditional journalism isn't very communicative, right? Like it isn't about being in community or organizing with your community. And so I think Simon spoke to this very well earlier, when you're just putting out traditional web or print stories and nobody's engaging with it. I think that's for a reason, right? I think you need to shake up how you're actually engaging with your audience in the community. I think you need to meet people where they are. And I think you really need to ask them, like, what don't you understand? What is it you want? Because it might not be like, how do I engage on this voting question? It might be something like, and this is true to my work at LA Public Press, it might be like, how do I deal with my landlord if he won't fix things? Like what institutions do I need to go to and who do I need to seek out in the county, in the city to interact with my landlord and like make sure that things are fixed and that the pipes aren't leaking? Um, so I think it's, you know, I think there's obvious like eat your vegetables content and like making sure that people are aware of certain things. And I think you can put out those certain things, but I think it's figuring out, you know, where are the needs so that people can live their lives in a better and more dignified way. 
Um, I, I think that uh, Michelle mentions solutions journalism in the chat, 100%, the solutions perspective of like, here's something that's actually working and that you could do yourself because someone else in a similar community did it. Um, um, that's definitely a, an approach. Um, and then I would say it, the, it, an info needs approach where you're like actually, again, understanding what people want to know about this thing and then delivering them news that they could use. We don't, for example, don't share a lot of legislative happenings in the state of New Jersey because generally people have no influence in politics. So for them to be scared or worried about this other bill that's coming up just for the sake of them opening our newsletter doesn't sound like a really good relationship for us to have with people. So we specifically don't include political news, legislative news, democracy news, that's not necessarily going to be useful in their day to day lives. That's a particular like local approach, but utility plays an important role in why people are not or are or, or not, are not engaging in your content. Uh, getting some some mm -hmm's and some yes in the uh, in the chat there, uh, especially Michelle says folks that uh, folks have needs that journalism doesn't traditionally address to Gabe's point. Um, there was another question up top here uh, from Sierra. Uh, I like the point Woody made about action items, and I'm wondering how you at the objective are seeing nonprofit or hyperlocal news orgs spark civic actions in their communities through democracy reporting. Any cool stories you can share with us? Hmm. Good question. That's think, a tough one. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of like what folks have been working on lately. I think a lot of our stories lately have been very much focused on like union power um looking at unions and so i'd like to see more community stories i think they're going to come out in the coming months it's perhaps a good time to pitch that we're looking to expand this project and do it again next year and so if you want to see coverage like that happy to look into it in the coming months okay bernardo go ahead uh, you're good you're uh, on mute. yeah you're good <laughs> I was just as the sign uh, showed up in my in front of me here. A uh, couple of things here. One is uh, almost kind of a theoretical question because we are nowhere near <laughs> that point. Uh, uh, but uh, a lot of the work that I think people in this group here does, uh, it's almost like we are aiming at something that's going to cost our jobs later because uh, we are trying to fix the problem. And then we, if we do it, we don't have to do this job anymore. <laughs> uh, we we can do something else. But uh, again, this is really, really far away. Um, there's plenty of job problems uh, to be fixed uh, uh, before we get to that. But uh, I really like this connection with the needs of the community. Actually, what I see is that those needs should come first. And I think a lot of what we talk about democracy, sometimes we forget that democracy is not just the institution. Democracy is actually the people. Democracy is actually understanding what the needs of the people are and how are they being coming uh, to play in the political realm. And many times I think we don't do a, the best job in bringing those needs to the conversation. We may bring some needs of some people to the conversation, but we don't bring, especially the people who need us the most. Um, how would you approach that? Because we've been trying to do that. And, uh, and I know that's uh, one of the answers. Uh, I think Simon's already going to say it is organize. <laughs> you have to find ways to get that uh, you know, organized in some way. But mainly, uh, I think one of the problems that we do have is that uh, uh, journalists are, uh, journalism or organizations are designed to think about audiences, designed to think about the people who pay us for the news or to support us for the news that we provide. And the people that I try to uh, work with are the people who will never, ever be able to afford the news. So how do we bring the needs of those people to the center? That's kind of my question. You want to take a game? Should I give it a swing? Yeah, why don't you give it a swing? I have that. I mean, we have that same challenge, right? As a local news organization, primarily serving a community that's majority people of color, majority like a significant plurality, low-income working class folks. 
and it's never like I'm never gonna win. I'm never gonna win. There's no, there's no win. There's never gonna be the right amount of people in the room, the right people in the room. It's like you said, like you see, you call democracy. You know, the people I call, I think of it as a process. I'm never gonna get away from it. I'm always gonna want more people in the room, different people in the room, so that I can understand the general needs of people and then begin to deliver them things that are useful to them. Um, so I think that really redefining what we think of news and information, what we think of service, Bernardo, like if you are talking to those people, but they're not reading your news, you're still reaching those people, right? If you're just because they're not reading your newsletter, but you're talking to them day to day or like week to week, month to month, that's a service that is an engagement. Um, but then I would say that the whole, honestly, the whole, this is where we're going to veer off on community info co-op land where uh, the the issue is public funding we need public funding of public services in this in the united states broadly defined public services including local news and information um so people can have access to democracy civic participation and action um so i think that that that's really the way we get this industry there um we get the people in this industry there the jobs will never go away there's plenty of work to be done there's just no one who seems to be willing to pay for it so we need to redistribute the cost and the workload amongst people um so that we can all enroll ourselves in this process of democratizing more of the U.S. an active democratic democrat democratization role is critical for the media to take at this time Gabe do you want to finish this out and add to that or uh should we wrap? I think let's wrap. I think I think Simon's the the one you need to talk to on this. Uh, I I would agree. Uh, uh, as his neighbor and friend, uh, I do that a lot. I, I call him up. Um, Bernardo, I, I will just note that Bernardo set up in the chat that he is going to be trying to implement an info districts model uh, iteration in Rhode Island. So stay tuned. He will be in contact. I uh, just want to thank both of you. This I was not gonna lie. I was a little nervous when the slides ended at like 18 minutes in. And I was like, I have four questions prepped. So hopefully we get some engagement. Uh, thank you all to you in the chat uh, and the other attendees. Um, this is fantastic. Everything from the quotes, the quotables to the actual substance was really powerful. And uh, I really appreciate it. And I look forward to uh, our next Democracy Day webinar. Uh, that's gonna be on July 10th. Uh, that is with Trusting News. It's about demystifying your politics and government coverage, particularly your democracy coverage. I will drop a link to that in the chat. Um, please, uh, please register for that. For those of you who registered for today's uh, webinar, again, I will just remind you, you will be getting a recording of that, as well as any links and resources uh, uh, that were shared in the chat, um, and there were many. Um, so I really do appreciate everybody. Thank you so much for, for, uh, for showing up and coming out for this. Um, and know um, where somebody is on sort of the playing field of facts and what's reasonable and what's not. And how do we decide that without blowing off people without while still providing on ramps to facts. So who is so lost in the world of um, conspiracy theories and hate that they're not reachable and who maybe is, is hearing a lot of things that are very confusing and sound compelling to them, but it's still reachable if we give them a way into the content um, into the, the facts. So I think that my threshold in terms of when to respond varies greatly depending on the platform. I have a high threshold in terms of response when it's private. So you have no obligation to respond, especially more than once, to angry people in your voicemail or your inbox, right? Delete. 
Um, and I also think that it's important in public facing communications to have really solid policies. So man, I hope that if you're moderating comments, you have a policy that empowers you to ban people, just ban them like outright without any response if needed. Or, um, you know, if it's a little bit hard to tell and you want to give them the benefit of the doubt, you go back and forth once, man, get rid of them, delete comments and ban if not. What I try to recognize with public facing comments is if somebody is not outright violating our policy, and they're asking a question that other people might have in mind more generously, choose the generous way to respond. Okay, so uh, continue our election theme next up. We have our largest panel of the summit, um, but that's appropriate because they're representing Philly. Every voice, every vote on Philadelphia, please come on up to the stage, Sean Mooring, um, Ali Vanier, Angelique Hinton, and Ashanti Martin. We'll have to reorganize chairs a little bit here, so I might need some help with that. All right, Greg, well, thank you so much, and I'm glad to be here. My name is Sean Mooring. I'm the head of Philadelphia programs at the Lenfest Institute for Journalism. Um, and just really excited to have an opportunity to talk to you a little bit about our Every Voice, Every Vote initiative, um, which is a citywide uh, movement of uh, media and community partners uh, that came together to really help us to look at how we inform um, and catalyze civic engagement ahead of our 2023 municipal um, election, which will uh, in November allow us to elect our uh, 100th mayor. Um, so again, my name is Sean Mooring, my colleague Ali Vanier, who is our program manager, um, and also uh, <laughs> slide <laughs> advancer extraordinaire, uh, as well as Ashanti Martin with WURD Radio uh, in Philadelphia, and Angelique Hilton, uh, Hinton, I'm sorry, who are both community media and community partners, uh, one of, of the 80 uh, plus partners that are a part of Every Voice, Every Vote. Um, and so why this initiative, why now? As I said, this is one of the, a pivotal election um, in Philadelphia as we prepare to elect our 100th mayor. And it was also one of the most highly contested elections um, in recent history in, in Philadelphia where we had um, 12 candidates total, probably about six viable candidates uh, throughout this process. Um, and it, we wanted to really make sure that through this effort we were um, providing tools and opportunities for our community partners uh, and, and for the citizens of Philadelphia to focus on the issues and lift up and make sure that we're putting the voice of our residents and the issues that are most pertinent to our communities first um, as we move forward in this effort. And so as we thought about uh, what it took to, to do this and really bring this this focus together around every voice, every vote, we wanted to ensure that the notion of democracy um, and was what was resonating with all of the participants as well as, as you know the, the city um, as we looked at this effort. And so we really worked together to ensure that as we looked at it, how do we strengthen the voice um, of the sit of of the community and lift up those issues that are most pertinent to them and not focus on the horse race uh, that had been kind of the tradition in, in terms of political reporting. And so I'm going to give a high level overview um, and, and Ali will walk through uh, in a little bit more detail kind of the, the structure of the Every Voice, Every Vote initiative, which focused on both initially around our research and community listening and engagement where we commissioned uh, a public opinion poll and shared that with all of our media partners as well as journalistic partners um, to move the, the efforts forward. And of course, this is very small and I can't see. <laughs> um, but then, you know, when it, spoke to high impact journalism that was not only the 
articles and pieces that were produced, but also making sure that we were providing uh, news and information uh, through voter guides and, and things of that that were produced both by our partners as well as um, some of our, our community, our media partners as well as our community partners. Um, and then in terms of our engagement and community listening, I'm sorry, our unified messaging, uh, we not only had our branding around every voice, every vote, but also engaged social media partners that would, you know, highlight and lift up what's happening, both whether it be articles, uh, promoting the debates that are happening, as well as lifting up the, the research and helping people to engage around uh, the data and polling information that we provided. And then, of course, community engagement and civic engagement through um, the number, high number of debates uh, and community forums that we held uh, throughout that, that process as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Alan. Yeah, and we'll talk more about all those bubbles. Um, so first, um, a bit about the management of this project. So um, the Every Voice, Every Vote is a, a project of the Lenfest Institute for Journalism. Um, our mission is to support local journalism through a focus on diversified revenue streams, digital products, and equity and representation. And supporting Philadelphia's news media ecosystem is core to our work, and we see Every Voice, Every Vote as an extension of that portfolio, which Sean leads. Um, but it's also important to understand what our, our role is and is not in this project. We are not a newsroom. Um, instead, we used our, or leveraged our role within the ecosystem to cast a wide net and um, convene media partners and community organizations, find creative collaborations, um, coordinate a citywide messaging campaign, and also serve as a project manager and kind of switchboard operator of, of this multifaceted project. Um, we did provide some financial support ourselves to this uh, initiative, but our main funder was the William Penn Foundation, which is a family-run foundation in Philadelphia that supports the city's civic life. Notably, they are not primarily a journalism funder. Um, we did also receive support from journalism funders like the Knight Lenfest Fund, the Knight Foundation in Philadelphia, Comcast, and various individual donors as well. So at the heart of this initiative is our partners, which we'll hear from two of them a little bit later. Um, it is a, EVEV EV is a collaborative journalism initiative, but we knew from the very beginning that only engaging media partners uh, wouldn't be enough to truly deeply engage all of Philadelphia's diverse communities. So we put out an open call for proposals um, from media organizations of all types and community-centered nonprofit organizations in Philadelphia um, to submit proposals for election-related activi activities. So um, we had a specific focus that you see here on a, a few key areas, but we really left it wide open to them to surface up their ideas. So that included um, solutions journalism, focused on the key issues that matter to Philadelphians, service journalism around local government, um, and electoral processes, um, translation and multilingual, my, multilingual products, excuse me, um, public forums, a lot of public forums and community events um, that engage both communities and candidates in a dialogue, um, as well as elections project products such as texting services and voter guides um, and nonpartisan civics education activities. So ultimately, we distributed just over $1.5 million through 63 grants to 26 media organizations and 36 community, 37 community organizations. Those partners collectively either produced or will produce, because we're in the middle of, of this right now, um, more than 70 forums and community events and 20 voter guides. So some of those served specific communities like immigrants and returning citizens. Some of them um, served specific neighborhoods and others focused on certain um, topic areas such as education and climate. Those projects will ultimately reach every single neighborhood in Philadelphia engage uh, the top 13 most spoken languages in the region, and just serve Philadelphia's diverse racial, ethnic, and affinity groups. 
So this is small, but this is our full list of media partners. And as you can see here, there's a, a really wide range, um, some of which have spoken uh, earlier today or will speak later today. Um, they include large organizations like WHYY and the Philadelphia Inquirer, as well as ethnic media outlets like Fun Times Magazine and New Mainstream Press, neighborhood-specific outlets like the Kensington Voice, um, and we also engage all uh, four of the major broadcast partners, 6ABC, Fox 29, CBS 3, and NBC 10. And here's our community partners, of which are even smaller, um, but they similarly reflect the diversity of Philadelphia. So they include CDCs and neighborhood associations, um, organizations that serve vulnerable populations like Project Home, uh, citywide organizations that tackle major issues such as gun violence, and anchor institutions like the Committee of 70 that produce nonpartisan voter education materials. So I am now pleased to hand it over to one of our community partners. Um, Angelique's going to tell us about PA Youth Vote. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Angelique Hinton. I am the executive director of one of the community partners, PA Youth Vote. Um, I have the privilege of working with young people um, in Pennsylvania, but for this project specifically in Philadelphia. Um, and what we do is work every day to make sure that they are civically engaged. I don't know how much you, know, you really um, understand what's going on as far as schools are concerned, but there's a lot of inequity when it comes to school funding. And as a result of that, many schools schools, um, like the ones we focus on, which are in BIPOC, underfunded school districts, um, are not getting civics, right? And so we often hear in the media, youth are apathetic or youth don't turn out, but the reality is they're not really being taught um, how government works um, and why they should be participating, how it is relevant to their day-to-day -day lives. And so we do that work every day. We work with young people to make sure they're civically engaged, um, they're voting, have resources, um, and they also understand how to use their voices constructively to hold leaders accountable accountable um, and to advocate for changes they want to see. And so I was thrilled that we were um, able to participate in this project because we are a very grassroots organization, a smaller um, nonprofit. Um, and so I believe collaboration is going to save this nation. And so being able to participate gave us an opportunity to really reach more young people than we could on our own. And so we do a lot of collaborative work, um, you know, just all the time but this expanded our ability. And so through this partnership, we were able to do multiple um, great events, um, create more resources than we ordinarily could. Um, and so I have some examples that I'll just kind of run through um, because I think, you know, sometimes kind of understanding how all of this actually, you know, plays out um, is, is really important. And so as far as resources were concerned, through this funding and through this partnership, we were able to create what we call youth voter toolkits, which provide all of the information. We focus really hyper-local, right? And so who's on the ballot, how those offices impact your life on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Then we provide resources on a nonpartisan basis on where you can find information on candidates, right? Um, also, how you can apply for a mail-in ballot, right? All of those types of things. And so we partner with many organizations to do that, such as, you know, every vote, every, every vote Voice Every Vote, um, we partnered with League of Women Voters, like civic organizations, other, um, the commissioner's office in Philadelphia. So really pulling together a bunch of people that are really interested in make sure, making sure that young people are educated and informed and have the tools they need to vote. And so um, our, our toolkit um, was about nine different partners that are part of the collaborative that came together to create this toolkit that we could then go in and in addition to the ones that contributed to it, we then took that toolkit and trained other organizations on what was on the ballot, right? So, you know, organizations that were going to do canvas launches, right, when it was time to try to get out the vote. And so it really allowed us to expand, again, the number of people that were getting information about who's on the ballot, how they apply to you know, their day-to-day -day lived experience, and where to get resources and information um, to actually vote. Um, another thing is we created a curriculum, again, um, a collaborative project um, that we were able to do pulling together with uh, 
Committee of 70, League of Women Voters, pulling together resources really that allowed us to expand. Um, you know, a lot of times smaller nonprofits like ours don't have the budget to have a lot of staff. So being able to work with other people is really critical. Um, and then as far as you heard a lot about candidate forums, so I just want to speak specifically to one, which was um, a one I'm very proud of. It was called the Philly Youth Listening Session. And so we kind of flipped the script on the candidates, right? And what, what it was, was we had young people um, that, you know, through this, again, funding and this opportunity, we were able to pay to learn again about voting and theory of change. They gave up Fridays, Saturdays, um, their spring break, and they learned. And then ultimately, we put on a listening session where candidates were brought in. We had 20 student facilitators. Um, in partnering with many other youth organizations, we were able to really be intentional about getting to those schools that are in the communities that are most underserved in Philadelphia, right? And so those are oftentimes people who are not hearing a lot of this information and are not voting, in all honesty, because they really don't understand how it's impacting them. They've never really seen government work for them, and so they're not all the time interested in participating, and it's just because they don't have the education. So we were able to reach more students that we typically would have had a harder time reaching, um, and through that we had I think in total 15 partners that ultimately partnered on this event. Um, we were able to engage 110 students, which include 20 student facilitators. Um, and then we had 29 candidates actually show up. They had to listen to students um, talk about issues that were really impacting them. Um, and then ultimately, at the end of the day, they were given an opportunity to speak to what they learned and how that would inform their policy making decisions, as opposed to just showing up and speaking at young people, so um, I, I am extremely grateful for this opportunity um, because again, we were able to partner with so many great organizations. Another one was um, we have a Philadelphia Kids Campaign, which is 80 different uh, organizations that have come together to make sure that we are lifting up voices of those who have you know, historically been um, without a voice, right, and really giving them an opportunity to hear directly from candidates, but also to, you know, lift up issues that are impactful for them. So this has been a great opportunity, and I'm, I'm extremely grateful, and I would say, you know, wherever you are, the work that you're doing, really finding ways to collaborate, right, is going to really be the best way to expand, you know, the reach and expand the electorate to those that have, you know, typically we haven't been meeting where they are. This gives you a great opportunity um, to do that, and so I'm extremely thankful for what we've been able to accomplish together. Thank you. Oh, there's another, oh, I'm sorry. The media, I think I spoke to like the media, right? Like one thing I will say I'll add to that is we, you, uh, the media is asking a lot more questions and engaging youth a lot more, right? Again, I think it was historically there was this, you know, miss, you know, like misinformation that youth don't care. When you engage them and you educate them, they care a lot and they're very action oriented. Um, and so we have seen a lot of media reaching out to our organization to speak directly to the youth. What I'm interested in in this next chapter is really how we can expand and have the youth actually contribute to the media more, mm -hmm. right? How can we, through podcasting, um, through maybe even having like a local radio show where they're discussing issues that really are impactful to them, that will then expand our reach to more youth and get them to, again, participate more in this process. Um, I know we hear all the time, democracy is at risk. It is. Um, but we have to really think about how we're engaging and really expanding you know, who we're talking to um, if we really want to get more people to participate. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. Thank you, Angelique. Um, hi, my name is Ashanti Martin. I am the general manager of WRD Radio in Philadelphia. We are the um, only uh, the only independently black-owned black talk 
media radio station in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and one of only four in the nation. Uh, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. And um, one important thing to know about us is that uh, WRD is very much um, actively, we actively encourage our listeners and our audience to vote. So we're, that is one area that we are biased. We are biased toward voter participation. And in fact, uh, we believe that we played an important role in voter turnout in 2020, which as you may know, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania was very much a hotbed um, of election uh, activity and so so that just that's some context for WRD and our participation in this initiative um, we we've lost the slides oh man put so much work into them but fortunately yes <laughs> I've got my notes um, old school too uh, so we have um, you know, as part of Every Voice, Every Vote, as a broadcast media company, we partnered with many organizing partners uh, in more than 10 mayoral candidate forums. So these topics ranged from uh, the environment, arts and culture, and of course, issues that are important to Philadelphia's black community. Uh, we worked with many of the media part, media and community. Oh, thank you. Thank goodness. All right. Um, so yes, we are independently owned. Uh, we are. We have a very highly engaged audience, and our audience uh, places a lot of trust in us. Uh, they really, in, in a lot of ways, our audience um, feels like word belongs to them, uh, which is which is terrific. So. Yes, as a result of the Every Voice, Every Vote initiative, we have experienced an unprecedented level of collaboration with media and community groups across Philadelphia. I'm in my first year as general manager here at WRD, and what I can say is that this collaboration really kind of catapulted my ability to get to know other media organizations and other community partners in the city. So I really feel like it put on turbocharge a, a key uh, mission of my role at WRD, which is to form partnerships. Uh, so yes, we did, you can skip to the next slide, thank you. Uh, we collaborated in a, at about 10 forums, and this is only in the primary season, so this is going from uh, election day of 2022 up till May 16th, which is the date, which was the date of our primary. We collaborated with, uh, as you can see, nine uh, partners in the Every Voice, Every Vote Coalition. You can skip forward, thank you. As well as uh, you know, the activities, uh, it really created, what I can say about Every Voice, Every Vote is that uh, it created very much a sort of buzz around Philadelphia. I think that uh, with all of the activity, uh, having being new to Philadelphia, this being my first time covering Philadelphia elections as a journalist, my sense was that there had never really been this many opportunities for the public to go out and hear from the candidates and also before and after really talk to the candidates one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. I really do feel like it brought a, it humanized the candidates in a way that coverage, uh, you know, is really limited in doing. So it not only did it expose us to a, a world of partners as part of Every Voice, Every Vote, but it attracted visibility from other organizations who also wanted to capitalize on this momentum. Skip. Thank you. Um, and really what I, what excited me a lot about this initiative, because as, in addition to working as a journalist, I've worked in marketing, uh, was the Every Voice, Every Vote, uh, really having a strong branding uh, component. I think just calling it Every Voice, Every Vote, you know, and not saying that this is an initiative of, of the Lenvest Institute, uh, really made it its own concept and, and gave it a, a different place in the city's imagination. It also helped us be able to brand our campaign coverage in a way that I don't think we would have been able to otherwise. And I, as a result, I think it gave us a higher visibility and more opportunities to say, oh, you know what, this, this 
coverage that we usually do, this is this is very relevant and let's use leverage what Every Voice, Every Vote has given us in its branding toolkit, which was very strong and very easy to use. So uh, these on the slide are some of the graphics that we created, but very much inspired by Every Voice, Every Vote. So not only did we broadcast many forums, but we also um, you know, created compiled interviews and had special interview series on Word, and it all fell nicely under the Every Voice, Every Vote umbrella. So those were big advantages. Thanks, Thank Ashanti. You. We're running low on time, so I'm gonna breeze through a bit. If you wanna talk about research more in depth, I can talk about it for hours, so just find me find me after. But um, in addition to our partnerships, the Republican we debate also last engaged night. There were in um, a comprehensive public opinion research project as part of this initiative, with f starting with focus groups and then a citywide public opinion poll. Um, the core thing that came out of that was identifying the top issues that matter to Philadelphians. And then that was used by our media organizations on a slew of reporting. Um, so there's a, a couple of things here, but the Inquirer anchored seven different pieces um, in this research, including interviews with the focus groups, um, the focus group participants, and data, data visualization. Um, Aldea, which is a Spanish language outlet focused specifically on uh, Hispanic and black Philadelphians, and Fox 29 actually um, used the data to frame the only broadcasted mayoral debate in the primary race as well. And the final component here before I pass it back to Sean is, is that citywide messaging aspect that um, Ashanti just spoke about. Um, we ran a citywide PSA campaign on um, public transportation, um, on air through our various media partners and in print and digital outlets as well. And we activated a network of 59 social media creators um, who spoke directly with their audiences. They published polls that mirrored the public opinion survey. They encouraged people to go events, they share their personal motivations for voting. Collectively, all of those social posts reached over 740,000 Philadelphians of voting age, which is 60% of the potential voters in the city. Yeah, and believe it or not, we're only halfway through our project. <laughs> um, as, as we've now gotten through the primary, uh, and with Philadelphia being a predominantly democratic city, we, you know, often what happens as we go to the general is that we just get, people don't feel as though they need to show up because it's already over. Um, but we ha will continue in our efforts um, to hold forums, to focus on solutions, and really engage people around, um, you know, what comes up and why it's important to continue to show up um, and, and engage civically will also be we are in the process of planning for a civic engagement and accountability initiative that will follow um, in, as, as that, uh, that will be ongoing, um, not just you know kind of an election cycle initiative. Um, and some of the key takeaways um, at, at this point, one is just around infrastructure and the way in which we were able to really catalyze um, the involvement um, and engagement in collaboration among our partners, um, having centering the community voice um, and making sure that we were not following the notion of, of kind of the horse race, but really, and, and also in ensuring that it's nonpartisan um, and that we're really focusing on the issues and, and solutions. But we've only got about two minutes left, <laughs> and so I do wanna make sure that we leave a little bit of room for questions if there are any um, in the audience. Uh, I have a question about convening and agenda construction and how you all logistically manage the whole apparatus and making sure that people are part of the collaboration had voice input engagement. So one of the things that was very unique about 
the role that LenFest played is that we were very much um, the catalysts and coordinators, right? And so we did not, um, the forums were put together by our partners. Um, we did have the uh, benefit of having some folks like Committee of 70 who were very seasoned um, in some of those efforts that we did because we held monthly meetings, which had about 60 to 80 people, you know, in every meeting, we were able to kind of convene folks to put forms together and share best practices, what worked, what didn't work, um, and, and and so in that in that regard, and in how to best engage. But our role was really focused on coordination. We had consultants that were a, a community engagement consultant as well as an editorial uh, consultant that helped to, you know, be a support. Um, um, for our partners, but really left and made sure that we pushed the the actual work of the convenings and things like and the information sessions to to our partners. We were also really intentional not to create forced collaborations amongst our partners, so creating the space for them to naturally partner with each other, some of which did more of that than others, and that was okay with us. Hi, um, I have a quick question for you guys. Um, <clears throat> what are like the the big, I guess, the important lessons for other other cities that might be inspired by this and want to um, try to emulate some of your successes? Yeah, thanks for the question. We um, and we have had lots of interest um, in the structure that we did with Every Voice, Every Vote. And I think one of the, the key things is having that strong um, management structure where we were able to put an infrastructure together in terms of an aggregate site um, for folks to republish um, their information, the grounding in research and focus on solutions, nonpartisan um, you know, emphasis uh, in, in the work um, as well. And we're continuing to learn. Um, but the kind of key things that, that we took away were, were one, kind of establishing that infrastructure uh, for, for collaboration that helped to spur collaboration and being really, um, you know, focused on, on the nonpartisanship and focusing on solutions. Yeah, and I, I'll add too, I think it was for the partner side, it was super helpful to have that infrastructure, right? And we could look to that to see kind of what other organizations were doing so we could partner where we felt like it made sense, but also having the autonomy to kind of really focus like on engaging your community and meeting them where they were. Um, so not having that force like you're going to work together, but having the support when you do was critically important to a lot of these organizations that are doing grassroots work in the community and just don't have the resources to create that sort of infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> and hopefully that your work gets replicated other places, replicated or emulated other places because you've been doing amazing stuff. So thank you. Democracy in crisis often thrives in darkness. Democracy Day turns on the light. 
On September 15th, news organizations across the United States will come together to sound the alarm about threats facing our democracy and our democratic institutions and empower residents with the information they need to help defend it. Democracy Day is nonpartisan. This isn't about Republicans or Democrats. It's about protecting our democratic values and institutions. These principles are increasingly under attack by misinformation, partisan divides, and direct efforts to undermine our elections. Democracy Day is bringing journalists and newsrooms together for one of the largest collaborative journalism efforts ever undertaken in the United States. Hundreds of radio, TV, print, and digital news outlets will report together on how democracy is backsliding and what's at stake if we don't act. We'll investigate threats, explain how political indifference and hyperpartisanship enable their growth, and highlight communities and organizations that are pursuing real solutions. Democracy Day's true power comes from citizens arming and equipping themselves with facts, information, and raising their voices. That is why Democracy Day matters. It represents what we can achieve when we come together through a shared commitment to truth, justice, and an open democratic system of government. But ultimately, our success depends on you. So visit usdemocracyday.org to read and share the journalism, spread reliable information, and take action. And if you're a newsroom, you can sign up to become a reporting partner. So, will you join us in standing up for democracy on September 15th? We hope so, because we believe that together we can accomplish more than we can alone. Hello, today is the International Day of Democracy, and U.S. Democracy Day is an independent initiative created in 2022 by a team of journalists across nonprofit media. They asked newsrooms and civic organizations to highlight how democracy functions, from its current challenges to its inefficiencies and who is working to improve them. This year, they've expanded to create a college-level journalism curriculum that is infused with civic lessons, fund reporting positions on the intersection of democracy and media, and they're even hosting webinars that push the industry forward. So go to usdemocracyday.org, you can find that link in my bio, or just type it in. And here you'll find a ton of information from partner newsrooms like the Associated Press, The Guardian, The McClatchy, The State Newsroom Networks also the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and the Texas Tribune. And they're all amplifying stories about local challenges to democracy that directly impact how people vote, interact with their government, and participate in politics. And this is a collaborative project, so feel free to jump in and use the hashtag USDemocracyDay2023. How is democracy being challenged in your local area? What solutions do you have? Who are the helpers where you are? Folks are sick of all the politics. They want to learn about democracy and how we can participate in amplifying and fortifying our democracy and civic engagement. Let's go. You know, uh, what
Hi guys, thank you all so much for being here. My name is Beatrice Foreman and I'll be your moderator for today's discussion. I am Democracy Day's project coordinator and also a reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer where I cover the creator economy, digital culture, and broadly speaking, how young people in Philly make money and community on the internet. I am also a young person myself. I am a recent college graduate and 22 years old and always wish I was so much more politically active in college alongside my writing. So this panel means a ton to me. We're gonna dive into the conversation in just a few minutes, but I wanna just to get started and set the table for us today. So obviously this panel is about young people and the 2024 elections, which is important in and of itself. But this discussion is really about how to go beyond those stock stories that we see every year that always go a little something like, I can't believe young people had such good turnout. How did that happen? And those story that's a, bastard, a bastardization, of course, of some well-intentioned reporting. But those stories happen so often because journalists, you know, for better or for worse, or for reasons outside of their control, kind of operate with this built-in belief that politics is a game for adults. Politics shouldn't be a game for anyone, but threats to democracy are especially not a game for young people because they impact us more acutely. You know, we are thrust into situations and policies are thrust upon us without a lot of care for us or, you know, ask about what if, if we would want this. I mean, like, hello, student loan debt. Um, so because of that, and because these issues affect us so much more acutely, we can be really good at direct action and organizing that works. Case in point, the Georgia Youth Justice Coalition, which is a group of college and high school students, is so good at lobbying and policy change in Georgia. Georgia. They prevented a major county from getting gerrymandered to high hell. They advocate for tons of funding for public education and actively prevent transphobic bills being passed in the state Senate. And they get tons of, of and they get a lot of coverage in the media, but it's always kind of wondrous when in reality, this stuff is happening all across the country. On Democracy Day, September 15th, uh, students in Arizona are organizing not one, but two climate justice marches. And in Philadelphia, where I'm from, young people are routinely unionizing their workplaces and calling on the, the, the city's largest university my alma mater, UPenn, to divest from fossil fuels and like make payments to fund public education in the city. So all that is to say, journalism that takes into account that young people can remain and informed and engaged without necessarily interacting with traditional news sources will, as you guess, make them more likely to interact with traditional news sources. I'm not gonna bother you with all the research that confirms what already know, young people are more disillusioned than ever with institutions of power for good reason. But as that relates to journalism, I'm going to point to some research from the Center for Information and Research on Civic Engagement and Learning at Tufts University on why Gen Z and Gen Alpha don't really trust traditional news sources. Um, a recent white paper of theirs goes into how it's because journalists don't really speak to young people or let them speak for themselves. And if we partnered with young people as co-creators of news, we would actually create more journalism that's authentic and representative and meaningful to a diversity of youth. All that to say, this discussion is about why it matters to engage with young people early and what can be gained beyond those from those conversations beyond just a laundry list of issues that matter to you know, Gen Z. So I'm excited to be joined today by a slate of speakers who empower young people from of, of all ages and stripes to tell their own stories. Um, and also a young person who isn't me who can talk about their experience um, at the nexus of student organizing and professional journalism. So now let me rattle off these speaker bios. First up is Allegra Kirkland, who is the politics director at Teen Vogue. She previously worked at Talking Points Memo as a reporter covering voting rights and extremism and as a senior editor. Lexi McMenamin is the news and politics editor at Teen Vogue. They are also a co-organizer of the Zenith Cooperative, coordinating a mentorship program for early career journalists of marginalized backgrounds. They have been published by the BBC, New York Magazine, Them.com, The New York, New Republic, and elsewhere. Dylan Bernard, Bar Bernard is a cultural strategist and advisor to purpose-driven brands and organizations who serves as an advisory board member of US Democracy Day 
He is the Director of Communications at Future Coalition, a national network for youth-led organizations and youth organizers. He created the Webby Award-winning series, Young People Address the Nation, home to the historic youth response to State of the Union. And last but not least is Mira Sadow, a senior at the University of Pennsylvania, where she runs the Disorientation Guide, a publication that educates students about systems of oppression at Penn. She has been published in the Nation, Vice, Teen Vogue, and more, and she currently works as a democracy production intern at CNN. What Mira's bio did not tell you is that she is one of the um, first reporters I ever edited at, at Penn, and she is a brilliant student organizer who has had a role in so many powerful student-driven campaigns at Penn. So she's a talented writer, but she's also a talented organizer. So with that, I'm going to uh, throw this first question to everyone. Oh, wait, rules of the road. Um, questions are welcome during this panel. If you have one, type it in the chat. And at the end of our conversation, we will get to, we will get to those questions first during our Q&A. So our first question for everybody on the panel is how did your ex organizing experience, if any, as a young person, influence your relationship with media as a consumer or a storyteller? Um, so yeah, who wants to go first? <laughs> Could have been first. Um, so I, for me, I think the deeper I get into the organizing spaces and much of my work through Future Coalition and others is really just getting to support and work with other youth organizers. And then the, the more I get into that, the clearer that it that it becomes that there are so many grassroots movements led by young Black Indigenous people of color that are just not covered in the the mainstream. Um, and for me, I think it comes down to the point that. Um, it's much more powerful to do this work when you're in community of folks you serve. So I think as we think through, as I think through the intersection between the organizing work that I've done and you know relationship as a kind of storyteller and consumer, I really think so much of this comes down to really being able to work with the communities you're in service to on the dailies. Because I think for me, every day I get to work with the communities um, that I'm in service to and working with um, and collaborating with. Um, and I think that same piece on the media end, I think there's a lot of more opportunities to do that. So for me, that's what I always take away of like, okay, when I'm in, when I've been in the media space, when I'm consuming media, I'm like, this doesn't quite match the vision um, that I'm hearing on the ground. And I think there, there, there's so much more there in terms of the story that we're telling, which just means for me, I think it means getting more embedded with the youth organizers who are doing the day-to-day -day work. It means getting beyond that initial go-to speakers um, that folks go to, it means going deeper. So I think that's really my often my, my challenge in this space. what you see in the press talking about is really important. Um, Lexi, what about you? <laughs> yeah, um, I was a very active student organizer in undergrad while I was also on the student paper, which I'm sure is a uh, frequent path for people that end up going into covering this stuff. But at the time, I... Uh, I was told I was only allowed to work on the opinion pages because I was doing organizing work and that I was too biased to do any of the news reporting for the student paper, um, which already was pretty hamstrung by like university funding and other good stuff. Um, but it was a really great crash course in like, yeah, like kind of as Dylan was speaking to like all the ways that um, things can get lost in communication or misrepresented or like um, I think I was much more familiar with the organizers perspective of like what are like the pros and cons of getting coverage of certain things and then like before I ended up doing my work as a journalist and editor which I actually found really helpful but for a long time um, I had an impression that the journalism industry saw as like a strike against me which is really interesting because I think that Part of what my journalistic strengths include is like being able to build deeper relationships with organizers and have like a accountable relationship with the issue areas I cover that doesn't feel like it's completely tied up in um I guess like um a sort of archaic 
perspective on like what objectivity is and like what we owe our readers, I guess. Yeah, I'd love to jump off what Lexi said. Um, I'm a little bit older than they are. And I feel like when I you know, got into journalism in college, the guidance was very much like you can be an organizer or you can be a journalist, but like you cannot do both at the same time. Um, and, you know, I sort of took that to heart. So I did not really come up with an organizing background. Um, and I think it's been really gratifying and like wonderful to see in the last few years, a bit of a reckoning with these concepts of objectivity, neutrality of like people, you know, journalists not supposed to ever, you know, having had an opinion on anything in the entire world and how ridiculous that is. Like all of us come to this work with our gender identity, our racial background, our organizing experience, whatever it may be. And that just, you know, informs our work and makes us better journalists. And I think being honest about like how we come to this work is is much better than pretending like we are just these like empty vessels with no opinions or experience. All right, last but not least, Mira. <laughs> Yeah, I absolutely agree with everything everyone said so far. And I also think that um, working on the disorientation guide at Penn um, has definitely opened my eyes to how many journalists who work on the student paper or who do like, you know, very empirical news reporting are also interested in issues of social activism on campus because, you know, that's what they're exposed to every single day um, at their jobs on campus. Um, and so then when there's this opportunity to contribute anonymously to an activist publication, they jump at it because that's what they've been wanting to write this whole time um, and isn't, you know, the kind of, of work that is available at the publication. Um, and I'm also glad that you mentioned in your intro the Georgia Youth Justice Coalition, because I think they've taught me a very important lesson, which is that um, storytelling is just a better organizing strategy. Um, and so I think one of the reasons why they're so successful is because they host workshops and um, they focus their impact on telling young people how to articulate their story um, through town halls and, and media and things like that. Um, and that way of organizing has actually been so much more efficient for them than um, relying solely on, you know, these statistics or these uh, financial connections, etc. So I'm often curious about the relationship between press coverage and the success of movements. I took a ton of classes on it in college on the Occupy Wall Street movement, on, you know, organizing around like training organizing around the Rwandan genocide and how just unsavory press coverage made it impossible for organizers to really do much. Mm -hmm. So my question for Mira and Dylan is when you're acting in the role of the organizer, how have your interactions with the press kind of empowered or harmed the movements you belong to? Um, I'm going to have Mira do this first if you're if you're ready. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I think the toughest one for youth organizing is like um, when you feel like a journalist needs to like almost meet a quota in their article for like talking to a youth source about um, a given issue. So I think that's happened a lot where um, my friends have been like, hey, you know, I got interviewed for this piece and it just got published and they used like one of my quotes and it just kind of feels like uh, based on the conversation we had uh, that they just needed someone to weigh in for the youth perspective and include that in a paragraph. Um, and I think that that's probably the largest pattern that I've seen um, over the course of occupying both of these roles. Um, and I think that, you know, obviously everyone here recognizes that youth deserve their own story and not just, you know, a footnote um, at the end of another. And that, um, you know, when you're speaking to someone, if it's, um, you know, a youth organizer that's being incorporated into a large article about a movement, how to have a conversation with them about being able to, you know, highlight and, and give them a platform as well um instead of you know just um including them in 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 a in a larger group of voices um where they may want us to you know to stand out dylan your turn <laughs> yes um and i think yeah so much of my work has been at the interse intersection of the youth vote and climate justice as kind of my two buckets of work that i kind of rotate in between um, and particularly as I think through the intersection, I my big thing as I think about press is is ensuring that there I'm not contributing as an organizer as somebody who also supports other organizers and telling their narrative to ensure that I'm not uh, really supporting that narrative or like there being one face of the climate justice movement or around the youth vote. 
Um, so that's been my biggest thing is this moment requires us to center the lethal fullness of our movements. Um, and I often find that there's it's a little bit of a tussle sometimes to get uh, reporters to really feature the, the wide array of voices. You know, I, again, I get to work with organizers who are doing this work on the day on the daily. They're in this grind. They're drill so there's a lot of opportunities to drill deeper. But I often get requests to like, let's talk. Can I talk to this specific person? And most times I'm like, yes. And there's actually several more folks I have in mind. So I think that's the biggest challenge that I've been really nailing down is ensuring that um, there is some sort of intentional pushback to ensure that we're expanding who gets um, the amplification and that like, gets that spotlight. I have to say when I'm doing reporting and a and like a liaison for a movement organizing group tells me, yes, you can speak to this person and these other people, I'm always really grateful for it because something you're supposed to ask with a reporter is who else am I talking to? And if you answer that question, who else should I be talking to? Like when you answer that question for me from the jump, or preempt it, it makes me so much more excited to do my job. And it makes me so much more excited to see that you're interested in sharing in the storytelling aspect with me. But, you know, of course, um, a lot of the pitfalls of, of, of journalism are systemic, especially in a time of layoffs, where constantly being asked to do more with less. So for Allegra, Allegra and Lexi, I wanted to ask, like, what about, I think, the job of being a journalist or just the pressures of existing in the industry and on deadline might make it tough to always cover movements in the way you might want them to. I'm not going to take this one first. Um, I think Dylan really got at a big piece of it, which is I think the press has this unfortunate tendency towards like hero narratives and just holding up one person as the face of the movement. Like, Greta Thunberg is the face of the youth climate movement when really like people have been doing this work for years all over the world and it's like a huge disservice to the work they're doing it puts, and it puts way too much pressure on these individuals to like speak for everyone's experience um so and, and another part of that is I think it like feeds into these youth savior narratives we see all the time of like young people are gonna save us and like mainstream media loves that shit and it <laughs> really um it really absolves, um, I think, older people of the responsibility to also care about issues like the climate crisis and racial justice and gun violence and all the things that like youth activists are are fighting for by just saying like you know the youth are going to take care of this for us. And I think you know it's easier to just put one person on a magazine cover than it is to cover these movements over time in all their facets. Um, so that's that's one thing I definitely see a lot of. And then. I think another part of it goes back to that neutrality, objectivity, like focus that I think a lot of more old school journalists who are oftentimes the people running, you know, more mainstream, larger newsroom still, um, still they still have that kind of, that, that's how they were taught. And so when younger journalists come into the newsroom and say like, we should be doing more social justice coverage, why aren't we covering the fight, you know, the war against trans rights or whatever, then they'll be told like, you have an agenda, like, you know, you're, you can't, you have like some sort of, you're bringing some sort of bias into the newsroom instead of just like, no, we're reporting on stories that are affecting people every single day. Um, so those are the two things that come to mind. Um, because Allegra and I share one brain, it's not, I, I don't know that I have too much to add on top of that. Um, I will say like, I have never gotten that response like working with Allegra so like it is cool to be at an institution where I feel like we really prioritize not feeding into the stuff that Allegra just said of like trivializing social justice coverage into um or like trivializing it as a part of our work but like that the only other thing I was going to bring up was kind of what you already gestured to Beatrice which was just like the media and journalism industry is being a disaster um and like how that like somehow like sometimes impacts how like we approach stories like for example like the cop city like literally just this morning we we're talking about the stop cop city movement and like you know so much goes on with that story and then it becomes a question of like okay do I have bandwidth to cover it today do I have bandwidth do we have bandwidth to get a freelancer to cover it like what is our 
budget like what are like we have to like all of these things are important in our perspective and like it is sometimes like frustrating to feel like all of the different moving pieces are just like an obstruction of doing the coverage that we want to do um but like yeah that's part of the the gig right now I guess yeah no I think I think that I think you touched on a really key point is like this kind of like over like this constant feeling of overwhelm and futility around doing the work you're passionate about but also kind of doing like the nuts and bolts of the job you feel called to do and something I've personally found helpful especially when reporting with on young people is like if a story that they that like I interview them for gets pushed a day or takes a little longer or something happens I try to be as explanatory and honest with them as I can about that process so they can learn how to interact with the media going forward but also because like that is something that they're that they're owed and I think especially in Philly when we are such like a labor a labor and union town it reminds people that like journalists are workers too and just like how you face obstacles in your job we do do too um so then one of my questions one of my other questions for everyone is if you could pick your one pet peeve or the one thing you think like media just constantly gets wrong with covering young people um what is it like if the, if there is one thing you want the journalists the editors in the room to leave knowing they should not do that what is it <laughs> say assuming that you know because people might not be interested young people might not be interested in electoral politics that they aren't you know engaged in their communities and politically engaged that is my biggest thing. okay Mira, you seem like you have a lot to say. <laughs> I, I don't know if I have a lot to say. I have something to say. Um, I think um, something that really bothers me is just kind of this general framing of like in exhaustion. Um, like young people are energized. We are excited and interested in doing the work, but also like, you know, writing every piece in this framework that's like there are these young energetic young people and they're going to come in and they're going to work really hard and do everything and and then that's just the beginning um but the truth is that a lot of people are like really fucking tired and um I think that's it's also just important that probably goes into like the um the kind of hero heroic young person narrative that you mentioned Allegra but um just also being able to recognize that uh, I don't know this work is tiring and we need breaks and um no movement is going to be all um you know tireless work and wins um Dylan <laughs> what what's um, your <laughs> yeah I think my biggest he is really around like the assumption that the youth vote kind of comes and then it magically like disappears that there's no uh, in between there is no organizing in between I think the the framing I think is always interesting um and I say that with the context that I at Future Coalition and other organizations I get to work with folks who are about long-term organizing and out and out organizing um I work with folks who are doing this work on the daily who are really using elections as checkpoints um like for example Future Coalition and in the last cycle, 2022, we paid uh, over 1,500 students to knock on uh, almost 90,000 doors and call half a million people. And then this year, we've been really focused around the storytelling and narrative and building the infrastructure for 2024. But just organizing in between all of these key checkpoints. And I think when we see like the, the narrative be like, you know, people showed up, I think that's missing the context that you know, people have and will continue to be showing up even using elections as a checkpoint so i think the the narrative i think this again that leads me to the note around like there's so many stories in the in between that i think are not being told i think we're just kind of next year we're going to tell a bunch of youth vote stories and then i think generally we're talking generalizations here there's a mute um so that's kind of goes to my one of my uh, frustrations with the media all right Last but not least, Lexi, your, your chief frustration. Lol. I mean, we've like covered a lot of them, which again, I'm not saying that to sound dumb um, or like, you know, redundant. Um, but uh, I guess, 
I had one too. Sorry. I'm trying to remember where it went. <laughs> yeah. I think kind of like what you were just speaking to, not just speaking to, but something else that you spoke to earlier, Beatrice is like explaining to sources, like what the process is. And like, like, I think especially with covering young people and like their movements, they often like are um I don't think I I think it behooves journalists to like remember like the age a lot of the time of the people that they're interviewing and like that they might not really completely understand the consequences of going public to the press or like what being anonymous means or like what having a pseudonym means or like what their school can do legally or like what libel law is or just like all these other things that like you don't get explained to you necessarily in like middle school or whatever um uh I think especially with a lot of the like anti-LGBTQ sentiment going on um like obviously reporters want to talk to young people who are like moving states and stuff like that um and like how that's going to whoop sorry I email I elbowed my printer um like how like electoral politics is going to be shaped by that um sort of like rhetorical backlash and stuff like that but since these are such sensitive dynamics I think it only helps to <laughs> the, the elbowing thank you um yeah so hopefully that made sense sorry I didn't mean to lose the thread there a little bit but what no, I was trying it, to it, say is like it's a level of responsibility that I feel like it just comes from being empathetic and thoughtful and I mean I you kind of like anticipated the next question which is like for your one pet peeve that that you that you listed like what do you think is like the one solution to 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 solving it so in this case you know, if you're like talking to young people and you're not explaining the process, you ought to be very clear about the consequences of the work that you do. So, so for Dylan, your pet peeve was people like ignoring the work that happens in between these big election years. What is the solution to to not doing that anymore? <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, I think there's also the honest piece around like I found movements I stood in having a really tough time on documenting their work and I think there's an added element to the thread we're, we're, we're following here around like being young people which means different priorities and not necessarily having experiences with media so I think there is for me I think you know putting some of the capacity things and the budgeting things aside for reporters it really means having those active to me checkpoints with with young people it means actively calling on young people to checking in with them. I think email, I, I think there's so many opportunities to really build a, a, a kind of a less transactional relationship, not when I need a story, but like what is happening? You know, I want to check in once a quarter with with youth activists doing this work. I think there's some like low hanging fruit that can be done to start to get at that, that I think is just really building that relationship for when the story, there is a story uh, dripping that you can kind of find it early too. So I think that's one, and I think for many, I think it can be a, a low hanging fruit that can be implemented, if not if not already implemented to more uh, sources and potential sources. And now Mira, what do you think is the solution to reporters not kind of, kind of to not defaulting to that narrative of like young people are just always full of energy and we're just like jumping at the bit to change things 24 seven. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, one thing that most young organizers have in common is that they have like a million other things going on at the same time as this work. And so I think reserving some of that time in your conversation to talk to them about um, their life as, you know, like a student or a full-time employee or, um, you know, doing any number of things serving as a caretaker etc um that they're comfortable talking about um and you know being able to draw the contrast or the similarities between their work and organizing and their work um just like living and existing every day um often just like makes this person seem a lot more real um and grounded and um i also think um as a young person who will like by a lot of people be like inherently disrespected and like disregarded in their mind um it you know makes them more of a a whole human to interact with and respect um not that they should need that but that it still happens and sometimes it's necessary all right and allegra what is your one solution to offer <laughs> um 
I would just boil it down to like hire more young journalists, hire more <laughs> young journalists of color of all sorts of backgrounds of, from all different parts of the country. Um, and that's how you avoid having the same story that the what kind that you alluded to earlier, Beatrice, of like, can you believe these young people like voted in, in big numbers or like whatever. Those those kind of stories you read every election cycle um, because you'll be getting story ideas from, you know, these people you hire will get them from their communities, their neighborhoods, their friends, their families, you know, their networks, and they're going to be much more interesting than just like the same thing you've read a million times. Um, I also think it helps because I think young people are often more comfortable talking to journalists who are closer in age to them. Like it's easier to relate to a peer than someone who's like your parents age or like your teacher's age. So, um, yeah, hire more young people. All right. Speaking of that and helping young people tell their stories and get more young reporters into the fold, I think Teen Vogue is like absolutely exemplary at doing that and giving opportunities for young people to not just also do reporting, but like do stuff that is that like kind of like makes them a part of the narrative in a way that like signals to the reader that like this is coming from a from a peer, it's coming from an expert. Like for example, Delaney, um, Amir and I's friend Delaney Parks got to do tons of participatory journalism and reporting on being of being a, a reporter at the Pittsburgh Post Cadets like Post Gazette strike paper and what it means to be in a union as a young person. So with that in mind, um, I don't want to tease or allude to too much, but Teen Vogue is going to be hiring some young people to do reporting in um, battleground states in 2024. So Allegra, I guess, can you tell me a little bit more about that program and what inspired you guys to do that? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so we don't have like, a cute catchy name for it yet. We're just calling it the 2024 like student journalist correspondent project. Um, but the basic idea is we um, are gonna have students in like seven of the key states that are going to kind of determine control of Congress and who ends up in the White House. So Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Florida, Georgia, Nevada, Arizona. And we're going to have one student in each state um, sort of be like our eyes and ears on the ground for like what is going on in that state that matters, that is getting enough coverage, what are students on campus talking about, like what are people protesting at the state legislature? Um, what crazy ballot initiative is actually like turning out voters in huge numbers or scandals happening on campus or whatever? Um, and, and yeah, the thinking was we just wanted, we wanted to hear directly from students about this stuff instead of like, you know, assigning out our version of the same stories that are appearing everywhere. We want this to come from them directly. Um, and we just actually had our first meeting with them earlier today. Uh, they're a super amazing group. It, it was really hard to pick like there were so many amazing candidates um but yeah and, and some of the people we don't pick were like please pitch us anyway we'd love to work with you and, and have you freelance for us too so. that makes my heart so happy and i guess lexi my question for you is what is the key to giving feedback to young reporters on their work especially if they're making that transition or dipping their toe in journalism from like being a student organizer first yeah um I guess like part of it is I, I think what I tend to rely on doing is like um like deferring to their expertise, right? Like real like refer like recognizing that they have like I think they can sometimes feel like intimidated or like um insecure or like not even clear on like what information they should be sharing like with a journalist. Um, and I think like there was other discussion of like, you know, thinking about like storytelling is like a thing that like both of us have to like kind of exercise in the situation, like a sort of relational kind of thing. So like, I think that has been like one thing that I, I guess like recognizing like how we can make it as humane of a situation as possible from every situation in like journalism and so like I think that's the one thing that I would like it can feel a little like awkward and uncomfortable but like it's a lot of the same skills that you use in organizing that end up making your interviewing processes like more respectful and like constructive I think a lot of the time like when you're like trying to 
like, I guess doing the opposite of what we talked about earlier up in this call where people were like, oh, if you've done organizing work, you definitely can't be a journalist. I think I tend to try and like encourage younger people to embrace it as like a strength and like a thing that actually like bolsters their journalism work. And now Mira is so humble, but Mira has had an illustrious freelancing career and was a member of the nation's student, student fellowship um, and regularly contributes to a ton of places. So as a young person who is edited at the professional level often, what to you is like a good editor? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't know about illustrious, but I'll take it. Um I think actually probably what I was going to say when it comes to like editing young people um, and, and stories about young people is probably what Lexi said a few questions ago, which is just really understanding that oftentimes the journalist and then also the sources you're working with are young and like need to know things like, you know, off the record, on the record, on background, like they need to know, you know, what's going to happen at the school level or the state level and, you know, um, how to how to be safe and still be able to engage in telling their story so I think people who recognize that I mean that's a really important quality in an editor and something I've always appreciated um I think something else that is a little bit trickier but still something I think is important is um knowing what trajectory and what purpose you have for the story but also being open to uh what the organizers believe are the most important facets of their movement um, I've reported pieces where um, there are things that um, the organizers think are like extremely important, like, um, you know, the demographics of their movement and like tensions that that has caused. And and I've had editors say, oh, that's a little too complicated for us to try to report now. Um, and I think instead of having that feedback, it would have been better to have a sort of conversation about, OK, well, do we need to make this a longer project? Is there a way that we can still, you know, have this story be told and incorporated because it's something that's so important to the organizers? Um, or is this something that doesn't really align with this publication and what the editor's vision was for this piece? So um, I think also just being open to having conversations about what um, organizers see as the most important um, parts and conflicts of in their movement and versus what journalists see as being the most important elements so because sometimes yeah. those are odds yeah I think a really good mindset to bring to editing always but especially with young reporters or newer journalists is editing is teaching and that the feedback you give them should not just be specific to like the piece at hand but stuff about how to make them better in the future and 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 in the long run. I, from my experience serving briefly as an editor um, at a hyperlocal publication post-grad, is that when you when you don't want to work with a reporter again, how much of that is you not clearly communicating to them your expectations or like how they can be better, right? So it's just something to keep in mind is when you give feedback, especially to young people, that like these are skills you, you should hopefully want them to take with them in the future, right? Um, so now a couple of rapid fire questions for the whole group um, is what is what is one thing you think journalists can learn from youth organizers and organizers in general about like relationship and trust building? Um, Dylan, you want to go first? Um, yeah, I think for me, I think the one thing I work exclusively in essentially decentralized movement spaces that are powered by, you know, hundreds of organizational partners that are also entirely intergenerational with, you know, allies really providing the infrastructure. Um, and then at the same time, also being unified. So unified as, or unified as possible, as unified as possible in terms of messaging or actions. So I think there's just a model here. There's a story there around just the intergenerational nature of a lot of these movements that I think is yet to be explored as a, as much as it can be. And then two, I think it's just an interesting model of just the power of uh, intergenerational collaborations that are are unified while also being as decentralized as possible to, you know, start and maintain a movement. So I think there's a lot there around how movements show up for journalists and reporters to learn. Lexi, what about you? What do you think journalists can you can learn from organizers about how to build trust? Yeah, I also feel like I kind of skipped ahead with my previous answer and kind of like spoke to this a little bit too. So my bad. Um, but yeah, I guess um I think I've also been thinking a lot about 
um, like the role of accessibility as like a concept in my reporting, not to be like too meta, I guess, but like, um, like, I think we all know that like, there are certain ways that representation can be like negative, right? Or like something I've been thinking a lot about is like reporting on a campaign, like too early in their organizing process and then like getting attention they weren't ready for, or, like, you know, like, like the sort of like strategic questions that like, obviously like in this moment, like we want everybody who wants to hold the mic to have the mic and like, we want it to be equitable and we want it to be safe for everybody. Um, but I do think like, um being like asking a lot of like intermediary questions I mean this is a lot of stuff again that like other people have said in different formats and different answers to the questions which is great that we're all like on the same page lol um but like being in like a more like relational form of conversation as opposed to just like um like um and like even like teaching them little forms of professionalism i think can be good but like also like feeding off their like like urge to just be like direct and like not have a ton of like artifice around how we're talking about like what stories might look like um and like how they can all like how all of these different like structures interact with each other like between like organizing communities and like youth communities and journalism and blah 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 Mira, what do you think journalists can learn from organizers about building relationships? <laughs> um, I guess, okay, this probably comes from a, a different perspective um, because I am a student who's not like fully employed in the journalism world and also a freelancer. But um, I do find that um, journalism as a job is a lot more individual than organizing. And so I think just um, learning of like, I don't know, just uninhibited collaboration and um, practicing writing collaboratively, even if you're not trying to publish collaborative writing um, and, you know, just letting all competition fall to the side and recommend your friends to write stories and, and you know, give them sources and work with them and and it'll come back to you. And I don't know, I think that just that sense of, of collaboration and community is really important um, and I don't know at, at at the freelance level and at like the collegiate level I definitely still think like most of the journalistic world is defined by competition um but I don't know hearing from voices like this also makes me think that that's not necessarily true yeah like oh wow that was that was yeah um I I as a young journalist I I especially like a concentrated media market I do want to say like competition is like generally like you're right competition is like the dominant vibe of the industry but like as more people like us who have who have grown up understanding that like collaboration is important and getting through things together is important that is less the case um so finally Legra what is what do you think that like what have what have you especially um learned from organizers um that like you take and carry with you um as an editor um I loved what Mara said but uh also, something that Dylan spoke to earlier is just just being less transactional in our relationships with sources. Um, I think is is something that journalists can really learn um, a thing or two about. <laughs> like, don't just call people up after something horrible happens and hound them for a quote. Like, respect who they are as people. Um, build those relationships out in advance so you actually like know the people that you're going to be covering. You know, if you're going to be covering a certain like movement all the time, get on the phone with the comms director and just like talk to them about what initiatives they're working on, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, and reach out when you don't need something. So it's not just always like this one way kind of interaction, but instead like you show that you you respect the work they do and you want to know about it. And um, yeah, just make it more of a two-way street. Final question. And this is, this is the rapid fire, like answers to an icebreaker question. What in you know in as like as in as little words it takes to communicate this? What do you think is the is like one of the top priorities for young people heading into the twenty twenty four election? Um, and I'm going to tokenize Mira for ten seconds and ask her first because she's the the resident youngest person. <laughs> what what's your top, what do you think is the top issue for young people? There's a lot. I think I'm going to answer this question with 
anything related to labor because from where we're standing and looking out on the rest of our life that's all we see yes <laughs> All right, Dylan, I'm seeing you nodding in agreement. Do you think yeah, that's, I, that's exactly it? I think I hope this conversation in terms of what Gen Z cares about shifts to the economic issues as much as we care about the social issues. So that's my hope for that those conversations. All right, I'm just going to zigzag backwards. Lexi, what do you think is a top issue um, among young people heading in 2024? Um, plus one to all of those things, but also um, <clears throat> just like, um being completely apathetic at best and furious at worst at the presidential election choices for next year and how that like voter apathy will impact or not yet yeah, maybe not apathy but as of right now <laughs> might impact everything else that's gonna happen all right and allegra um finally you know agenda setting i guess for teen vote for 2024 um what is what it, what are what is one of the issues that you're seeing come up among among young people heading to 2024 yeah i can't pick just one but i'll do climate and student debt i think are just the things we get so many pitches about and i think are really going to inform how the how young people are looking at the Biden administration and sort of assessing his record um next year all right. Um, so we have about 12 minutes left for Q&A and we have four questions in the chat. So the first two come from Annie Dance, who covers democracy and accountability in the Lake Lur area of Western North Carolina. She ha they this, Annie happens to have experience working on Republican campaigns in the Northeast, but I'm, affiliated, I'm an unaffiliated voter, voter. The first question is, when you say organizers, are you referring to Democratic groups? I think this is a kind of targeted at the people on a democracy day who planned this panel and, you know, gathered all of you here today. Um, and I, and I don't think this is necessarily true, especially with the organization, the conversation we've had today. I think organizers means anybody um, working in a grassroots movement. And I think the, the, the conversation we had, I think especially true when you think of organizers and people in rural areas who are extra disaffected when it comes to coverage in the press and don't get covered at all or get tokenized or just don't necessarily have tons of interactions let alone positive interactions with the media so when we say organizers i really mean anybody working in a grassroots movement any young people working in a grassroots movement you know young young republican clubs are more than welcome to the this this party libertarian groups more than welcome but that said when like we think about threats to democracy, I think it is pretty clear to see where the lion's share of those are are, are coming from. And we do have to be mindful um, when we're not just talking about Democrats is that, you know, th those groups are also capable of being critical of those threats. But the second question is, how can we cover democracy without being polarizing? Is that even possible? Heavy question. Um, and Allegra, um, as an editor who, who makes coverage decisions, can't, do you think you, we can cover democracy without being polarizing? I mean, like, democracy is also a topic, but I would say just some things shouldn't be political. Like, everyone should be able to vote. That's not controversial. Like, that, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I think... <sighs> I don't know. I mean, I think everything is polarizing now. So so it's hard to do this, but I don't know. I think you sort of just have to operate from a place of like certain things are should we should all agree on. Like people should have voting access and um voter suppression is bad and like certain fundamental I mean, I'm thinking of the most like basic, like you know democracy yeah. related concepts but um but yeah and then I think you should report on that like as a given um no matter like what location you are <laughs> so yeah I think jumping off of that so much of the work we do at democracy day is telling people what kinds of stories are are democracy reporting and that like you can really expand your definition with that and I think to your question Annie covering the procedure of of how things work 
how how polling how polling workers do their jobs how polling places are picks how you know but like you know machine machines vote tallying machines even work like that is not should not be polarizing at all same thing like democracy journalism is service journalism that tells people how to take advantage of of their rights as people so like stuff that's like here's how to reach all of you know the new the new people in office next year like he you know here's how to you know do I don't know public records requests like that's kind of boring but like you know like service journalism that helps people take advantage of their rights also shouldn't be polarizing next question comes from Andrea CH she um said the framing of young folks as energetic leaves out exhaustion with older gener it leaves out the exhaustions the older generation is leaving with them that was such an amazing point Mira my question is how do you break the ice with organizers? I have been at protests and very of like wary of interrupting the labor of leading the event. Is social media a good conversation space or invasive? Um, so, so Dylan, like, how how do you how how do you break the? How would you recommend somebody break the ice with organizers? Yeah, I think definitely starting with social media as a way in, I think works, and then I think I think it really goes back to having that. That Zoom conversation, um, particularly as I was entering the space, I think that's what I appreciated is building those relationships because I think I not only learned that as an organizer and then as somebody who now heavily supports other organizers tell their narratives, um, was heavily just uh, building that relationship with with journalists. So I definitely think social media, then shifting over to email and then having a the conversation and then you know talking actively. Like I I, I think the big thing is just to do it with and no need to overthink it in my eyes. Um, so I think folks would appreciate um, folks seeing them and, and collaborating with them um, in any capacity. Yeah, do you have anything to add, like how, how especially because you, you operate kind of interchangeably between both sides of, of this kind of fold, um, how would you recommend people break the ice with organizers? Yeah, I mean, I think um, just being able to catch someone after an event is always a good way to like just break the ice get their contact information i think um if you're actually present at an event and then you go stalk someone on social media especially if they have like a private account and it's like a personal account then maybe it would have just been better for you to make first contact when you saw them um but that's definitely still a way to do it i i use social media almost entirely for all of my news gathering i i slide into people's dms and i have to say very very rarely have people had a problem with it, people are actually often excited that like you even found them and you think their work is cool. But I do think when you send that initial initial DM, how you do it is really important. Telling them that it's okay for them to ignore it, it's okay for them to say no, it is okay for them to ask you questions about how you found them or like the work. Make it like a make it like a very like this is just an open space and you have a total autonomy autonomy over what happens next is really important if you're sliding into people's DMs over social media and doing a little bit of stalking. Jessel Noor, who's also one of the organizing members, the organizing members of Democracy Day, asked a very good question. 40% of US news consumers actively avoid the news, according to a new study. Evidence suggests that overly problem-focused reporting is fueling the trend. Do you find that young people um, don't just want to hear about like problems and all the shit that's terrible? but also want reporting that looks at like where progress is being made like do you find that young people have an appetite for service um for solutions journalism um Lexi or Allegra um from kind of like the analytics and you know stuff you have at Teen Vogue do you find that people like your audience is animated by like solutions oriented stories I can go but if you want to go first Allegra no no okay um yeah I mean this is a complicated one that I I think we expend a lot of energy trying to figure out um in my experience we were talking about this earlier today but one thing that is important to me is that like I you know keep in touch with my teenage family members and like my 20 some early 20 people that are younger than me big slew of information gatherers who are not all like media pilled um when we're thinking about what stories are likely to get like we're like we're coming from the perspective of service journalism kind of regardless you know what I mean like what is the most useful thing that a young person could use in this time like is it an op-ed is it like a reported piece like what is the thing that will like either not make them feel like catastrophically you know like 
oh no, this terrible thing's happening and I have no power, but also like won't make them feel like it's at the other end of what we were talking about before of like, oh, like young people are saving the day. All they have to do is register to vote and then uh, America's problems are saved. So I think like there's definitely an appetite for like service related journalism, but it it I I I think a lot of the more like negative journalism also just fails to like um like if you're report like as long as you acknowledge the organizing that's going on around a big bad thing then like you're reporting it like optimistically and also honestly but if you only report like the bad stuff and not the people that are actively resisting then like I would understand feeling disengaged from that media approach too I guess is my complaint. yeah I think I think that was I think that was really well said that I think reporting that fundamentally focuses on organizing and movement the movement-based journalism is solutions-based journalism because you're covering the people trying to figure out the the solution um next question comes from Mariela Santos Muniz um Muniz um she says how can the media better cover youth organizers and young people in the U.S. whose primary language isn't English that is such a good question. Um, what I will say from my experience um, editing in a hyperlocal publication is if you're talking to a source that is organizing in bilingual ways or their audience is mostly Spanish speaking or Mandarin speaking or whatever, you should probably publish and translate whatever you report it on in the language that makes it accessible for that core audience to read. And I know, you know, um, like, a certain media organization laid off the entire like Spanish speaking like like staff pretty recently. Don't use AI to do that. Um, like translating English journalism into journalism in another language is a is a science and it takes nuance and it takes lots of work. Real people should do that. But um, for anybody else who wants to jump in and answer this question, um, go on and go forth. <laughs> I'm, I would just also say to have reporters that can report, you know, do their own original reporting in that language, in addition to people who can serve for translation purposes, because obviously those stories are very different and also very important. Yeah. Um, all right. I think we have time for one or two other questions. If anybody wants to just hop on, like, you know, just say them now. <laughs> I have one I, I can jump in. Okay, Joe. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm a big fan of everything. Um, you know, I the thing that drives me the, the cra crazy the most is when I hear people, particularly traditional journalists, uh, lamenting the lack of media literacy uh, in particular. And to me, it, it it smacks of the the terror of losing control of a narrative that they have been had control of for so long. Um, and I wondered what, particularly um, Allegra, uh, or Lexi, wh what do you see as as a response to that that is not just, you know, shitting on them, but actually is a productive way to meet in the middle there? Because it seems to me that they're also pushing the responsibility onto news consumers to learn something and how to read and uh, digest something that the media is putting out. Like, how do you find a middle ground there that is a productive forward facing solution without result, you know, falling back on those same tropes all the time? Yeah, you know, we, we publish stories every day and people seem to have no no difficulties <laughs> comprehending them. Like, it's not an issue. Um, yeah, I think I think some of this comes from, like, who their core readers are at some of the outlets that you might be referring to, Joe. Like, and they might not go to, like, you know, I'm not going to name any specific publications, but, like, their homepage to get their news, but they might be finding it in other places. They might be finding it on social media, whatever. It doesn't mean they're, like, not consuming the news uh, or don't understand what they're reading. It just means they might not be reading what you're putting out. Um, so yeah, I think just, just not having this condescending attitude um, is a great way to, um, is a great starting place. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, something we always try to do in our coverage is we never, ever, ever want to talk down to readers, but we also don't want to assume they know like everything about everything and like some policy proposal that's coming down from, you know, the White House or whatever. Like, so we just, we explain, we, we add that context um, into the pieces in like a way that's sort of digestible 
um, but never being like, you big dummies, like our readers are super smart and, and important. Um, so yeah, just, just like that combination of context and not being a <laughs> Anything else? Nice for one so. anyway. Go ahead. I also think young people are just media literate in a different way than like old guard journalists realize. Like we are so good at determining what is an ad and what is being sold to us because all we consume are different types of sponsored content every day on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter, right? That's a certain type of media literacy that respectfully, like I love my mom who's 54. She doesn't have, she doesn't have that. She, you know, she gets everything the algorithm recommends to her, right? And conversely, like we're also good at spotting like what might be a deep fake, what, what might not be authentic content. And those are things that newsrooms need to invest tons of resources into to fact check, whereas someone like myself or Lexi or Mir or Dylan or even you or even anybody, anyone who grew up as like almost digital native or who is chronically online, we can do that almost intrinsically, right? So like I just think there are different types of media literacy. And I think just saying young people are like media illiterate is just like a dumb, broad sweeping generalization. It doesn't do much. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm very passionate about this, as you, as you, as you can see. <laughs> um, I don't want to go too much over, but I wanted to thank everybody um, for attending. If you have any other questions that you didn't feel confident or comfortable to say, you can always email us. We can get you an answer. Um, and you will also get a, a thank you exit email with a ton of goodies, including all of the resources Joe dropped in the chat today, but also a curated guide from myself and Mariella that gets you, that's like a starter kit for reporting on youth organizers in four battleground states for 2024. So we've told you, you know, how to do that, um, why you should do it. So if you're curious and want to hit the ground running, you, you, will, you will have the contact information for two youth organizers in these four states. Um, to kind of get you started. Um, so thank you guys so much. This was such a pleasure. <laughs>
cooperative media. Um, my name is Joy Lynn. Um, I work at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And as the steward of the Federal Appropriation for Public Media, CPB supports more than 1,500 locally owned and operated public television and radio stations whose signals reach 99% of the US population, ensuring that nearly everyone living in America has free access to high quality and diverse content content in front of a paywall that educates, informs, and strengthens civil society. Public media represents the largest nonprofit news system in the US with over 4,000 journalists based at local stations. Over the past 15 years, CPB has helped sustain this ecosystem by investing more than $150 million in discretionary funds to journalism. And 44 million of that has gone towards supporting over 40 local and regional news collaborations, connecting 150 public media stations in 43 states in the District of Columbia, fostering a vibrant network of local and regional newsrooms with national reach. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce America Amplified, an engaged journalism initiative, initiative that CBB has been proud to support beginning in 2019 when a group of public radio stations approached us with a collaborative proposal to strengthen local election coverage. And fast forward to the recent midterm elections, America Amplified's central team worked with television and radio stations in 25 states to equip the public with information on the voting process on the air, on digital platforms, in places where people gathered, stations asked what people didn't understand or wanted to know about elections, and provided them the information they needed. And as you'll hear from Elisa shortly, ambitious plans are underway for 2024. And as we approach the 250th anniversary of America's independence, democratic values and systems, as we discussed here, are being challenged. And public media newsrooms, which are among the most trusted and well-known institutions at the local level, are ideally situated to strengthen a shared understanding of the facts in their communities, facts that are critical to facilitating civil dialogue among people with divergent political viewpoints. And in an era of digital polarization, active disinformation efforts and historic levels of distrust in institutions, we believe that America Amplified plays an important role in helping ensure that the public has the necessary information to fully uphold and participate. But we'll get there slowly but surely. So uh, America Amplified, um, for 2024, where our host station is WFYI, when we're working through CPB, we have to have a host station that work, we work through. So WFYI in Indianapolis is our host station. So we, our ambition is to work with public media stations across the country in 2023 and 2024 to engage audiences and communities about the election and the voting process. And now what does this mean for you guys? Because you're not, most of you are not involved in public media. This, the key to this is gonna be partnerships with other news organizations and with community groups, just like we heard about in this last project. So please reach out to me at the end of this or at some point in the next few months and ask how you can be involved because we want you to be involved. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of history. Well, this is the community engagement cycle that I think we've been, many people have been talking to, talking about. Identify the gaps in your coverage, who you're not talking to, report on those stories, report with those communities, and then re-engage. It's all about building trust and building relationships and reporting with your communities instead of on your communities, right? So that's kind of a basic premise that America Amplified is about community engagement journalism in public media. So we also created a community engagement playbook that you can find on americaamplified.org with, you know, if, if people in your newsroom, newsroom don't really know what community engagement is, haven't engaged in that process, there's a lot of resources there that you can look at. It's divided into different categories if you're a newsroom leader, if you're a reporter or producer, if you're the CEO of a newsroom. So please check that out. So 2019, 2020, we were, as, as Joy mentioned, we were working with large collaborations within the public media landscape to try to better understand where the America electorate was in the lead up to the 2020 election, to engage and understand those communities. 
Then we had the pandemic. A lot of our plans were upended, as were yours, but we ended up learning a lot about virtual engagement, I think, as many of you did. And then in 2021 and 2022, we worked with a bunch of small and medium-sized stations across the country who had their own different strategies on how to engage audiences. So we employed a lot of different methods. Just a few examples here. Texting clubs from every beat reporter at WITF in Pennsylvania, um, a storytelling workshop in Asheville, North Carolina. In Maine, they have a nightly news broadcast in a number of different uh, languages to reach immigrant communities. And then, of course, some Spanish language experimentation at a small station in northern Illinois. These are just a few examples of some of the things we did in 2021 and tw what stations did with our support. And then we got to the midterms, you know, there's all this anxiety about, um, you know, the state of democracy. And with the support of CPB, we launched a midterm election project, again, to give, to try to make sure that audiences and communities had the information they needed to participate in the election. So we expanded the number of stations we were working with, um, 25 states, 30 stations in all. I'm moving quickly through this so that, because I think we've talked about a lot of this over the course of today. We provided all of these stations with a Harkin embed, um, something that they can put on their websites and they can use on social media, basically saying, what questions do you have about participating in the midterm elections? We were looking for questions about the mechanics of voting. Where can I vote? How do I apply for an absentee ballot? How do I find out if my ballot has been received? I just moved recently. What do I do? And we received over 600 questions and answered those. The back end of this, and you know, this is kind of where a massive 25 station, 30 station collaboration works. This is the back end of the Harkin EMS, Engagement Management System. So questions would come up to us, come into us, we'd get a Slack alert that a question had come into New Hampshire Public Radio. We could view it on this platform, we could research the answer, check it with an editorial lead at that station, and then send it directly back to the questioner. We also had Spanish language embeds, and we had a text integ integration as well, so people could text their questions in. Um, a lot of our work at America Amplified was helping stations get the word out that, we, that stations were answering questions. Um, we did a lot of social media stuff, and we also, stations got a lot, got very creative. So KJZZ in Phoenix, for instance, printed out postcards and posters and put them up at community colleges all across the city and got tons of questions that way. At Michigan Public Radio, they had a um, TikTok and Instagram series where the county clerk would come in and answer the questions in person. Very popular. Um, we also created FAQs for stations to publish online and to do you know, little broadcast bits about this and social media assets as well to share with them. So, Similar to what every, you know, every voice, every vote was saying in terms of sharing these assets and sharing this co-branding along the line, because many of these stations have very little bandwidth to do this kind of stuff themselves, so we're trying to increase capacity and give them the tools to do this. So uh, 2024 is already here, it seems like, and we are launching a new initiative where this time we hope to reach audiences in all 50 states. We have a staff of three right now, so how we'll do this, we don't know. <laughs> it's gonna have to get bigger. Um, again, as everybody has said, we're trying to get beyond the political horse race, recognizing the polarization in the country and the lack of trust in media, so we are really focusing on engaged elections coverage for our stations. Um, so not only does it help to build trust, but also it really has been proven to go a long way to, to bring viewers and listeners and readers to your websites. We saw, we saw a, lot of, um, a lot of our stations saw their metrics go way up when they had these kinds of um, articles on their website and when they did this kind of thing online. So it was really very popular among the stations that we worked with last year. So this time we're starting really early. For the midterm election pro project, we started maybe 
May or June before the midterms, and we were able to supply the stations with these tools and these strategies, but it was a scramble. As we all know, newsrooms tend to not focus on the election until like mid-October. This time, we're starting as early as we can to you know, focus on a community that you want to reach, map out the stakeholders, who are the important people there, form partnerships with people like you, with newsrooms like the ones you represent, do the call-outs, and distribute that call-outs among the par partnerships that you've created, as well as your own website and, and on air. Gather and answer the, que answer the questions, and then distribute the FAQs, and then rinse and repeat, do it again. Um, this is what we're going to be offering stations, uh, intensive training, ongoing mentoring, access to the Harkin embed, funds for a bunch of engagement activities, social media assets, impact tracking, and access to a public media election information app. Talk a little bit about all of these. I'm really going fast. I hope I'm not going too fast. So intensive training, we're going to start off with a sixth session boot camp. Boot camp. If any of you participated in um, Election SOS last year, that it was a really, really intensive training from a group of organizations. This is going to be an abbreviated sense of that, but the idea is to get newsrooms, we're, we're hoping for one newsroom manager and at least one reporter producer, to get them on the same page for thinking about what their political coverage would be. The idea is to center community in your coverage rather than the politicians, and then how to do that. As we did in 2021 and 2022, if we're going to be working with 50 stations potentially, we're going to have to divide them into cohorts, and we're going to divide them into cohorts on a number of different levels. It may be the size of the station and the bandwidth that they have to do this kind of thing. It may be what audience are they targeting. Are they targeting a Spanish language speaking audience? Are they targeting rural audiences? Um, it may be based on the level of experience they have with these kinds of engagement strategies. And we will have a trainer working with each of these cohorts, working with stations individually and then bringing them together in a group at least once a month to kind of share best practices, do more learning, and learn from each other. So that will be over the course of 2024. Again, we'll be sharing with them a Harkin embed. Everybody knows what Harkin is, right? Good idea, okay. Um, I think early in the election year, they will be able to use this Harkin embed to learn more about the communities that they're trying to reach. And then as we get closer to the election, we will have a uniform prompt, probably along the lines of what questions do you have about participating in the upcoming election. Last year in the midterm project, we wanted to capture questions about the mechanics of voting. But over half of the questions that came in, predictably enough, were about candidates and issues and judges. So we're going to be really working very hard behind the scenes to have answers to as many of those questions as we possibly can across all 50 states. <coughs> We have an engagement fund where we will be able to help stations pay for translations, pay for in-person activities, um, pay for additional staff time, um, texting services. It will be you know, a case-by-case -case basis. What do you need? What can we help you with? Um, we will have a social media strategy and a calendar. Again, I was uh, inspired by every voice, every vote about how they did this with, with a branding kit as well as with social media influencers. The degree to which we can bring people in like that in every community and really get the word out there will be fantastic. What, what, what has worked for us in the past, and I think will be in play once again, is kind of tiers of engagement. Um, for the most basic level, you know, you're going to post it on your website and you're going to put it on social. And then on the second level, maybe you're going to do on-air, you know, pro promotions. You're going to be amplifying it wherever you can. And then on the third level, you're going to be going out and tabling, holding live in-person events. You're going to be doing whatever you can to get the work out. Stations, public media stations have all different levels of capacity ranging from a, you know, a three-state, a three person newsroom to WNYC or, or KPCC in LA where there's huge. So we kind of have to, we have to customize it depending upon station capacity. And that's again where partners come in. 
We are developing, we're using um, some AI, frankly, to develop a public, a public media election information portal, isn't it a great name? Um, where these questions will automatically come into this portal from the Harkin embeds from across the country, and we will have scraped the basic election information from Secretary of State's websites for the most part. We will be editing the answers, real humans will be looking at them. Um, but we're hoping that this will create a, an easier and more efficient way of getting at some of the really basic questions that we know will come in from across the country. Um, and this, on, on the left, you can see kind of where the information is pulled. We see the original source, and then we can edit it directly into that database and into that app. And then that, the, the answers will go back to the stations, the stations will approve them, and then they'll go to the questioner, and then we will be able to create FAQs out of these. Finally, we will be developing an impact tracking system. I think we talked about this in some of the earlier sessions. We'll be creating the, just the simplest, simplest Google metrics, you know, Google analytics that stations will be training them how to track this kind of stuff. And we'll also be bringing in some qualitative um, tracking as well, what kind of, what, first of all, what, were you, what, what outcome did you want to achieve? Did you get there? Why or why not? As many qualitative impacts that we can possibly track. All of this to convince station management, convince journalists, convince funders that this kind of human engagement in the news process you know, is the way we need to go and creates the kind of political coverage that really meets communities' information needs. We have, 26, we have 26 minutes left for questions, if you have any. <laughs> yeah. Please go ahead. Hi, how are you? Um, I would love to hear a little bit more about your strategy for rural communities. Um, if most of the questions that you get are about the candidates, one of the things we find in small races, particularly anything with fewer than 7,000 eligible voters, is that that information is just not available online often, like just literally not there. Even the registrars aren't posting in, in a timely way. Uh, how do you deal with that and how do you work with, I mean, and, and these are the newsrooms with the least capacity to do the groundwork. Yeah, how, that's a, how do you how do you work on that? I mean, like LA and New York, frankly, no problem. They're all right. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. No, no. I, I agree with you. Though um, people in LA and New York still have questions about uh, the judges, for instance. That's one thing that is we found across the country is that people were saying, "How do I judge the judges?" And so that's one thing we'll be looking at. You know, I don't have a really good answer to that question. I think that what we will do is reach out to small rural newsrooms like yours, hoping that you will be finding some of those answers. We will have a team of researchers as well that will be digging into this stuff, and it may be a lot of phone calls, a lot of research, um, and frankly, there will, there will be some questions that are, we won't be able to answer, I mean, especially if we're trying to do a nationwide project like this. I did want to jump in, though. Um, we were just talking about this earlier. I, I attended a gathering earlier today of um, rural public media stations, and one of them was a station um, serving uh, I told you it was it. Um, it was New Mexico, but the rural oh. part of New Mexico, Las, Las Cruces, Las Cruces yeah. down on the border. And um, they actually benefit hugely from the New Mexico collaboration. That station, um, the general manager said they just had one reporter. But that service is so vital. I mean, there are parts of the the state where you know their only actually content service is um, public television and public radio. No other signals reach them. And in, in that case, the station actually has recognized the tremendous um, service that they need to provide. He was saying that in the most recent elections, they actually had like 25 candidate forums because this would be one of the few opportunities that the community would have in engaging the audience. So, I mean, you, you can think, I mean, I think what's amazing is there's so many people here that have information to provide. And there are stations that are serving communities that really need that information. So I actually can't encourage you like enough to consider a partnership where, where it makes sense with a public media station because of the reach that they do have to underserved communities. And I just want to give a shout out to KRWG because it's a cool station and I, I, they need capacity. So please directly fund them. Yay! <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Danny Stusser with The Jolt, which is the journal of Olympia, Lacey, and Tumwater. We operate in the shadow of two public radio stations, and we've learned that public radio is a buzzword that excludes community media, which is another buzzword, which is, uh, defines three kinds of television, uh, public access, mm -hmm. education, and government. Does your program include the PEG stations, public education, and uh, government? I think I, Joy can address that as well. What we want to do is cast as wide a net as possible with partnerships. I think we would probably end up working with one of the two public media stations in your community. But Then you just go right over us. Nobody no, cares about our county. I, what I'm saying is that we would like to have them create partnerships with you. We would encourage them to reach out to you all to work with you. Let's talk afterwards. Our experience is that is that we, our community is too small for them to spend very much time with at all. When I say very much time, I mean once a year. What so do they I, do once a year? Uh, they might pay attention to something going on in our county. Uh -huh. There's a problem. There's rural and there's urban, but the, I don't know how big it is, but there are a lot of cities that surround big markets that aren't that are, that are ignored, in the, by by public television by public radio and certainly by the newspapers. Okay. And we're here trying to figure out how to fix this. I think you, I think you raise a, a really important mm -hmm. point, right? Like public broadcasting reaches 99% of Americans, but you know their ability to serve is limited because they too have limited resources. And that's why CVB has been so invested in collaboration, collaborative resources. I will say though that um, I emphasize when I talk about public media as an ecosystem that each station is independently owned and operated. And actually, even though it can be frustrating at times, it actually makes public media stations more tethered to their local community in a way that like nationalized media outlets can easily, as you've seen with the financial constraints, really um, make them overemphasize national coverage. And so I do hold out that belief that um, stations that adhere to their mission and recognize their um, service would welcome the ability to partner, but I can't, I just can't speak on behalf of them, you know, at CPB is an editorial firewall, but um, between the appropriations process and what content makers make, but um, I think that, you know, it's worth having a conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for this great question. Hi, my name is Rashad Mahmoud from the New Mexico Local News Fund. <laughs> that Yay. funny coincidence. Um, um, uh, Diana, the project coordinator for that collaborative that you mentioned is here too, so that's great. Joy, thanks for the shout out. Um, and relatedly, my question was gonna be, obviously, you know, the public media stations that I'm familiar with are so grateful whenever there's an initiative like this that comes down the pike and that provides them more resources to do something. But obviously, um, it for, especially for the smaller stations like KUNM, KRWG that we work with, um, you know, like ongoing sustainable resources is the real challenge. And so I just wonder how you guys think about it. Like, you've, obviously you did 2022, you're gonna do 2024. Is it possible to make some sort of ongoing regular commitment so that station, participating stations will know that they have these resources coming down the road? Or not? Well, you know, <laughs> so going back to the, um, you know, Public media in the U.S. was designed as a pu public-private partnership, yeah. um, and so actually, when you look at the way the appropriations is distributed, we're getting super into just like the act. But you know, 70% of it actually goes directly to stations in the form of unrestricted sure. funding, um, and so in that way, they do have a consistent flow of, of funds. Um, you raise a really interesting, really important challenge that I think is really under not, not discussed enough you know we talk a lot about news deserts <clears throat> but the overlay on rural communities is quite significant and actually um I, I, someone i was i mean this is not i'm not um i'm not the first hand source for this because i heard it at the session this morning but i will say that um some the, a person of authority said that for every taxpayer dollar, a public radio station can usually raise about $8. But for rural stations, it's actually only like 250 
And that's because, you know, it's directly correlated with the populations they serve. Yeah. And so especially in rural communities, right, like public media stations um, have some resources that other um, content makers don't have. And we are always trying to encourage um, some real thoughtfulness around what um, efficiencies can be achieved through collaborations and where public media stations can offer, also offer opportunities to scale. And um, it's, it's a different solution in every part of the country. Um, but I think that the way you talk about the, the, the challenge of serving information needs in rural communities is something that public media stations are very well aware of, that we're very well aware of, and we're trying to um, figure out together. So we should discuss more. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael Stoll with the San Francisco Public Press. We're a 14-year-old independent nonprofit. Um, started on the web, launched a print edition, um, suspended the print edition during the pandemic, but also started up a low-power FM radio station. Um, part of the, the LPFM program is a couple of hundred um, stations around the country that the FCC has licensed in uh, blank spots in the, in the spectrum. Uh, I'm wondering if you have worked with LPFMs, if uh, you'd consider it, um, and, uh, and, and thereby also working with or other organizations based in the communities that have um, been doing journalism um, uh, and using that to uh, do creative things with audio. My approach is that we want to encourage the stations that we work with to work with whomever in their community is reaching the audiences that they want to reach. So I would say absolutely yes, if that is an option in their community. We would not discourage any kind of partnerships, I think, with those kinds of organizations that are providing information to their communities. So I would say yes. I don't know if there's a reason to say no. No, I mean, no, I'm talking about information needs. I think, you know, um, right, there's a difference between community service grant qualified stations and, you know, any news organization that would want to try and partner with a public media station involved in this effort. Okay, so that, um, that's the NPR member station. Is, is that the only, is that, is that no, the qualification? There, um, no, there, there, we have like a bunch of qualifications for stations that qualify for community service grants. There's a whole process for it. Yeah, we, I, I, I'm not the authority on that, but we could, I could direct you to where those qualifications exist. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brian with Peace by Peace Strategies. Um, I saw sort of, it, more towards the beginning of the presentation, you talked about connecting newsrooms through different cohorts, depending on like what they're reporting on. I'm curious if y'all did that in 2022, or if there were any sort of emerging trends or emerging needs that you started to realize sort of exist beyond the immediate funding needs of some of these local organizations and newsrooms. Do you mean, were there audiences or communities that needed the information that we recognize across the country, that kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, or I think like um, particular trends with connecting organizations that might be reporting with rural communities or in particular, uh, I think you also mentioned language, mm -hmm. right? Are there particular gaps or particular uh, needs either internal in you know some of the affiliates or sort of external in the audience that you think is really important, particularly as we move into 2024 to like be aware of or to to start thinking about how to fill some of those gaps. There's a lot of, I would say, interest um, on the part of many public media stations on reaching Spanish-speaking audiences or, or audiences of Latino descent. You know, it's it's that's a huge you know, huge group of people, but there seems to be a lot of a lot of communities where there's low voter turnout that happen to be predominantly Spanish speaking. So a sense that there's a lot of information that needs to get out to those communities for sure. I did notice that. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? I think you know. I think the basic message is that. This project is very interested in working with a wide breadth of organizations across the country. So if there is a public media station that you know of that is in your area, 
it might be a very good time to be part of this project and to, have, to be able to you know, tap into some of these resources. The mission is to make sure that our communities and our audiences have the information they need to participate in the election and to increase civic engagement across the country. So we're doing what we can. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, Elisa. U.S. Democracy Day is less than a week away. But what is it and how does it work? The idea is pretty simple. On September 15th, hundreds of newsrooms across the United States will come together and share stories, publish content, and discuss the issues and challenges and threats facing democracy and the democratic process in the United States. Each of these news organizations and journalists have agreed to produce at least one story or piece of content that goes beyond the surface level horse race coverage we typically see during an election cycle and explore the ways that democratic principles and democratic processes operate in the United States, from the local and municipal level all the way up to national elections. If you haven't signed up as a partner yet, there's still time. The Democracy Day team is actively recruiting newsrooms from across the U.S. to be a media partner in this nationwide collaborative. To learn more, Head over to you. So we'll send out information in the follow-up email. Um, and if you have any questions, you can also drop them in the chat. A uh, few Democracy Day organizers are on this call. Um, and before we start, I wanted to define a few terms we'll be using here. Um, Pro-democracy reporting, um, as defined by U.S. Democracy Day, acknowledges the reality of misinformation and the slippage of democratic norms, helps people engage more easily and readily with the systems designed to protect, enfranchise, and serve them. Essentially, it is everything that horse race coverage is not. Um, you know, as we lead into, as, as we are underway with the, the presidential election campaign season, um, and as we've heard from our previous three panels, um, you know, 
horse race coverage, just focusing on candidates, um, just focusing on the personalities of these candidates or, um, you know, Donald Trump's trials, while these can serve some purpose and have some value, um, if we forget to do, uh, you know, if, if focusing on horse race coverage means ignoring communities, ignoring the stakes, and what's at stake for democracy, um, you know, it's leading us to a very dangerous path. And, but there are alternatives. And um, today we're joined by three newsroom leaders that are blazing that path. And so this is gonna be a really exciting discussion. Um, and I also wanted to describe solutions journalism, which is simply rigorous evidence-based reporting on responses to social problems. So in this context, it's not just enough to talk about the threats democracy faces, but it's important as journalists to talk about what's working to defend democracy and to expand it and actually, you know, have full, uh, you know, have a real democracy, which this, which has always been a struggle since this country's founding. And and we want to. This is this is. I just want to define these terms to sort of ground this conversation uh, before we get started. Um, so this is the fourth in our series. Um, all these uh, recordings are available online, and together I think they serve as a really powerful anecdote. Um, to everything wrong with political coverage um, in the United States and really gives you, uh, really provides journalists and newsrooms with alternatives on how best to, um, you know, what, what, what the alternatives are and how best to implement them in your newsrooms, which is going to be the topic of this specific conversation. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions and I'm going to hand it over to Osita. Thank you, Jessel. As Jessel said, this is the last uh, in a series of four seminars on covering democracy. Uh, and this has been really terrific and I hope uh, informative conversations for everybody tuning in. And to close things out, we have not two, but three panelists this time around, and I'll go ahead and introduce now. Jessica Hughesman is the editorial director of VoteBeat, a nonprofit, nonpartisan newsroom covering voting. She manages the newsroom investigations and major projects. And prior to VoteBeat, Jessica was the lead elections reporter for ProPublica, managing election land collaboration between more than 100 newsrooms across the country covering the 2016, 2018, and 2020 elections. Ashton Latimore is the editor-in-chief of Prison. She's an award-winning journalist, former lawyer, whose work sits at the intersections of racial justice, gender justice, and law. Her nonfiction writings appeared in the Washington Post, Slate, CNN, and Essence. She's a graduate of Harvard College, Columbia Journalism School, and Harvard Law School, where she was an editor of the Harvard Law Review. During her time practicing law, she was part of the team that represented Pennsylvania's governor in the lawsuits that successfully challenged the state's congressional map as an illegal partisan gerrymander, resulting in the implementation of a new map in time for the 2018 elections. She grew up in New Jersey and now lives in suburban Philadelphia. Finally, we have Darla Cameron. Darla Cameron is the managing editor for visual journalism for the Texas Tribune. She oversees the work of the photo, multimedia, and daily visuals teams and works closely with the product engineering and design teams to elevate the Tribune's visual journalism. Previously, she was the, the visual lead editor, elections leading a team of developers at the intersection of graphics and news applications. Before joining the Tribune, she worked at the Washington Post and the Tampa Bay Times. Darla is a Colorado native with a degree in journalism from the University of Missouri. Thanks to all three of you for, for being here for this. Uh, I'm sure it's gonna be a wonderful, wonderful conversation as all of these seminars have been so far. So I guess I could just sort of start by trying to frame, uh, I guess, the challenge newsrooms are going to face um, in covering this next election from a democracy perspective a little bit. What are some of the major beats that you think a, a pro-democracy newsroom ought to have um, as we head into the next election season? What are your own institutions, publications, going to want to have covered as a basis when you're thinking about covering democracy as a, as a subject? And anybody can start. Maybe Jessica can, can take the lead. But... I, I feel a little bit spoiled by this question because we only cover voting and we only cover mm -hmm. voting all the time. Um, so, so I'm biased in that perspective. I think everybody should cover that, but I don't really have anything else to add. <laughs> I'm happy to hop in. Um, at PRISM, we focus uh, quite a bit on, on voting rights, um, but in addition to that, we have kind of an expanded definition of democracy. So we also look at things like free speech and the right to protest uh, quite a bit, um, in addition to, to covering sometimes journalism itself um, as sort of a, a necessary condition for, for the existence of democracy. So I think um, adding those things to the mix is also important. Um. At the Tribune, we also cover politics and policy and, you know, democracy writ large in a state that has a lot of challenges um, in terms of equitable access to voting and, and, and public services and just 
so many things here are um, products of like our democracy, right? So I think the main thing I want people to be aware of and a beat I would like to see for the next um, election is visual misinformation specifically. We're all gonna need to be looking out for how to identify things generated by AI and you know the way that this um, that landscape will shape the false narratives that campaigns can use to try to tell their own stories. Right. But here's another way of, of framing the question, and Darla kind of got at it, is, you know, this is such a multifaceted topic as we've explored in the past conversation. Uh, you can talk about the impact of redistricting and gerrymandering on people's access to, or, or you know, meaning the meaning of people's votes. You can think about restrictions on voting rights. You can think about visual misinformation, as Darla just said. So if you're in a newsroom that has the ambition of covering democracy in a really robust way, how do you kind of <laughs> choose between those subjects? Um, and also sort of thinking about assigning roles for people. Does it make sense to say, well, somebody's going to be our misinformation person, somebody's going to be our, our, our uh, voting access person. Um, is that the way that you think beats should be constructed or or is there a different, uh, or a different sets of posters that, that might make sense for different uh, publications? I can start with this one. Um, you know, I think that we, we have one reporter in every state um, that is covering voting and elections as a whole. Um, so for our specific um, newsroom, it doesn't make a ton of sense to say like, you're the misinformation reporter, you're so they because they have such location specific beats. Um, I think that unfortunately, misinformation has become such a all encompassing problem um, and, and is not restricted to any one beat. So regardless of the beats that you're putting under the democracy umbrella, um, whether that's voting and extremism and, you know, white nationalism and free speech, like all of these things are possible. I think that we need to, you know, really impart every journalist in our newsroom with the ability to be sort of like really robustly and in real time debunking this information. And that's a, it's a very specific skill, but I think it's one that every journalist in the newsroom at this point has to have. I think for us, we kind of take a mix of approaches. There are times when we have people who are directly focused on a democracy fo focused subject. Like for example, we did a series on gerrymandering. That reporter was just reporting on gerrymandering at that time. But um, by the same token, I think um, it is kind of a subject that has tentacles that reach into every other kind of corner of our coverage. So for example, we have one reporter who focuses largely on criminal justice. And sometimes that does look like reporting on whether or not people who are incarcerated have access to the ballot box or have the, retained the right to vote or regained it in some way. Um, or someone who's reporting mostly on reproductive rights, maybe reporting on that in a way that looks at the impact of you know ballot measures or something like that um, in a state where it's something that's been put up for a vote. So I think think um, giving people um, the ability, much like Jessica said, kind of empowering every reporter to touch on the subject, no matter what their beat is, in addition to having people who are focused very directly on democracy focused subjects, um, I think is helpful. Um, I also agree, it, it needs to be holistic, like what I would like to see is all journalists, not not just always reporters, but data reporters, um, photographers, like everyone kind of equipped with the tools to be able to assess situations. And all of us listening to readers and listening to their concerns, hearing what it is they have questions about. Um, I think a lot of those like solutions journalism tools can be really useful um, when, when we listen really quickly. Mm -hmm. Ashton, you, you just mentioned, you know, empowering reporters. I like I like that phrase. And, and you know, when we think about all of the outlets that have, um, and this is good news, jumped into the, the field of covering democracy, or at least taking democracy more seriously as a subject in advance of this, this election, you know, what are some of the resources that ought to be made available, editorial resources to journalists, especially at newsrooms that are, you know, maybe covering this issue or this set of issues for the first time? Because uh, it, it, it can be a kind of challenging, um, area to wrap your head around in some ways. And I think can think of that about that in two ways. Uh, one challenge is the wonkiness of some of the election law and you know some of the, the technical aspects of how the vote actually works, um, you know, some of the legal language. Some of this might be I think a little bit challenging for journalists to sort of tackle um, for the first time if if they don't have a kind of institutional background at, at a publication of covering this field before. 
And the other challenge I think about is the need to cover marginalized communities specifically and the threats to voting uh, rights um, for them. Um, you know, these communities are often underserved by media generally already. When you think about the poor and immigrants, so maybe there are editorial resources that might be spe specifically aimed at um, penetrating those communities and making sure that the reporting is disseminated um, uh, in the places where they need it most, um, making sure that they have resources available to translate articles and so on. So those are two two areas I, I, I think about um, and that come first to mind when I think about some of the challenges that, that come from covering this area. But what are some of the editorial resources that you think um, that can be made available to journalists um, to address those and, and other challenges in, in covering democracy? I think some degree of, of sort of baseline legal education is actually really helpful. Um, that might look like, you know, a newsroom sharing maybe just a guidebook that kind of explains basic concepts around things like gerrymandering or the vote or how a case comes into court a particular way and, you know, something like that. Um, and there are also kind of external programs that I know exist for journalists who want to get a more deep grounding um, in the legal structures that form our democracy. I think there's a program out of um, I want to say UC Berkeley or one of the colleges out in California, uh, the law schools out in California. It's like law school for journalists where it's a, a program. Loyola, sorry. Yes, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, a shorter program that gives kind of that introductory basis um, to all of these things because it can be incredibly technical. And I think there's a big risk um, with journalists who are not um, educated in at least the baseline concepts um, of being vulnerable to sources who know more than they do um, and being tempted to sort of parrot something someone says back to you um, because maybe you don't understand all the details, you don't know the right questions to ask, um, just like straight up logistical questions about, you know, why did you file this case in this court? Or, uh, you know, who who is responsible for uh, making the laws that surround these, these local elections? Is it the state? Is it the local? officials? I mean, who's in charge here? Just sort of basic baseline questions that can be answered up front that I think um, really will equip journalists with the ability um, not just to write better stories, but really to ask better questions when there are people in front of them who may be trying to sell them a line about something that's, that's actually not true. So before our reporters are allowed to start reporting, they have to go through a two week long training process with me, <laughs> which, you know, I guess that's a good thing. Maybe for them, it's not. But, um, but you know, I think that the reason we decided to do that is because of all the reasons that Ashton just said, right? Like the, the voting process is incredibly technical. And a, and a lot of the misinformation that we see about voting and elections and redistricting and all of this is because it's so complicated that people have good faith misunderstandings about how it works, right? Um, and, and, and part of the reason that they have these good faith misunderstandings, right? Like they really fundamentally think something works in a way that it does not work um, is because journalists have never explained it to them. Um, and and so it is. It, it becomes hard to to debunk information if you don't know immediately that the information is incorrect. And so if somebody is telling you something about a voting machine um, and it sounds plausible, you might believe them because that seems like that's how it should work. But but they're very specific things that require a little bit of understanding. And so I think like really having an ingrained understanding of the beat is so important. And when I am approached by other newsroom leaders who are like, well, how do I do the same sort of thing in my newsroom? The thing that I say is every single one of your reporters who is covering voting or elections in any capacity should go to poll worker training, not to be a poll worker, but to understand what the machines are, how they work, what the local laws are, because they are different from your county next door. The machines are different. The rules are different. The polling locations are different, right? And if you go to your county's poll worker training, which most counties are game for, like if you say, I want to come to poll worker training off the record just for my own understanding of the system, they will allow that. I've been to 17 of these uh, and they're really good. I think um, another thing we've kind of tried to develop process-wise at the Tribune to try to make that kind of information more accessible when we're covering a state with 254 counties. And I would love to be able to send like all of our reporters to poll worker training in every single county. That would be super fun, but we just don't like, we don't have time. That's not realistic, you know? 
is kind of trying to put things into context for readers. And we have two different products that we kind of product lines for each election that we do that we publish to try to do that. First is a voter guide with really actionable information from our data engagement reporters. It's SEO optimized to reach new audiences. It leads to huge newsletter signups, like just something for that basic information. Once we understand it, we want to communicate it to people in the most clear and simple way possible. The other aspect of, it, of that is an internal elections database. Um, it's an API that powers customizable ballot pages, election nights result pages, analysis, and eventually our elected official directory. So the whole election isn't like, oh, it's election night, time to think about it. But we're thinking about like the deadlines to register, the deadline for early voting, like all the pieces along the way, the primary, the runoff, the, the general election, like all those things that lead up to now, here's these elected officials that were elected to be accountable to you. So we want to make that process more accessible to people and then kind of scope our coverage to say, okay, for each of these, like what matters right now? There's these built in deadlines. Like I can tell you exactly what we're going to be doing for the next year as we prepare to like begin that whole cycle of covering an election. So a related question for the three of you would be whether you think that there are places where other outlets that are already covering democracy, covering threats to voting rights, and all of this material should improve um, based on maybe what we've seen in the past couple of election cycles specifically. Are, are there lessons that you think we can learn um, from the way the outlets have, have covered uh, this set of issues for the last couple of years? Um, if there is a story that you know that every other news outlet is going to cover, don't cover it. <laughs> Um, the co cover something else. Uh, we this is this is a conversation that we have all the time, which is you know every newsroom has a limited number of resources, right? And and I think that a lot of coverage choices come down to like, well, if we don't cover this, we're going to be the only news organization that isn't covering this. Well, like then fine, don't do it. Uh, you know, I, I think that journalists should take a better should take better stock of sort of the unique coverage they can offer and if there is truly a story that you're only covering because you're afraid because you have got you've got FOMO then like democracy is better served by you covering something else um and so I I I I think that if journalists got out of that mindset then we would have more diverse coverage just as an, a natural result of that, of, of, of everyone saying, okay, this is the unique perspective I can add to this rather than we need it because everybody else has it. And I think that the horse race coverage that we see, especially going into election years, like, oh, well, we need to do this. Like, I swear to God, if I hear the word curtain raiser another time, I'm just going to jump out of my window. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I think that that's that's one area where especially if you're a local news organization and there's and and you're you're watching, you're saying, I have so many, I have so few resources, uh, then then deploy your resources on unique products that you can offer. Jessica, is there a specific example within the, the democracy field specifically of a kind of story you've seen too much of that, that's that's really bugging you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the iterative coverage of court cases no. uh, is really harmful um, to democracy as a whole. And, um, you know, especially this close to an election, the court cases are so complicated and they're under so many stays and the decisions can feel so monumental, but then they're reversed the next week. Right. And so what I see every year is, OK, well, this judge just put out a ruling and we we have to cover what it means right now, even though you as a reporter who has been following this trial know that that decision is going to be different the next day and your your reporting is going to have a shelf life for 24 hours but you're not going to go and update that piece to say like oh this is no longer operative right we could just slow down right and we could just choose to not cover things when we know that there isn't going to be a long-term impact of something so close to the election I think the best example of this that I've seen is when Texas implemented it. I know this is like, this is a bit of a throwback example. When Texas implemented its voter ID law in 2017, the number of news organizations that had covered that the case, that SB1 was overturned in the weeks leading up to the election when it wasn't, it was just a small 
portion of it was overturned. People freaked out when they went to the polls and were asked to present their ID in 2016, 2018, and 2020. And it's because the media failed them. Um, and so I think like the, the temptation to do iterative coverage at every step of a very complicated process is just a very bad idea. I mean, huge plus one to all of that. I also hate when, like, there have been so many SB1s in Texas since then, like, media's tendency to refer to things by, like, the bill name as shorthand and assume that people know what you're talking about. I actually, Ashton, can I ask a question? Um, I, I'm curious, like, one of the things that I see in all that legal coverage is a lot of times journalists, like, don't fully understand, so they tend to use legalese, and I, if I had a dollar for every time somebody stated, like, the judge has overturned it and remained it like like things that I'm just like I do not follow like I don't understand and I theater through it but you know a little bit like how do you get journalists as, as a lawyer like how, how do you talk to journalists about how to make that kind of legal language accessible to average people oh my gosh um I wish I could remember I think it was about one of the abortion laws that came out where there was some case where what the reporter was trying to talk about was that there was like a reversal of a stay of an injunction and it's like you have to follow it all the way back and what i try to do when i see something like that because that to me is a flag if i see a sentence where somebody's written this judge you know just reverse the stay of this motion to dismiss blah 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 okay if you're just regurgitating that to me, that tells me that you don't actually know what current state this case is in. So I'm going to sit with you. I'm going to walk you through it. I'm going to walk you through it backwards. So what does it mean to reverse this motion or what does it mean to, to you know, whatever it is. And then we're going to take it and put it in plain language. What does this mean right now? Is the case going to continue and X, Y, Z is going to happen tomorrow? Is the case closed for all intents and purposes? Is it going to go up for an appeal? But I think, um, moving away from the legalese to just understand like fundamentally just what does this mean what what is it where is it today where is the case today <laughs> and where is it headed tomorrow and what does that mean um and trying to put that in plain language um i think is very difficult um and it, you know if i didn't have an education in civil procedure i wouldn't be able to do it so i don't know you know i don't blame anyone who um sees these terms and you know can't parse them or tries to parse them and arrives at you know not the wrong conclusion you know in a good faith way so i think um having someone who, ideally in your newsroom who, who is able to parse that kind of language with the reporter or giving the reporter the skills themselves to be able to parse that kind of language and eliminate it to the extent possible from the story um so that you can just tell readers in plain english you kind know, of what's going on here um is is useful um i share your your frustration with people um referring to to things by their their bill names half the time i don't even know what's being you know being referenced in a given a given state you know sb1 or hb whatever so um certainly if there are kind of names that these bills have been given that are more informative about what they are or simply saying what the bill does um that's a much more useful way to refer to things and that's something that we also um just try to encourage just kind of you know tell people what you're talking about which seems straightforward but it's not always so as i think everybody here knows and everybody tuning in surely knows um these are really rough times for uh, a lot of local publications, small um, journalistic outlets, um, even in sort of ordinary non-election times, we're seeing fewer and fewer reporters in state houses. Um, and so there are a lot of publications that could be doing this kind of work and might want to be doing this kind of work, but don't have the resources to do it. Um, and one of the solutions, though, that, that's come up um, is, is forging partnerships with different institutions, partnerships across uh, different publications, different publications teaming up. Um, I'm really, really glad we have vote Pete here to, to sort of talk about this. But, but I guess my question is, you know, how should newsrooms that want to be doing pro-democracy coverage um, go about finding and forging partnerships with different institutions and, and outlets to do that kind of work? Institutionally, structurally, how does that work um, for a publication? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you how vote. So vote partnerships are sort of the 
the the reason for our existence at Vote Beat. Um, so in Texas, all of our works go, goes to the Tribune. Um, in Pennsylvania, it all goes to PA Spotlight. Um, and in Michigan, it all goes to Michigan Bridge. Arizona, we have a couple of different ones. And then our national stories sort of, we find partners for them individually. So on Democracy Day, we'll be releasing something with The Guardian, which I'm really excited about. Um, and so, you know, I think that because for all of the reasons that that we've talked about in this panel, right, like voting is so specific and it requires such a level of expertise. A lot of newsrooms don't cover it, not because they don't want to, but because it is difficult to do, right? Like it is a difficult thing to say like, okay, we're going to take this reporter who has never covered voting before ever, and then we're going to send them down to a federal court in Corpus Christi, Texas, where like maybe they'll follow proceedings. I guess, right? Like that's a difficult thing to do. Um, but like our our newsroom sort of exists to help rooms do that well. Um, so we provide training programs. We all of our stories are Creative Commons licensed. Um, and I think that that is an important thing to note. Um, if your state has nonprofit newsrooms, their articles are probably Creative Commons licensed. That is a huge invitation to reach out to do more partnerships with them. Nonprofit news organizations love doing this sort of stuff, like cold email, I promise it will work. Um, I get cold emails all the time. We almost always partner with everyone who asks. Um, and, and it's because it's a huge part of our mission. Um, so I think that, you know, partnerships are easier to forge than people realize. Um, and, and I'm always is sort of surprised. You know, I've always worked in nonprofit media, which I realize is like a huge privilege and unique. Um, so it, it's always sort of like strange for me when I go to other newsrooms and they're like, how do you partner? And I'm like, what do you mean? You just call, you just do the, you just, you just do the partnering, um, which I realize is like very naive. But, um, but I think that what you'll find is that most newsrooms are way more comfortable sort of giving parts of their work to other newsrooms than they used to be. Um, huge plus one on partnerships. The Tribune always says we have no competitors, only collaborators, and we really try to operate that way. I do think that managerially, partnerships are not cost free. So I like to talk to um, editors and the people who will be managing those about, like, okay, how do you set your expectations for the work that everyone's bringing to the table? How do you make it clear, like, shared photography costs? Like, journalism is not free to produce. So we try to, when we enter those partnerships and, and think about how we want to work with other outlets, we want to make sure that it's something that aligns for our shared goals. We try to have like a friend who's understanding and, you know, just like things to kind of set some guardrails in terms of expectations. Um, and then also, you know, acknowledge that it takes more than a reporter to make a partnership. There's audience teams, there's other folks in the room who need to be involved with thinking about like the reach of that work, how to distribute it. Um, that said, the Tribune, this has always been our model. We give all of our work away for free. Anyone can republish it. It's accessible. We want people to get this information. Um, and we want also, when we do partner, we want other outlets that we work with to be aware of the environments that they're entering. I think it's not really democracy related, but our Uvalde coverage is a really good example of this. We spent more than a year in that community, developing relationships with sources, developing a level of trust and when we went in with a national partner to do stories alongside them, we wanted everyone to be on the same page about like, here are our expectations about what we're going to say to sources as we learn things about this case that might impact their lives and their understanding of it. Like, it's just, you know, that that partnership goes both ways. And we consider a big part of that to be our obligations to the communities that we cover and to doing that work in a respectful way. Um, so, yeah, partnerships are that, though. <laughs> I don't know that I have a ton to add. Um, we're also a nonprofit, so all of our work is also <laughs> similarly available to anyone who wants to republish it. Um, and we we have similar kind of considerations um, around partnerships as well. So yeah, I'll I'll just let you go to the the next question. Sure. So yeah, one more question before we turn over to some of the questions that people in the audience uh, today have submitted. Some questions that people have been submitting across the seminars between the seminars. Um, yeah, we'll turn to those in, in just a minute. But I, I did want to ask if there are stories that the three of you already know that you want to see as we move into this next election, um, different um, subjects that you, you already know that you want to have covered, maybe specific story items that you think um, 
are important enough that you're already keeping an eye on them. What 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 are some of the stories that you three are, are most excited to see people cover? Something that I would love to see more more outlets cover and that we plan to, to continue covering um, is a lot of the legislation around the right to protest. That's really a fundamental sort of baseline right um, within a democracy. And, you know, when you start to see that right be eroded in a lot of the ways that it has been over the last, say, four or five years, um, alarm bells um, should be going off. So we're going to be spending a lot of more time um, tracking legislation, um, like anti-protest legislation, um, you know, things like laws that make it legal to to physically harm protesters, for example, um, and covering those kinds of incursions to um, sort of those secondary democracy rights that in a lot of ways make voting rights and other things possible um, and protect them and protect the outcomes um, that hopefully come from those voting rights. So that's that's where a lot of our focus, I think, is going to be. I think a big plus one to that, like acknowledging that voting is not the only way that people participate in democracy and that for some people um, who don't have the right to vote or, you know, it's not accessible to them for whatever reason, kind of acknowledging they might, they, they have other ways to make their voices heard. And so kind of, I, I would like us, I would like to see places more holistically report on that aspect. Um, and also just really hold officials accountable for accessibility. And that means a lot of different things for different individuals. And that there's, um, but kind of acknowledging like not everybody has the same ideas or comes from the same places that we do when they're thinking about how they participate and how they get to the polls, how they actually, if they are gonna vote, how they do that. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I also think, so one thing that I'm sort of concerned about and is, is the, the rollback of uh, public records access across the country. There's like currently a law in Arkansas that would really limit how much access you're allowed to get from information that comes from the governor's office, right? And and so sort of public records are like the lifeblood of journalism, but they're also the lifeblood of like basic government transparency and access. And so I think all of the things that we've been talking about today sort of stack on that. And um, I would encourage people to become like way more aware that there probably are bills in your state house that um, affect public records access in some way and to be especially sensitive to those. Um, because as newsrooms, like we should take a position on those. Like we just we should. It, it, they're 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 part of how we do our work. Um, and you know, the other thing that I would say is, you know, I, I think that that people should really really think hard about coverage that they can do um, for language minorities and their communities. Um, and, and, and by this, I don't mean just like translating the stories that are on your website, um, because a lot of times they need different information than what is available on your website. And so to the extent that you have a native speaker in your newsroom that you can repurpose for covering a community that you do not cover um, and that that has a language specialization that your newsroom needs, I would consider that. Um, we've had a lot of really good success, um, you know, sending our reporters in in the language that these communities speak and getting the information that we that that surprises us as like non speakers of this language about what information is missing there. Um, and, and so it, it might surprise you in terms of like the different information that some groups have access to and some groups do not. Terrific, terrific. So a couple of questions from people who are watching or people who've been watching the seminars um, for the past couple of weeks. And the first one is, what are the differences uh, in values and approach, if any, between non and for-profit newsrooms and pro-democracy reporting? I think this is a really interesting question. Um, I, I think that there's, I think there's a temptation, although when I tease it out largely, they realize that there is, this is a distinction without a difference, right? Where, you know, people feel uncomfortable taking a position on anything as journalists, but I would like proffer that like taking a position on people being able to vote is not really a position so much as it is just like our responsibility as a country. Um, and, 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 you know, I also think like I'm just like small high horse here is that like 
journalism is protected in the Constitution specifically so that we can inform voters who will then vote, right? So like our whole job is like, predestined to be for voter education. And so if we cannot take the position that people should be able to vote and have access to the ballot, then like we have defeated our own purpose is like my position on this issue. Um, so, you know, I, I, and I think that for-profit newsrooms that I've spoken to have a really, are really uncomfortable with that idea that like, I'd like I, I when I do trainings, I will encourage legacy newspapers to actually print a voter registration form in their newspaper. And nine times out of 10, they'll be like, oh, that feels too partisan. Like, that's crazy. That's a crazy thing to say. And and usually when I point that out, they all they're always like, oh, no, I see what you mean, but it hits the ear wrong. And so I think that like the difference that I see between for-profit and non-profit newsrooms approaching the space is just that level of thought that they're giving to sort of participation and the importance of it. Plus one to all of that, I think um, just picking up a bit on what Jessica just said, I think there is within non-profit newsrooms and less so within for-profit spaces, um, an understanding that journalism itself is not a neutral act. So it's an intervention. The act of reporting on something is by nature going to change the situation than you know, if you had done nothing or said nothing. And I think that's um, a position that nonprofit newsrooms, because we're mission, you know, mission driven, mission oriented, um, many of us, you know, come into this work with particular points of view, something that we're just largely more um, comfortable with um, and comfortable owning. I think where where there's a problem is that journalism is an intervention whether you say it is or not so you have uh for-profit newsrooms that are intervening in democracy situations by reporting on something or choosing not to report on something and that has a real impact um and if you kind of put your head in the sand about what the impact of what you're saying or not saying is doing um i think that can really impoverish the journalism that comes out of um some other newsrooms. And I think um, sort of walking hand in hand with that, I would say probably the biggest difference is just the understanding um, of who the main character is of a democracy story. I think for many outlets that report on politics um, from, from sort of a for-profit lens, the main character of a politics story is the politician. You know, how is Ron DeSantis doing today? You know, is his, is his hero's journey going to take him to the White House or not? Whereas a nonprofit newsroom that's focused on particular communities our, our main character, our protagonist, who we're concerned about, who the center of the story is, are people, communities, you know, not what is Ron DeSantis doing today and why, but how is what he has done impacting the people who live in the state of Florida uh, or threatening to impact the people across the United States because of X, Y, Z that he might do as president. So I think a focus on policy over personality um, is where you can also see a pretty strong distinction. I have nothing else to add. Plus one. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I guess you know, related to this, um, we have another question um, about framing and and sort of our willingness to be unapologetically pro democracy as journalists. Um, how often should editors guide headlines and context to directly warn and educate readers about authoritarianism or the risk of authoritarianism and uh, losing democracy? anyone in um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that this question makes an interesting distinction between the role of an editor and the role of a reporter. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about how I think of that in terms of the context we offer things. Um, so I expect all, all of our reporters to be experts in their own states. Um, and I, and my role in the newsroom is that like, I'm an expert on voting policy, right? And so like the the all of the stories that you see, like they're becoming bad, right? Like I'm not gonna need to support them in that for very long because they like you pick up on this pretty quickly. But I think the the place that I see myself intervening most is in sort of the, the voting space as a whole and in introducing sort of like sidebars that we can do as explainers um, or sort of explainers on the mechanics or the underlying the underlying civics education behind something that a 
person will need to understand versus what a reporter understands. I think um, at a, like one of the biggest roles that editors can have is pulling their reporters out of the weeds. Um, and, and so to that to that end, right, I think that there's a huge role for for reporters or for editors to sort of think about the normative situations that arise from a person's coverage and and make sure that that we're offering the context that readers need in order to engage with that in an appropriate way and and sort of like this mission driven aspect of of nonprofit newsrooms that we've all talked about sort of accelerates that thinking a little bit i think um but but that's the context i'm i'm generally giving i mean i think plus one to that like the headline can't say something the story doesn't say because then it would be inaccurate, right? So I think the editor's role is more so like, okay, who are we centering in the story? How are we framing the story? Are we asking the right questions to get to a place where this will be information that's accessible and understandable by our readers and like anticipating what it is they need to know about the situation? So I think it's a little more like the headlines at the end and at that point there shouldn't really be disagreement about whether the headline can reflect what the headline can say because it's really all about like what are we presenting and how are we presenting it to people sometimes a long narrative isn't going to be the best way to get somebody information about voting where they need a more structured story format or faqs or you know sidebars or maybe it needs to be presented on like a visual platform right like there's there's so many ways to tell stories so i more want to Yet, you know, what my role at the Tribune is, is like reframing our presentation and our storytelling and how are we getting this to people in a way that can reach them where they are and is understandable for them. So it's bringing it down to, you know, another, and it might feel basic, it might feel like things that are really like obvious to us, but that doesn't mean it's obvious to everyone. And I've seen a conversation in the chat about like, what are the questions that people in these communities need to know? Like, you've got to be able to go into those spaces and be willing to know that like they might need them. I agree with um, all of what's been been said so far, um, particularly Darla mentioning, you know, our role as editors can be to pull re pull reporters out of the weeds. I think using headlines, subheads and things to highlight what the stakes of a story are, that feels that feels appropriate as long as it accurately reflects kind of what's in the story. Um, I don't know, but I think also have it, making sure that you have a mix of different stakes to some extent, like every story is not necessarily going to be ringing the alarm about authoritarianism, um, but you know the ones that are, are um, and should be labeled as such. So I think um, making sure that there's also kind of um, a mix in scope and approach is um, really critical, just so that um, your your readers are getting kind of a, the, the full breadth of what an issue might be. Um, and mixing in solutions journalism is, is one of the ways that we we do that specifically. So that's always something that I look to encourage as well. Right. Yeah, one last question, jumping off of what Ashton has just said. We, we've been convened here by the Solution Journalism Network, which is committed to helping journalists not only cover policy problems, but some of the solutions that poly excuse me, policymakers and others have sort of framed and presented um, for the problems that we're facing as a country. Um, so I guess, you know, we could end by, you know, on an optimistic note, just each of you maybe talking about the importance of presenting readers and, and voters with some of the things that people have been doing to fight back against restrictions on voting rights and the policies that have been um, implemented. Um, maybe each of you could take a turn to talk about <laughs> some of the positives and, and some of the good stories you're seeing on this front, um, maybe some that uh, your own outlets have, have covered, solutions to, um, that's the democracy, ways that policymakers and others have sort of bolstered democracy, protected voters, and the right to vote. Sure. Um, one set of stories that we did um, right in the midst of redistricting that took place after the 2020 census um, was a series of solution stories about gerrymandering. So the different ways that um, community groups, um, advocates, attorneys have looked to take on um, both partisan and racial gerrymandering, which often walk hand in hand with each other, but kind of are legally situated a little bit differently in that, you know, one is technically okay, partisan gerrymandering. Currently, there's no way really to combat it through the courts, whereas racial gerrymandering 
is at least nominally um, frowned upon um, by the Voting Rights Act. So um, we looked at things like independent redistricting commissions that citizens within different states have stood up um, to kind of take the redistricting process out of the hands of legislators, for example, who, of course, are going to be inclined to tilt the results of a map um, toward their own party um, and put that hands back in the or put that power back in the hands of the people. We have looked at some of the court cases um, that have been attempted um, to address partisan gerrymandering with sort of varying levels of success, um, noting that there's actually been more success on that front um, in state court rather than federal court. So there's nothing that the Constitution of the U.S. can do about it, but it seems that there is something that the Constitution of, say, Pennsylvania or another state can do about partisan gerrymandering if it's read that way um, by judges. Um, and there have been um, additional efforts as well that we covered, um, just all solutions focused on how people are looking to basically make sure that everyone's vote actually counts equally um, across different states. Um, and that was really heartening to see. Um, and it's always nice to kind of lift up those solutions in a way that hopefully can be replicated across different states. So, yeah. Um, I love that example, Ashton. It was really great. I wanted to, um, Carol had asked a question, like mainstream media has a headline problem. And I think that like, the non, at least for us, the nonprofit media headlines are picked up by mainstream media. That's our distribution model is that we cover the capital for other outlets in Texas. So like that is the headline they're getting, you know, they, they might like adapt the headline on our story to make it fit for print or whatever. But I think like nonprofit isn't, it's not like fully the solution, but it is a way to say like, hey, we're covering these communities where you have a perspective, we're in the communities in a different way and making that information more accessible for everyone. Um, I think for a win, I love, I come from a data and graphics background, and I really love all the innovation around the way that people are presenting election results. And I think that there's creative ways of visualizing that information that makes it more clear that in Texas, there's counties with 3 million people and then counties with 54 people, and they're the same size on the map. And like, how can we make it clear that like they don't have the same weight, you know? So we experimented at the Tribune with different ways of visualizing that information to make it more obvious that like this map is misleading. And I love all the experimentation around that. I think that even then some of those, um, some of those graphics like assume a visual literacy that is not accessible to everyone, you know, but the more like space, I see us as a space to experiment and to try things out and to kind of iterate on ways that people visually understand information to make this kind of thing more accessible for our readers. So that's a big aspect for us as we like to try. Um, yeah, I so I think that one thing that I would encourage newsrooms to think about is if there is a bill that doesn't look like it means anything, it probably does. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there's every year, um, especially in the voting space, we end up sort of like being surprised six months before an election because there's this new law that no one understood sort of like the outer edges of and and the way that it impacts people who go to the polls or the people who administer the elections like one very good example of this is a story that came out of our partnership with the texas tribune um that our texas reporter natalia who was just on one of these panels a couple of weeks ago um wrote about this weird bill uh in which like one senator passed like had this weird idea about voting machines and wrote an extremely technical bill that was not clearly about voting machines but ultimately would have required every voting machine in the state of texas to have a cd drive in it and this bill was passed on a voice vote unanimously because nobody knew what it was right like this is the problem with state legislatures is that these people are not experts in the things that they're writing laws on and so very frequently they're just like oh this seems fine and they pass it and amendments get passed that way really like the the reason that we found out about that is because we're really plugged in with county clerks right and so we had county clerks being like have you seen this crazy bill right but there are not that many people who are talking to county clerks every day right and so i think if there is a specific target like demographic that you're interested in or that you're particularly concerned about for your coverage go to the people who are responsible for carrying out whatever that thing is right like maybe it's education and so you need to go straight to like the high school principal, or maybe it's election. So you go straight to the county clerk, be like, what laws are you most worried about and cover whatever it is that they say? Uh, because even if it doesn't facially seem like something you should be worried about, it probably is. 
Oh, Jessica, Ashton, Darla, I think that's about as much time as we've got, but this has been a terrific conversation, a terrific way to end this series, and I hope everybody got uh, a lot out of it. I know that I did, just sitting here and listening to the three of you. Um, I think before we go, Jessel probably has a couple of notes that he wants to, to leave us with. Yeah, I want to thank everyone for joining us and, um, you know, especially our panelists and Osita and, um, you know, just to celebrate the accomplishments of these fantastic newsrooms. Um, you know, Jessica was talking about the story, um, you know, requiring um, Tex uh, Texas counties to replace their voting machines. That's that story saved the state one hundred million dollars. Um, you know, the, the Texas Tribune, um, you know, enacted solutions in pro-democracy reporting in their voting guide. And, um, you know, that